Section Zero of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Preface man proposes and god disposes there are but few important events in the affairs of men brought about by their own choice although frequently urged by friends to write my memoirs i had determined never to do so nor to write anything for publication at the age of nearly sixty-two i received an injury from a fall which confined me closely to the house while it did not apparently affect my general health this made study a pleasant pastime shortly after the rascality of a business partner developed itself by the announcement of a failure this was followed soon after by universal depression of all securities which seemed to threaten the extinction of a good part of the income still retained and for which i am indebted to the kindly act of friends at this juncture the editor of the century magazine asked me to write a few articles for him i consented for the money it gave me for at that moment i was living upon borrowed money the work i found congenial and i determined to continue it the event is an important one for me for good or evil i hope for the former in preparing these volumes for the public i have entered upon the task with the sincere desire to avoid doing injustice to any one whether on the national or confederate side other than the unavoidable injustice of not making mention often where special mention is due there must be many errors of omission in this work because the subject is too large to be treated of in two volumes in such a way as to do justice to all the officers and men engaged there were thousands of instances during the rebellion of individual company regimental and brigade deeds of heroism which deserve special mention and are not here alluded to the troops engaged in them will have to look to the detailed reports of their individual commanders for the full history of those deeds the first volume as well as a portion of the second was written before i had reason to suppose i was in a critical condition of health later i was reduced almost to the point of death and it became impossible for me to attend to anything for weeks i have however somewhat regained my strength and am able often to devote as many hours a day as a person should devote to such work i would have more hope of satisfying the expectation of the public if i could have allowed myself more time i have used my best efforts with the aid of my eldest son f d grant assisted by his brothers to verify from the records every statement of fact given the comments are my own and show how i saw the matters treated of whether others saw them in the same light or not with these remarks i present these volumes to the public asking no favor but hoping they will meet the approval of the reader u s grant mount mcgregor new york July 1st, 1885. End of section 0. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at jocclev.com. Section 1 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. 
personal memoirs of u s grant by ulysses s grant chapter one ancestry birth boyhood my family is american and has been for generations in all its branches direct and collateral matthew grant the founder of the branch in america of which i am a descendant reached dorchester massachusetts in may sixteen thirty in sixteen thirty five he moved to what is now windsor connecticut and was the surveyor for that colony for more than forty years he was also for many years of the time town clerk he was a married man when he arrived at dorchester but his children were all born in this country his eldest son samuel took lands on the east side of the connecticut river opposite windsor which have been held and occupied by descendants of his to this day i am of the eighth generation from matthew grant and seventh from samuel matthew grant's first wife died a few years after their settlement in windsor and he soon after married the widow rockwell who with her first husband had been fellow passengers with him and his first wife on the ship mary and john from dorchester england in sixteen thirty mrs rockwell had several children by her first marriage and others by her second by intermarriage two or three generations later i am descended from both the wives of matthew grant in the fifth descending generation my great-grandfather noah grant and his younger brother solomon held commissions in the english army in seventeen fifty six in the war against the french and indians both were killed that year my grandfather also named noah was then but nine years old at the breaking out of the war of the revolution after the battles of concord and lexington he went with a connecticut company to join the continental army and was present at the battle of bunker hill he served until the fall of yorktown or through the entire revolutionary war he must however have been on furlough part of the time as i believe most of the soldiers of that period were for he married in connecticut during the war had two children and was a widower at the close soon after this he emigrated to westmoreland county pennsylvania and settled near the town of greensburg in that county he took with him the younger of his two children peter grant the elder solomon remained with his relatives in connecticut until old enough to do for himself when he emigrated to the british west indies not long after his settlement in pennsylvania my grandfather captain noah grant married a miss kelly and in seventeen ninety nine he emigrated again this time to ohio and settled where the town of deerfield now stands he had now five children including peter a son by his first marriage my father jesse r grant was the second child oldest son by the second marriage peter grant went early to maysville kentucky where he was very prosperous married had a family of nine children and was drowned at the mouth of the kawana river virginia in eighteen twenty five being at the time one of the wealthy men of the west my grandmother grant died in eighteen o five leaving seven children this broke up the family captain noah grant was not thrifty in the way of laying up stores on earth and after the death of his second wife he went with the two youngest children to live with his son peter in maysville the rest of the family found homes in the neighborhood of deerfield my father in the family of judge todd the father of the late governor todd of ohio his industry and independence of character were such that i imagine his labor compensated fully for the expense of his maintenance 
there must have been a cordiality in his welcome into the todd family for to the day of his death he looked upon judge todd and his wife with all the reverence he could have felt if they had been parents instead of benefactors i have often heard him speak of mrs todd as the most admirable woman he had ever known he remained with the todd family only a few years until old enough to learn a trade he went first i believe with his half-brother peter grant who though not a tanner himself owned a tannery in maysville kentucky here he learned his trade and in a few years returned to deerfield and worked for and lived in the family of a mr brown the father of john brown whose body lies mouldering in the grave while his soul goes marching on i have often heard my father speak of john brown particularly since the events at harper's ferry brown was a boy when they lived in the same house but he knew him afterwards and regarded him as a man of great purity of character of high moral and physical courage but a fanatic and extremist in whatever he advocated it was certainly the act of an insane man to attempt the invasion of the south and the overthrow of slavery with less than twenty men my father set up for himself in business establishing a tannery at ravenna the county seat of portage county in a few years he removed from ravenna and set up the same business at point pleasant claremont county ohio during the minority of my father the west afforded but poor facilities for the most opulent of the youth to acquire an education and the majority were dependent almost exclusively upon their own exertions for whatever learning they obtained i have often heard him say that his time at school was limited to six months when he was very young too young indeed to learn much or to appreciate the advantages of an education and to a quarter's schooling afterwards probably while living with judge todd but his thirst for education was intense he learned rapidly and was a constant reader up to the day of his death in his eightieth year books were scarce in the western reserve during his youth but he read every book he could borrow in the neighborhood where he lived this scarcity gave him the early habit of studying everything he read so that when he got through with a book he knew everything in it the habit continued through life even after reading the daily papers which he never neglected he could give all the important information they contained he made himself an excellent english scholar and before he was twenty years of age was a constant contributor to western newspapers and was also from that time until he was fifty years old an able debater in the societies for this purpose which were common in the west at that time he always took an active part in politics but was never a candidate for office except i believe that he was the first mayor of georgetown he supported jackson for the presidency but he was a whig a great admirer of henry clay and never voted for any other democrat for high office after jackson my mother's family lived in montgomery county pennsylvania for several generations i have little information about her ancestors her family took no interest in genealogy so that my grandfather who died when i was sixteen years old knew only back to his grandfather on the other side my father took a great interest in the subject and in his researches he found that there was an entailed estate in windsor connecticut belonging to the family to which his nephew lawson grant still living was the heir he was so much interested in the subject that he got his nephew to empower him to act in the matter and in eighteen thirty two or eighteen thirty three when i was a boy ten or eleven years old he went to windsor proved the title beyond dispute and perfected the claim of the owners for a consideration three thousand dollars i think i remember the circumstance well 
and remember too hearing him say on his return that he found some widows living on the property who had little or nothing beyond their homes from these he refused to receive any recompense my mother's father john simpson moved from montgomery county pennsylvania to claremont county ohio about the year eighteen nineteen taking with him his four children three daughters and one son my mother hannah simpson was the third of these children and was then over twenty years of age her oldest sister was at that time married and had several children she still lives in claremont county at this writing october the fifth eighteen eighty four and is over ninety years of age until her memory failed her a few years ago she thought the country ruined beyond recovery when the democratic party lost control in eighteen sixty her family which was large inherited her views with the exception of one son who settled in kentucky before the war he was the only one of the children who entered the volunteer service to suppress the rebellion her brother next of age and now past eighty-eight is also still living in claremont county within a few miles of the old homestead and is as active in mind as ever he was a supporter of the government during the war and remains a firm believer that national success by the democratic party means irretrievable ruin in june eighteen twenty one my father jesse r grant married hannah simpson i was born on the twenty seventh of april eighteen twenty two at point pleasant claremont county ohio in the fall of eighteen twenty three we moved to georgetown the county seat of brown the adjoining county east this place remained my home until at the age of seventeen in eighteen thirty nine i went to west point the schools at the time of which i write were very indifferent there were no free schools and none in which the scholars were classified they were all supported by subscription and a single teacher who was often a man or a woman incapable of teaching much even if they imparted all they knew would have thirty or forty scholars male and female from the infant learning the a b c's up to the young lady of eighteen and the boy of twenty studying the highest branches taught the three r's reading writing arithmetic i never saw an algebra or other mathematical work higher than the arithmetic in georgetown until after i was appointed to west point i then bought a work on algebra in cincinnati but having no teacher it was greek to me my life in georgetown was uneventful from the age of five or six until seventeen i attended the subscription schools of the village except during the winters of eighteen thirty six and seven and eighteen thirty eight and nine the former period was spent in maysville kentucky attending the school of richardson and rand the latter in ripley ohio at a private school i was not studious in habit and probably did not make progress enough to compensate for the outlay for board and tuition at all events both winters were spent in going over the same old arithmetic which i knew every word of before and repeating a noun is the name of a thing which i had also heard my georgetown teachers repeat until i had come to believe it but i cast no reflections upon my old teacher richardson he turned out bright scholars from his school many of whom have filled conspicuous places in the service of their states two of my contemporaries there who i believe never attended any other institution of learning have held seats in congress and one if not both other high offices these are wadsworth and brewster my father was from my earliest recollection in comfortable circumstances considering the times his place of residence and the community in which he lived mindful of his own lack of facilities for acquiring an education his greatest desire in maturer years was for the education of his children 
consequently as stated before i never missed a quarter from school from the time i was old enough to attend till the time of leaving home this did not exempt me from labor in my early days every one labored more or less in the region where my youth was spent and more in proportion to their private means it was only the very poor who were exempt while my father carried on the manufacture of leather and worked at the trade himself he owned and tilled considerable land i detested the trade preferring almost any other labor but i was fond of agriculture and of all employment in which horses were used we had among other lands fifty acres of forest within a mile of the village in the fall of the year choppers were employed to cut enough wood to last a twelvemonth when i was seven or eight years of age i began hauling all the wood used in the house and shops i could not load it on the wagons of course at that time but i could drive and the choppers would load and some one at the house unload when about eleven years old i was strong enough to hold a plow from that age until seventeen i did all the work done with horses such as breaking up the land furrowing ploughing corn and potatoes bringing in the crops when harvested hauling all the wood besides tending two or three horses a cow or two and sawing wood for stoves etc while still attending school for this i was compensated by the fact that there was never any scolding or punishing by my parents no objection to rational enjoyments such as fishing going to the creek a mile away to swim in summer taking a horse and visiting my grandparents in the adjoining county fifteen miles off skating on the ice in winter or taking a horse and sleigh when there was snow on the ground while still quite young i had visited cincinnati forty-five miles away several times alone also maysville kentucky often and once louisville the journey to louisville was a big one for a boy of that day i had also gone once with a two-horse carriage to chillicothe about seventy miles with a neighbor's family who were removing to toledo ohio and returned alone and had gone once in like manner to flat rock kentucky about seventy miles away on this latter occasion i was fifteen years of age while at flat rock at the house of a mr payne whom i was visiting with his brother a neighbor of ours in georgetown i saw a very fine saddle horse which i rather coveted and proposed to mr payne the owner to trade him for one of the two i was driving payne hesitated to trade with a boy but asking his brother about it the latter told him that it would be all right that i was allowed to do as i pleased with the horses i was seventy miles from home with a carriage to take back and mr payne said he did not know that his horse had ever had a collar on i asked to have him hitched to a farm wagon and we would soon see whether he would work it was soon evident that the horse had never worn harness before but he showed no viciousness and i expressed a confidence that i could manage him a trade was at once struck i receiving ten dollars difference the next day mr payne of georgetown and i started on our return we got along very well for a few miles when we encountered a ferocious dog that frightened the horses and made them run the new animal kicked at every jump he made i got the horses stopped however before any damage was done and without running into anything after giving them a little rest to quiet their fears we started again that instant the new horse kicked and started to run once more the road we were on struck the turnpike within half a mile of the point where the second runaway commenced and there there was an embankment twenty or more feet deep on the opposite side of the pike i got the horses stopped on the very brink of the precipice my new horse was terribly frightened and trembled like an aspen but he was not half so badly frightened as my companion mr payne 
who deserted me after this last experience and took passage on a freight wagon for Maysville. Every time I attempted to start, my new horse would commence to kick. I was in quite a dilemma for a time. Once in Maysville, I could borrow a horse from an uncle who lived there, but I was more than a day's travel from that point. Finally, I took out my bandana, the style of handkerchief in universal use then, and with this blindfolded my horse. In this way, I reached Maysville safely the next day no doubt much to the surprise of my friend. Here I borrowed a horse from my uncle, and the following day we proceeded on our journey. About half my school days in Georgetown were spent at the school of John D. White, a North Carolinian and the father of Chilton White, who represented the district in Congress for one term during the rebellion. Mr. White was always a Democrat in politics, and Chilton followed his father. He had two older brothers, all three being schoolmates of mine at their father's school, who did not go the same way. The second brother died before the rebellion began. He was a Whig, and afterwards a Republican. His oldest brother was a Republican and brave soldier during the rebellion. Chilton is reported as having told of an earlier horse trade of mine. As he told the story, there was a Mr. Ralston living within a few miles of the village, who owned a colt which I very much wanted. My father had offered twenty dollars for it, but Ralston wanted twenty-five. I was so anxious to have the colt that after the owner left, I begged to be allowed to take him at the price demanded. My father yielded, but said twenty dollars was all the horse was worth, and told me to offer that price. If it was not accepted, I was to offer twenty-two and a half, and if that would not get him, to give the twenty-five. I at once mounted a horse and went for the colt. When I got to Mr. Ralston's house, I said to him, Papa says I may offer you twenty dollars for the colt, but if you won't take that, I am to offer twenty-two and a half, and if you won't take that, to give you twenty-five. It would not require a Connecticut man to guess the price finally agreed upon. The story is nearly true. I certainly showed very plainly that I had come for the colt and meant to have him. I could not have been over eight years old at the time. This transaction caused me great heartburning. The story got out among the boys of the village, and it was a long time before I heard the last of it. Boys enjoy the misery of their companions, at least village boys in that day did, and in later life I have found that all adults are not free from the peculiarity. I kept the horse until he was four years old, when he went blind, and I sold him for twenty dollars. When I went to Maysville to school in 1836, at the age of 14, I recognized my colt as one of the blind horses working on the tread wheel of the ferry boat. I have described enough of my early life to give an impression of the whole. I did not like to work, but I did as much of it while young as grown men can be hired to do in these days and attended school at the same time. I had as many privileges as any boy in the village, and probably more than most of them. I have no recollection of ever having been punished at home, either by scolding or by the rod, but at school the case was different. The rod was freely used there, and I was not exempt from its influence. I can see John D. White, the schoolteacher, now with his long beech switch always in his hand, it was not always the same one either. Switches were brought in bundles from a beech wood near the schoolhouse by the boys for whose benefit they were intended. Often a whole bundle would be used up in a single day. I never had any hard feelings against my teacher, either while attending the school or in later years when reflecting upon my experience. Mr. White was a kind-hearted man and was much respected by the community in which he lived. He only followed the universal custom of the period, and that under which he had received his own education. End of section one. 
Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Section 2 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 2. West Point Graduation. In the winter of 1838 and 9, I was attending school at Ripley, only ten miles distant from Georgetown, but spent the Christmas holidays at home. During this vacation, my father received a letter from the Honorable Thomas Morris, then United States Senator from Ohio. When he read it, he said to me, Ulysses, I believe you are going to receive the appointment what appointment i inquired to west point i have applied for it but i won't go i said he said he thought i would and i thought so too if he did i really had no objection to going to west point except that i had a very exalted idea of the acquirements necessary to get through i did not believe i possessed them and could not bear the idea of failing. There had been four boys from our village, or its immediate neighborhood, who had been graduated from West Point, and never a failure of any one appointed from Georgetown, except in the case of the one whose place I was to take. He was the son of Dr. Bailey, our nearest and most intimate neighbor. Young Bailey had been appointed in 1837, finding before the january examination following that he could not pass he resigned and went to a private school and remained there until the following year when he was reappointed before the next examination he was dismissed dr bailey was a proud and sensitive man and felt the failure of his son so keenly that he forbade his return home. There were no telegraphs in those days to disseminate news rapidly, no railroads west of the Alleghanies and but few east, and above all there were no reporters prying into other people's private affairs. Consequently, it did not become generally known that there was a vacancy at West Point from our district until I was appointed. I presume Mrs. Bailey confided to my mother the fact that Bartlett had been dismissed and that the doctor had forbidden his son's return home. The Honorable Thomas L. Hamer, one of the ablest men Ohio ever produced, was our member of Congress at the time and had the right of nomination. He and my father had been members of the same debating society where they were generally pitted on opposite sides, and intimate personal friends from their early manhood up to a few years before. In politics they differed. Hamer was a lifelong Democrat, while my father was a Whig. They had a warm discussion which finally became angry over some act of President Jackson, the removal of the deposit of public monies, I think, after which they never spoke until after my appointment. I know both of them felt badly over this estrangement, and would have been glad at any time to come to a reconciliation, but neither would make the advance. Under these circumstances my father would not write to Hamer for the appointment, but he wrote to Thomas Morris, United States Senator from Ohio, informing him that there was a vacancy at West Point from our district, and that he would be glad if I could be appointed to fill it. This letter, I presume, was turned over to Mr. Hamer, and, as there was no other applicant, he cheerfully appointed me. This healed the breach between the two, never after reopened. 
besides the argument used by my father in favor of my going to west point that he thought i would go there was another very strong inducement i had always a great desire to travel i was already the best traveled boy in georgetown except the sons of one man john walker who had emigrated to texas with his family and it emigrated back as soon as he could get the means to do so in his short stay in texas he acquired a very different opinion of the country from what one would form going there now i had been east to wheeling virginia and north to the western reserve in ohio west to louisville and south to bourbon county kentucky besides having driven or ridden pretty much over the whole country within fifty miles of home going to west point would give me the opportunity of visiting the two great cities of the continent philadelphia and new york this was enough when these places were visited i would have been glad to have had a steamboat or railroad collision or any other accident happen by which i might have received a temporary injury sufficient to make me ineligible for a time to enter the academy nothing of the kind occurred and i had to face the music georgetown has a remarkable record for a western village it is and has been from its earliest existence a democratic town there was probably no time during the rebellion when if the opportunity could have been afforded it would not have voted for jefferson davis for president of the united states over mr lincoln or any other representative of his party unless it was immediately after some of john morgan's men in his celebrated raid through ohio spent a few hours in the village the rebels helped themselves to whatever they could find horses boots and shoes especially horses and many ordered meals to be prepared for them by the families this was no doubt a far pleasanter duty for some families than it would have been to render a like service for Union soldiers. The line between the rebel and Union elements in Georgetown was so marked that it led to divisions even in the churches. There were churches in that part of Ohio where treason was preached regularly, and where, to secure membership, hostility to the government, to the war, and to the liberation of the slaves, was far more essential than a belief in the authenticity or credibility of the bible there were men in georgetown who filled all the requirements for membership in these churches yet this far-off western village with a population including old and young male and female of about one thousand about enough for the organization of a single regiment if all had been men capable of bearing arms, furnished the Union Army four general officers and one colonel, West Point graduates, and nine generals and field officers of volunteers that I can think of. Of the graduates from West Point, all had citizenship elsewhere at the breaking out of the rebellion, except possibly General A. V. Kautz, who had remained in the army from his graduation two of the colonels also entered the service from other localities the other seven general mcgroyerty colonels white fife loudon and marshall majors king and bailey were all residents of georgetown when the war broke out and all of them who were alive at the close returned there major bailey was the cadet who had preceded me at west point he was killed in west virginia in his first engagement as far as i know every boy who has entered west point from that village since my time has been graduated i took passage on a steamer at ripley ohio for pittsburgh about the middle of may eighteen thirty nine 
western boats at that day did not make regular trips at stated times but would stop anywhere and for any length of time for passengers or freight i have myself been detained two or three days at a place after steam was up the gangplanks all but one drawn in and after the time advertised for starting had expired on this occasion we had no vexatious delays and in about three days pittsburgh was reached from pittsburgh i chose passage by the canal to harrisburg rather than by the more expeditious stage this gave a better opportunity of enjoying the fine scenery of western pennsylvania and i had rather a dread of reaching my destination at all at that time the canal was much patronized by travelers and with the comfortable packets of the period no mode of conveyance could be more pleasant when time was not an object from harrisburg to philadelphia there was a railroad the first i had ever seen except the one on which i had just crossed the summit of the allegheny mountains and over which canal boats were transported in traveling by the road from harrisburg i thought the perfection of rapid transit had been reached we traveled at least eighteen miles an hour when at full speed and made the whole distance averaging probably as much as twelve miles an hour this seemed like annihilating space i stopped five days in philadelphia saw about every street in the city attended the theatre visited gerard college which was then in course of construction and got reprimanded from home afterwards for dallying by the way so long my sojourn in new york was shorter but long enough to enable me to see the city very well i reported at west point on the thirtieth or thirty first of may and about two weeks later passed my examination for admission without difficulty very much to my surprise a military life had no charms for me and i had not the faintest idea of staying in the army even if i should be graduated which i did not expect the encampment which preceded the commencement of academic studies was very wearisome and uninteresting when the twenty eighth of august came the date for breaking up camp and going into barracks i felt as though i had been at west point always and that if i stayed to graduation i would have to remain always i did not take hold of my studies with avidity in fact i rarely ever read over a lesson the second time during my entire cadetship i could not sit in my room doing nothing there is a fine library connected with the academy from which cadets can get books to read in their quarters i devoted more time to these than to books relating to the course of studies much of the time i am sorry to say was devoted to novels but not those of a trashy sort i read all of bulwars then published cooper's marriott's scott's washington irving's works levers and many others that i do not now remember mathematics was very easy to me so that when january came i passed the examination taking a good standing in that branch in french the only other study at that time in the first year's course my standing was very low in fact if the class had been turned the other end foremost i should have been near head i never succeeded in getting squarely at either end of my class in any one study during the four years i came near it in french artillery infantry and cavalry tactics and conduct early in the session of the congress which met in december eighteen thirty nine a bill was discussed abolishing the military academy i saw in this an honorable way to obtain a discharge and read the debates with much interest 
but with impatience at the delay in taking action, for I was selfish enough to favor the bill. It never passed, and a year later, although the time hung drearily with me, I would have been sorry to have seen it succeed. My idea, then, was to get through the course, secure a detail for a few years as assistant professor of mathematics at the academy, and afterwards obtain a permanent position as professor in some respectable college, but circumstances always did shape my course different from my plans. At the end of two years the class received the usual furlough, extending from the close of the June examination to the 28th of August. This I enjoyed beyond any other period of my life. My father had sold out his business in Georgetown, where my youth had been spent, and to which my daydreams carried me back as my future home, if I should ever be able to retire on a competency. He had moved to Bethel, only twelve miles away in the adjoining county of Claremont, and had bought a young horse that had never been in harness, for my special use under the saddle during my furlough. Most of my time was spent among my old schoolmates. These ten weeks were shorter than one week at West Point. Persons acquainted with the academy know that the corps of cadets is divided into four companies for the purpose of military exercises. These companies are officered from the cadets the superintendent and commandant selecting the officers for their military bearing and qualifications, the adjutant, quartermaster, four captains, and twelve lieutenants are taken from the first or senior class, the sergeants from the second or junior class, and the corporals from the third or sophomore class. I had not been called out as a corporal, but when i returned from furlough i found myself the last but one about my standing in all the tactics of eighteen sergeants the promotion was too much for me that year my standing in the class as shown by the number of demerits of the year was about the same as it was among the sergeants and i was dropped and served the fourth year as a private during my first year's encampment, General Scott visited West Point and reviewed the cadets. With his commanding figure, his quite colossal size and showy uniform, I thought him the finest specimen of manhood my eyes had ever beheld, and the most to be envied. I could never resemble him in appearance but i believe i did have a presentiment for a moment that some day i should occupy his place on review although i had no intention then of remaining in the army my experience in a horse trade ten years before and the ridicule it caused me were too fresh in my mind for me to communicate this presentiment to even my most intimate chum the next summer martin van buren then president of the united states visited west point and reviewed the cadets he did not impress me with the awe which scott had inspired in fact i regarded general scott and captain c f smith the commandant of cadets as the two men most to be envied in the nation i retained a high regard for both up to the day of their death the last two years wore away more rapidly than the first two, but they still seemed about five times as long as Ohio years to me. At last all the examinations were passed, and the members of the class were called upon to record their choice of arms of service and regiments. I was anxious to enter the cavalry, or dragoons, as they were then called, but there was only one regiment of dragoons in the army at that time, and attached to that, besides the full complement of officers, 
there were at least four brevet second lieutenants i recorded therefore my first choice dragoons second fourth infantry and got the latter again there was a furlough or more properly speaking leave of absence for the class were now commissioned officers this time to the end of september again i went to ohio to spend my vacation among my old schoolmates and again i found a fine saddle horse purchased for my special use besides a horse and buggy that i could drive but i was not in a physical condition to enjoy myself quite as well as on the former occasion for six months before graduation i had had a desperate cough tyler's grip it was called and i was very much reduced weighing but one hundred and seventeen pounds just my weight at entrance though i had grown six inches in stature in the meantime there was consumption in my father's family two of his brothers having died of that disease which made my symptoms more alarming the brother and sister next younger than myself died during the rebellion of the same disease and i seemed the most promising subject for it of the three in eighteen forty three having made alternate choice of two different arms of service with different uniforms i could not get a uniform suit until notified of my assignment i left my measurement with a tailor with directions not to make the uniform until i notified him whether it was to be for infantry or dragoons notice did not reach me for several weeks and then it took at least a week to get the letter of instructions to the tailor and two more to make the clothes and have them sent to me this was a time of great suspense i was impatient to get on my uniform and see how it looked and probably wanted my old schoolmates particularly the girls to see me in it the conceit was knocked out of me by two little circumstances that happened soon after the arrival of the clothes which gave me a distaste for military uniform that i never recovered from soon after the arrival of the suit i donned it and put off for cincinnati on horseback while i was riding along a street of that city imagining that every one was looking at me with a feeling akin to mine when i first saw general scott a little urchin bareheaded footed with dirty and ragged pants held up by bare a single gallows that's what suspenders were called then and a shirt that had not seen a wash tub for weeks turned to me and cried soldier will you work no siree i'll sell my shirt first the horse trade and its dire consequences were recalled to mind the other circumstance occurred at home opposite our house in bethel stood the old stage tavern where man and beast found accommodation the stable man was rather dissipated but possessed of some humor on my return i found him parading the streets and attending in the stable barefooted but in a pair of sky-blue nankeen pantaloons just the color of my uniform trousers with a strip of white cotton sheeting sewed down the outside seams in imitation of mine the joke was a huge one in the mind of many of the people and was much enjoyed by them but i did not appreciate it so highly during the remainder of my leave of absence my time was spent in visiting friends in georgetown and cincinnati and occasionally other towns in that part of the state end of section two recording by jim clevenger little rock arkansas jim at j o c c l e v dot com
section three of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim clevenger personal memoirs of u s grant by ulysses s grant chapter three army life causes of the mexican war camp salubrity on the thirtieth of september i reported for duty at jefferson barracks st louis with the fourth united states infantry it was the largest military post in the country at that time being garrisoned by sixteen companies of infantry eight of the third regiment the remainder of the fourth colonel stephen kearney one of the ablest officers of the day commanded the post and under him discipline was kept at a high standard but without vexatious rules or regulations every drill and roll call had to be attended but in the intervals officers were permitted to enjoy themselves leaving the garrison and going where they pleased without making written application to state where they were going or how long etc so that they were back for their next duty it did seem to me in my early army days that too many of the older officers when they came to command posts made it a study to think what orders they could publish to annoy their subordinates and render them uncomfortable i noticed however a few years later when the mexican war broke out that most of this class of officers discovered they were possessed of disabilities which entirely incapacitated them for active field service they had the moral courage to proclaim it too they were right but they did not always give their disease the right name at west point i had a classmate in the last year of our studies he was roommate also f t dent whose family resided some five miles west of jefferson barracks two of his unmarried brothers were living at home at that time and as i had taken with me from ohio my horse saddle and bridle i soon found my way out to white haven the name of the dent estate as i found the family congenial my visits became frequent there were at home besides the young men two daughters one a school miss of fifteen the other a girl of eight or nine there was still an older daughter of seventeen who had been spending several years at boarding school in st louis but who though through school had not yet returned home she was spending the winter in the city with connections the family of colonel john o'fallon well known in st louis in february she returned to her country home after that i do not know but my visits became more frequent they certainly did become more enjoyable we would often take walks or go on horseback to visit the neighbors until i became quite well acquainted in that vicinity sometimes one of the brothers would accompany us sometimes one of the younger sisters if the fourth infantry had remained at jefferson barracks it is possible even probable that this life might have continued for some years without my finding out that there was anything serious the matter with me but in the following may a circumstance occurred which developed my sentiment so palpably that there was no mistaking it the annexation of texas was at this time the subject of violent discussion in congress in the press and by individuals the administration of president tyler then in power was making the most strenuous efforts to effect the annexation which was indeed the great and absorbing question of the day during these discussions the greater part of the single rifle regiment in the army the second dragoons which had been dismounted a year or two before and designated dismounted rifles was stationed at fort jessup louisiana 
some twenty-five miles east of the Texas line, to observe the frontier. About the 1st of May, the 3rd Infantry was ordered from Jefferson Barracks to Louisiana to go into camp in the neighborhood of Fort Jessup and there await further orders. The troops were embarked on steamers and were on their way down the Mississippi within a few days after the receipt of this order. About the time they started, I obtained a leave of absence for twenty days to go to Ohio to visit my parents. I was obliged to go to St. Louis to take a steamer for Louisville or Cincinnati, or the first steamer going up the Ohio River to any point. Before I left St. Louis, orders were received at Jefferson Barracks for the 4th Infantry to follow the 3rd. A messenger was sent after me to stop my leaving, but before he could reach me I was off, totally ignorant of these events. A day or two after my arrival at Bethel, I received a letter from a classmate and fellow lieutenant in the 4th, informing me of the circumstances related above, and advising me not to open any letter postmarked St. Louis or Jefferson Barracks until the expiration of my leave, and saying that he would pack up my things and take them along for me. His advice was not necessary, for no other letter was sent to me. I now discovered that I was exceedingly anxious to get back to Jefferson Barracks, and I understood the reason without explanation from anyone. My leave of absence required me to report for duty at Jefferson Barracks at the end of twenty days. I knew my regiment had gone up the Red River, but I was not disposed to break the letter of my leave. Besides, if I had proceeded to Louisiana direct, I could not have reached there until after the expiration of my leave. Accordingly, at the end of the twenty days, I reported for duty to Lieutenant Ewell, commanding at Jefferson Barracks, handing him, at the same time, my leave of absence. After noticing the phraseology of the order, leaves of absence were generally worded at the end of which time he will report for duty with his proper command, he said he would give me an order to join my regiment in Louisiana. I then asked for a few days' leave before starting, which he readily granted. This was the same Ewell who acquired considerable reputation as a Confederate general during the rebellion. He was a man much esteemed, and deservedly so, in the old army, and proved himself a gallant and efficient officer in two wars, both, in my estimation, unholy. I immediately procured a horse and started for the country, taking no baggage with me, of course. There is an insignificant creek, the Gravois, between Jefferson Barracks and the place to which I was going, and at that day there was not a bridge over it from its source to its mouth. There is not water enough in the creek at ordinary stages to run a coffee mill and at low water there is none running whatever. On this occasion it had been raining heavily, and when the creek was reached I found the banks full to overflowing and the current rapid. I looked at it a moment to consider what to do. One of my superstitions had always been, when I started to go anywhere, or to do anything, not to turn back or stop until the thing intended was accomplished. I have frequently started to go to places where I had never been, and to which I did not know the way, depending upon making inquiries on the road, and if I got past the place without knowing it, instead of turning back, I would go on until a road was found turning in the right direction, take that, and come in by the other side. So I struck into the stream, and in an instant the horse was swimming and i being carried down by the current i headed the horse towards the other bank and soon reached it wet through and without other clothes on that side of the stream i went on however to my destination and borrowed a dry suit from my future brother-in-law we were not of the same size 
but the clothes answered every purpose until I got more of my own. Before I returned, I mustered up courage to make known, in the most awkward manner imaginable, the discovery I had made on learning that the 4th Infantry had been ordered away from Jefferson Barracks. The young lady afterwards admitted that she too, although until then she had never looked upon me other than as a visitor whose company was agreeable to her, had experienced a depression of spirits she could not account for when the regiment left. Before separating, it was definitely understood that at a convenient time we would join our fortunes and not let the removal of a regiment trouble us. This was in May 1844. It was the 22nd of August, 1848, before the fulfillment of this agreement. My duties kept me on the frontier of Louisiana with the Army of Observation during the pendency of annexation, and afterwards I was absent through the war with Mexico, provoked by the action of the Army, if not by the annexation itself. During that time there was a constant correspondence between Miss Dent and myself, but we only met once in the period of four years and three months. In May 1845 I procured a leave for twenty days, visited St. Louis, and obtained the consent of the parents for the Union, which had not been asked for before. As already stated, it was never my intention to remain in the army long, but to prepare myself for a professorship in some college. Accordingly, soon after I was settled at Jefferson Barracks, I wrote a letter to Professor Church, professor of mathematics at West Point, requesting him to ask my designation as his assistant when next a detail had to be made assistant professors at west point are all officers of the army supposed to be selected for their special fitness for the particular branch of study they are assigned to teach the answer from professor church was entirely satisfactory and no doubt i should have been detailed a year or two later but for the mexican war coming on Accordingly, I laid out for myself a course of studies to be pursued in garrison, with regularity, if not persistency. I reviewed my West Point course of mathematics during the seven months at Jefferson Barracks, and read many valuable historical works, besides an occasional novel. To help my memory, I kept a book in which I would write up from time to time, my recollections of all I had read since last posting it. When the regiment was ordered away, I, being absent at the time, my effects were packed up by Lieutenant Hazlitt of the 4th Infantry and taken along. I never saw my journal after, nor did I ever keep another, except for a portion of the time while traveling abroad. Often since, a fear has crossed my mind lest that book might turn up yet and fall into the hands of some malicious person who would publish it. I know its appearance would cause me as much heart-burning as my youthful horse trade or the later rebuke for wearing uniform clothes. The 3rd Infantry had selected camping grounds on the reservation at Fort Jessup, about midway between the Red River and the Sabine. Our orders required us to go into camp in the same neighborhood and await further instructions. Those authorized to do so selected a place in the pine woods between the old town of Nacogdoches and Grand Ecore, about three miles from each and on high ground back from the river. The place was given the name of Camp Salubrity and proved entitled to it. The camp was on a high, sandy pine ridge, with spring branches in the valley in front and rear. The springs furnished an abundance of cool, pure water, and the ridge was above the flight of mosquitoes, which abound in that region in great multitudes and of great voracity. 
in the valley they swarmed in myriads but never came to the summit of the ridge the regiment occupied this camp six months before the first death occurred and that was caused by an accident there was no intimation given that the removal of the third and fourth regiments of infantry to the western border of louisiana was occasioned in any way by the prospective annexation of texas but it was generally understood that such was the case ostensibly we were intended to prevent filibustering into texas but really as a menace to mexico in case she appeared to contemplate war generally the officers of the army were indifferent whether the annexation was consummated or not but not so all of them for myself i was bitterly opposed to the measure and to this day regard the war which resulted as one of the most unjust ever waged by a stronger against a weaker nation it was an instance of a republic following the bad examples of european monarchies in not considering justice in their desire to acquire additional territory texas was originally a state belonging to the republic of mexico it extended from the sabine river on the east to the rio grande on the west and from the gulf of mexico on the south and east to the territory of the united states and new mexico another mexican state at that time on the north and west an empire in territory it had but a very sparse population until settled by americans who had received authority from mexico to colonize these colonists paid very little attention to the supreme government and introduced slavery into the state almost from the start though the constitution of mexico did not nor does it now sanction that institution soon they set up an independent government of their own and war existed between texas and mexico in name from that time until eighteen thirty six when active hostilities very nearly ceased upon the capture of santa anna the mexican president before long however the same people who with permission of mexico had colonized texas and afterwards set up slavery there and then seceded as soon as they felt strong enough to do so offered themselves and the state to the united states and in eighteen forty five their offer was accepted the occupation separation and annexation were from the inception of the movement to its final consummation a conspiracy to acquire territory out of which slave states might be formed for the american union even if the annexation itself could be justified the manner in which the subsequent war was forced upon mexico cannot the fact is annexationists wanted more territory than they could possibly lay any claim to as part of the new acquisition texas as an independent state never had exercised jurisdiction over the territory between the nucius river and the rio grande mexico had never recognized the independence of texas and maintained that even if independent the state had no claim south of the nucis i am aware that a treaty made by the texans with santa anna while he was under duress ceded all the territory between the nucis and the rio grande but he was a prisoner of war when the treaty was made and his life was in jeopardy he knew too that he deserved execution at the hands of the texans if they should ever capture him the texans if they had taken his life would have only followed the example set by santa anna himself a few years before when he executed the entire garrison of the alamo and the villagers of goliad in taking military possession of texas after annexation the army of occupation under general taylor was directed to occupy the disputed territory the army did not stop at the nuisance and offer to negotiate for a settlement of the boundary question but went beyond apparently in order to force mexico 
to initiate war it is to the credit of the american nation however that after conquering mexico and while practically holding the country in our possession so that we could have retained the whole of it or made any terms we chose we paid a round sum for the additional territory taken more than it was worth or was likely to be to mexico to us it was an empire and of incalculable value but it might have been obtained by other means the southern rebellion was largely the outgrowth of the mexican war nations like individuals are punished for their transgressions we got our punishment in the most sanguinary and expensive war of modern times the fourth infantry went into camp at salubrity in the month of may eighteen forty four with instructions as i have said to await further orders at first officers and men occupied ordinary tents as the summer heat increased these were covered by sheds to break the rays of the sun the summer was wild away in social enjoyments among the officers in visiting those stationed at and near fort jessup twenty-five miles away visiting the planters on the red river and the citizens of nacogdoches and grand ecor there was much pleasant intercourse between the inhabitants and the officers of the army i retain very agreeable recollections of my stay at camp salubrity and of the acquaintances made there and no doubt my feeling is shared by the few officers living who were there at the time i can call to mind only two officers of the fourth infantry besides myself who were at camp salubrity with the regiment who are now alive with a war in prospect and belonging to a regiment that had an unusual number of officers detailed on special duty away from the regiment my hopes of being ordered to west point as instructor vanished at the time of which i now write officers in the quartermasters commissaries and adjutant general's departments were appointed from the line of the army and did not vacate their regimental commissions until their regimental and staff commissions were for the same grades generally lieutenants were appointed to captaincies to fill vacancies in the staff corps if they should reach a captaincy in the line before they arrived at a majority in the staff they would elect which commission they would retain in the fourth infantry in eighteen forty four at least six line officers were on duty in the staff and therefore permanently detached from the regiment under these circumstances i gave up everything like a special course of reading and only read thereafter for my own amusement and not very much for that until the war was over i kept a horse and rode and stayed out of doors most of the time by day and entirely recovered from the cough which i had carried from west point and from all indications of consumption i have often thought that my life was saved and my health restored by exercise and exposure enforced by an administrative act and a war both of which i disapproved as summer wore away in cool days and colder nights came upon us the tents we were occupying ceased to afford comfortable quarters and further orders not reaching us we began to look about to remedy the hardship men were put to work getting out timber to build huts and in a very short time all were comfortably housed privates as well as officers the outlay by the government in accomplishing this was nothing or nearly nothing the winter was spent more agreeably than the summer had been there were occasional parties given by the planters along the coast as the bottom lands on the red river were called the climate was delightful 
near the close of the short session of congress in eighteen forty four eighteen forty five the bill for the annexation of texas to the united states was passed it reached president tyler on the first of march eighteen forty five and promptly received his approval when the news reached us we began to look again for further orders they did not arrive promptly and on the first of may following i asked and obtained a leave of absence for twenty days for the purpose of visiting st louis the object of this visit has been before stated early in july the long expected orders were received but they only took the regiment to new orleans barracks we reached there before the middle of the month and again waited weeks for still further orders the yellow fever was raging in new orleans during the time we remained there and the streets of the city had the appearance of a continuous well-observed sunday i recollect but one occasion when this observance seemed to be broken by the inhabitants one morning about daylight i happened to be awake and hearing the discharge of a rifle not far off i looked out to ascertain where the sound came from i observed a couple of clusters of men near by and learned afterwards that it was nothing only a couple of gentlemen deciding a difference of opinion with rifles at twenty paces i do not remember if either was killed or even hurt but no doubt the question of difference was settled satisfactorily and honorably in the estimation of the parties engaged i do not believe i ever would have the courage to fight a duel if any man should wrong me to the extent of my being willing to kill him i would not be willing to give him the choice of weapons with which it should be done and of the time place and distance separating us when i executed him if i should do another such a wrong as to justify him in killing me i would make any reasonable atonement within my power if convinced of the wrong done i place my opposition to dueling on higher grounds than here stated no doubt a majority of the duels fought have been for want of moral courage on the part of those engaged to decline at camp salubrity and when we went to new orleans barracks the fourth infantry was commanded by colonel vose then an old gentleman who had not commanded on drill for a number of years he was not a man to discover infirmity in the presence of danger it now appeared that war was imminent and he felt that it was his duty to brush up his tactics accordingly when we got settled down at our new post he took command of the regiment at a battalion drill only two or three evolutions had been gone through when he dismissed the battalion and turning to go to his own quarters dropped dead he had not been complaining of ill health but no doubt died of heart disease he was a most estimable man of exemplary habits and by no means the author of his own disease End of section three Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Section 4 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 4. Corpus Christi. Mexican Smuggling. Spanish Rule in Mexico. Supplying Transportation. Early in September, the regiment left New Orleans for Corpus Christi, now in Texas. 
ocean steamers were not then common and the passage was made in sailing vessels at that time there was not more than three feet of water in the channel at the outlet of corpus christi bay the debarkation therefore had to take place by small steamers and at an island in the channel called shell island the ships anchoring some miles out from shore this made the work slow and as the army was only supplied with one or two steamers it took a number of days to effect the landing of a single regiment with its stores camp and garrison equipage etc there happened to be pleasant weather while this was going on but the land swell was so great that when the ship and steamer were on opposite sides of the same wave they would be at considerable distance apart the men and baggage were let down to a point higher than the lower deck of the steamer and when ship and steamer got into the trough between the waves and were close together the load would be drawn over the steamer and rapidly run down until it rested on the deck after i had gone ashore and had been on guard several days at shell island quite six miles from the ship i had occasion for some reason or other to return on board while on the suvia i think that was the name of our vessel i heard a tremendous racket at the other end of the ship and much and excited sailor language such as damn your eyes etc in a moment or two the captain who was an excitable little man dying with consumption and not weighing much over a hundred pounds came running out carrying a sabre nearly as large and as heavy as he was and crying that his men had mutinied it was necessary to sustain the captain without question and in a few minutes all the sailors charged with mutiny were in irons i rather felt for a time a wish that i had not gone aboard just then as the men charged with mutiny submitted to being placed in irons without resistance i always doubted if they knew that they had mutinied until they were told by the time i was ready to leave the ship again i thought i had learned enough of the working of the double and single pulley by which passengers were let down from the upper deck of the ship to the steamer below and determined to let myself down without assistance without saying anything of my intentions to any one i mounted the railing and taking hold of the centre rope just below the upper block i put one foot on the hook below the lower block and stepped off just as i did so some one called out hold on it was too late i tried to hold on with all my might but my heels went up and my head went down so rapidly that my hold broke and i plunged head foremost into the water some twenty-five feet below with such velocity that it seemed to me i never would stop when i came to the surface again being a fair swimmer and not having lost my presence of mind i swam around until a bucket was let down for me and i was drawn up without a scratch or injury i do not believe there was a man on board who sympathized with me in the least when they found me uninjured i rather enjoyed the joke myself the captain of the suvia died of his disease a few months later and i believe before the mutineers were tried i hope they got clear because as before stated i always thought the mutiny was all in the brain of a very weak and sick man after reaching shore or shell island the labor of getting to corpus christi was slow and tedious there was if my memory serves me but one small steamer to transport troops and baggage when the fourth infantry arrived others were procured later the distance from shell island to corpus christi was some sixteen or eighteen miles the channel to the bay was so shallow that the steamer small as it was had to be dragged over the bottom when loaded 
not more than one trip a day could be effected later this was remedied by deepening the channel and increasing the number of vessels suitable to its navigation corpus christi is near the head of the bay of the same name formed by the entrance of the nueces river into tidewater and is on the west bank of that bay at the time of its first occupancy by united states troops there was a small mexican hamlet there containing probably less than one hundred souls there was in addition a small american trading post at which goods were sold to mexican smugglers all goods were put up in compact packages of about one hundred pounds each suitable for loading on pack mules two of these packages made a load for an ordinary mexican mule and three for the larger ones the bulk of the trade was in leaf tobacco and domestic cotton cloths and calicoes the mexicans had before the arrival of the army but little to offer in exchange except silver the trade in tobacco was enormous considering the population to be supplied almost every mexican above the age of ten years and many much younger smoked the cigarette nearly every mexican carried a pouch of leaf tobacco powdered by rolling in the hands and a roll of corn husk to make wrappers the cigarettes were made by the smokers as they used them up to the time of which i write and for years afterwards i think until the administration of president juarez the cultivation manufacture and sale of tobacco constituted a government monopoly and paid the bulk of the revenue collected from internal sources the price was enormously high and made successful smuggling very profitable the difficulty of obtaining tobacco is probably the reason why everybody male and female used it at that time i know from my own experience that when i was at west point the fact that tobacco in every form was prohibited and the mere possession of the weeds severely punished made the majority of the cadets myself included try to acquire the habit of using it i failed utterly at the time and for many years afterward but the majority accomplished the object of their youthful ambition under spanish rule mexico was prohibited from producing anything that the mother country could supply this rule excluded the cultivation of the grape olive and many other articles to which the soil and climate were well adapted the country was governed for revenue only and tobacco which cannot be raised in spain but is indigenous to mexico offered a fine instrumentality for securing this prime object of government the native population had been in the habit of using the weed from a period back of any recorded history of this continent bad habits if not restrained by law or public opinion spread more rapidly and universally than good ones and the spanish colonists adopted the use of tobacco almost as generally as the natives spain therefore in order to secure the largest revenue from this source prohibited the cultivation except in specified localities and in these places farmed out the privilege at a very high price the tobacco when raised could only be sold to the government and the price to the consumer was limited only by the avarice of the authorities and the capacity of the people to pay all laws for the government of the country were enacted in spain and the officers for their execution were appointed by the crown and sent out to the new el dorado the mexicans had been brought up ignorant of how to legislate or how to rule when they gained their independence after many years of war it was the most natural thing in the world that they should adopt as their own the laws then in existence the only change was that mexico became her own executor of the laws and the recipient of the revenues the tobacco tax yielding so large a revenue under the law as it stood 
was one of the last if not the very last of the obnoxious imposts to be repealed now the citizens are allowed to cultivate any crops the soil will yield tobacco is cheap and every quality can be produced its use is by no means so general as when i first visited the country gradually the army of occupation assembled at corpus christi when it was all together it consisted of seven companies of the second regiment of dragoons four companies of light artillery five regiments of infantry the third fourth fifth seventh and eighth and one regiment of artillery acting as infantry not more than three thousand men in all general zachary taylor commanded the whole there were troops enough in one body to establish a drill and discipline sufficient to fit men and officers for all they were capable of in case of battle the rank and file were composed of men who had enlisted in time of peace to serve for seven dollars a month and were necessarily inferior as material to the average volunteers enlisted later in the war expressly to fight and also to the volunteers in the war for the preservation of the union the men engaged in the mexican war were brave and the officers of the regular army from highest to lowest were educated in their profession a more efficient army for its number and armament i do not believe ever fought a battle than the one commanded by general taylor in his first two engagements on mexican or texan soil the presence of united states troops on the edge of the disputed territory furthest from the mexican settlements was not sufficient to provoke hostilities we were sent to provoke a fight but it was essential that mexico should commence it it was very doubtful whether congress would declare war but if mexico should attack our troops the executive could announce whereas war exists by the acts of etc and prosecute the contest with vigor once initiated there were but few public men who would have the courage to oppose it experience proves that the man who obstructs a war in which his nation is engaged no matter whether right or wrong occupies no enviable place in life or history better for him individually to advocate war pestilence and famine than to act as obstructionist to a war already begun the history of the defeated rebel will be honorable hereafter compared with that of the northern man who aided him by conspiring against his government while protected by it the most favorable posthumous history the stay-at-home traitor can hope for is oblivion mexico showing no willingness to come to the nooses to drive the invaders from her soil it became necessary for the invaders to approach to within a convenient distance to be struck accordingly preparations were begun for moving the army to the rio grande to a point near matamoros it was desirable to occupy a position near the largest center of population possible to reach without absolutely invading territory to which we set up no claim whatever the distance from corpus christi to matamoros is about one hundred and fifty miles the country does not abound in fresh water and the length of the marches had to be regulated by the distance between water supplies besides the streams there were occasional pools filled during the rainy season some probably made by the traders who traveled constantly between corpus christi and the rio grande and some by the buffalo there was not at that time a single habitation cultivated field or herd of domestic animals between corpus christi and matamoros 
it was necessary therefore to have a wagon train sufficiently large to transport the camp and garrison equipage officers baggage and rations for the army and part rations of grain for the artillery horses and all the animals taken from the north where they had been accustomed to having their forage furnished them the army was but indifferently supplied with transportation wagons and harness could easily be supplied from the north but mules and horses could not so readily be brought the american traders and mexican smugglers came to the relief contracts were made for mules at from eight to eleven dollars each the smugglers furnished the animals and took their pay in goods of the description before mentioned i doubt whether the mexicans received in value from the traders five dollars per head for the animals they furnished and still more whether they paid anything but their own time in procuring them such as trade such as war the government paid in hard cash to the contractor the stipulated price between the rio grande and the nooses there was at that time a large band of wild horses feeding as numerous probably as the band of buffalo roaming further north was before its rapid extermination commenced the mexicans used to capture these in large numbers and bring them into the american settlements and sell them a picked animal could be purchased at from eight to twelve dollars but taken at wholesale they could be bought for thirty six dollars a dozen some of these were purchased for the army and answered a most useful purpose the horses were generally very strong formed much like the norman horse and with very heavy manes and tails a number of officers supplied themselves with these and they generally rendered as useful service as the northern animal in fact they were much better when grazing was the only means of supplying forage there was no need for haste and some months were consumed in the necessary preparations for a move in the meantime the army was engaged in all the duties pertaining to the officer and the soldier twice that i remember small trains were sent from corpus christi with cavalry escorts to san antonio and austin with paymasters and funds to pay off small detachments of troops stationed at those places general taylor encouraged officers to accompany these expeditions i accompanied one of them in december eighteen forty five the distance from corpus christi to san antonio was then computed at one hundred and fifty miles now that roads exist it is probably less from san antonio to austin we computed the distance at one hundred and ten miles and from the latter place back to corpus christi at over two hundred miles i know the distance now from san antonio to austin is but little over eighty miles so that our computation was probably too high there was not at the time an individual living between corpus christi and san antonio until within about thirty miles of the latter point where there were a few scattering mexican settlements along the san antonio river the people in at least one of these hamlets lived underground for protection against the indians the country abounded in game such as deer and antelope with abundance of wild turkeys along the streams and where there were nut-bearing woods on the new seas about twenty-five miles up from corpus christi were a few log cabins the remains of a town called san patricio but the inhabitants had all been massacred by the indians or driven away san antonio was about equally divided in population between americans and mexicans from there to austin there was not a single residence except at new braunfels on the guadalupe river at that point was a settlement of germans who had only that year come into the state at all events 
they were living in small huts about such as soldiers would hastily construct for temporary occupation from austin to corpus christi there was only a small settlement at bastrop with a few farms along the colorado river but after leaving that there were no settlements except the home of one man with one female slave at the old town of goliad some of the houses were still standing goliad had been quite a village for the period and region but some years before there had been a mexican massacre in which every inhabitant had been killed or driven away this with the massacre of the prisoners in the alamo san antonio about the same time more than three hundred men in all furnished the strongest justification the texans had for carrying on the war with so much cruelty in fact from that time until the mexican war the hostilities between texans and mexicans was so great that neither was safe in the neighborhood of the other who might be in superior numbers or possessed of superior arms the man we found living there seemed like an old friend he had come from near fort jessup louisiana where the officers of the third and fourth infantry and the second dragoons had known him and his family he had emigrated in advance of his family to build up a home for them end of section four recording by jim clevenger little rock arkansas jim at j o c c l e v dot com section five of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim clevenger personal memoirs of u s grant by ulysses s grant chapter five trip to austin promotion to full second lieutenant army of occupation when our party left corpus christi it was quite large including the cavalry escort paymaster major dix his clerk and the officers who like myself were simply on leave but all the officers on leave except lieutenant benjamin afterwards killed in the valley of mexico lieutenant now general augur and myself concluded to spend their allotted time at san antonio and return from there we were all to be back at corpus christi by the end of the month the paymaster was detained in austin so long that if we had waited for him we would have exceeded our leave we concluded therefore to start back at once with the animals we had and having to rely principally on grass for their food it was a good six days journey we had to sleep on the prairie every night except at goliad and possibly one night on the colorado without shelter and with only such food as we carried with us and prepared ourselves the journey was hazardous on account of indians and there were white men in texas whom i would not have cared to meet in a secluded place lieutenant augur was taken seriously sick before we reached goliad and at a distance from any habitation to add to the complication his horse a mustang that had probably been captured from the band of wild horses before alluded to and of undoubted longevity at his capture gave out it was absolutely necessary to get forward to goliad to find a shelter for our sick companion by dint of patience and exceedingly slow movements goliad was at last reached and a shelter and bed secured for our patient we remained over a day hoping that augur might recover sufficiently to resume his travels he did not however and knowing that major dix would be along in a few days with his wagon train now empty and escort 
we arranged with our louisiana friend to take the best of care of the sick lieutenant until thus relieved and went on i had never been a sportsman in my life had scarcely ever gone in search of game and rarely seen any when looking for it on this trip there was no minute of time while travelling between san patricio and the settlements on the san antonio river from san antonio to austin and again from the colorado river back to san patricio when deer or antelope could not be seen in great numbers each officer carried a shotgun and every evening after going into camp some would go out and soon return with venison and wild turkeys enough for the entire camp i however never went out and had no occasion to fire my gun except being detained over a day at goliad benjamin and i concluded to go down to the creek which was fringed with timber much of it the pecan and bring back a few turkeys we had scarcely reached the edge of the timber when i heard the flutter of wings overhead and in an instant i saw two or three turkeys flying away these were soon followed by more then more and more until a flock of twenty or thirty had left from just over my head all this time i stood watching the turkeys to see where they flew with my gun on my shoulder and never once thought of leveling it at the birds when i had time to reflect upon the matter i came to the conclusion that as a sportsman i was a failure and went back to the house benjamin remained out and got as many turkeys as he wanted to carry back after the second night at goliad benjamin and i started to make the remainder of the journey alone we reached corpus christi just in time to avoid absence without leave we met no one not even an indian during the remainder of our journey except at san patricio a new settlement had been started there in our absence of three weeks induced possibly by the fact that there were houses already built while the proximity of troops gave protection against the indians on the evening of the first day out from golian we heard the most unearthly howling of wolves directly in our front the prairie grass was tall and we could not see the beasts but the sound indicated that they were near to my ear it appeared that there must have been enough of them to devour our party horses and all at a single meal the part of ohio that i hailed from was not thickly settled but wolves had been driven out long before i left benjamin was from indiana still less populated where the wolf yet roamed over the prairies he understood the nature of the animal and the capacity of a few to make believe there was an unlimited number of them he kept on towards the noise unmoved i followed in his trail lacking moral courage to turn back and join our sick companion i have no doubt that if benjamin had proposed returning to goliad i would not only have seconded the motion but have suggested that it was very hard-hearted in us to leave augur sick there in the first place but benjamin did not propose turning back when he did speak it was to ask grant how many wolves do you think there are in that pack knowing where he was from and suspecting that he thought i would overestimate the number i determined to show my acquaintance with the animal by putting the estimate below what possibly could be correct and answered oh about twenty very indifferently he smiled and rode on in a minute we were close upon them and before they saw us there were just two of them seated upon their haunches with their mouths close together they had made all the noise we had been hearing for the past ten minutes 
i have often thought of this incident since when i have heard the noise of a few disappointed politicians who had deserted their associates there are always more of them before they are counted a week or two before leaving corpus christi on this trip i had been promoted from brevet second lieutenant fourth infantry to full second lieutenant seventh infantry frank gardner of the seventh was promoted to the fourth in the same orders we immediately made application to be transferred so as to get back to our old regiments on my return i found that our application had been approved at washington while in the seventh infantry i was in the company of captain holmes afterwards a lieutenant general in the confederate army i never came in contact with him in the war of the rebellion nor did he render any very conspicuous service in his high rank my transfer carried me to the company of captain mccall who resigned from the army after the mexican war and settled in philadelphia he was prompt however to volunteer when the rebellion broke out and soon rose to the rank of major-general in the union army i was not fortunate enough to meet him after he resigned in the old army he was esteemed very highly as a soldier and gentleman our relations were always most pleasant the preparations at corpus christi for an advance progressed as rapidly in the absence of some twenty or more lieutenants as if we had been there the principal business consisted in securing mules and getting them broken to harness the process was slow but amusing the animals sold to the government were all young and unbroken even to the saddle and were quite as wild as the wild horses of the prairie usually a number would be brought in by a company of mexicans partners in the delivery the mules were first driven into a stockade called a corral enclosing an acre or more of ground the mexicans who were all experienced in throwing the lasso would go into the corral on horseback with their lassos attached to the pommels of their saddles soldiers detailed as teamsters and blacksmiths would also enter the corral the former with ropes to serve as halters the latter with branding irons and a fire to keep the irons heated a lasso was then thrown over the neck of a mule when he would immediately go to the length of his tether first one end then the other in the air while he was thus plunging and gyrating another lasso would be thrown by another mexican catching the animal by a forefoot this would bring the mule to the ground when he was seized and held by the teamsters while the blacksmiths put upon him with hot irons the initials u s ropes were then put about the neck with a slip noose which would tighten around the throat if pulled with a man on each side holding these ropes the mule was released from his other bindings and allowed to rise with more or less difficulty he would be conducted to a picket rope outside and fastened there the delivery of that mule was then complete this process was gone through with every mule and wild horse with the army of occupation the method of breaking them was less cruel and much more amusing it is a well-known fact that where domestic animals are used for specific purposes from generation to generation the descendants are easily as a rule subdued to the same use at that time in northern mexico the mule or his ancestors the horse and the ass was seldom used except for the saddle or pack at all events the corpus christi mule resisted the new use to which he was being put the treatment he was subjected to in order to overcome his prejudices was summary and effective the soldiers were principally foreigners who had enlisted in our large cities 
and with the exception of a chance drayman among them it is not probable that any of the men who reported themselves as competent teamsters had ever driven a mule team in their lives or indeed that many had had any previous experience in driving any animal whatever to harness numbers together can accomplish what twice their number acting individually could not perform five mules were allotted to each wagon a teamster would select at the picket rope five animals of nearly the same color and general appearance for his team with a full corps of assistants other teamsters he would then proceed to get his mules together in twos the men would approach each animal selected avoiding as far as possible its heels two ropes would be put about the neck of each animal with slip noose so that he could be choked if too unruly they were then led out harnessed by force and hitched to the wagon in the position they had to keep ever after two men remained on either side of the leader with the lassos about its neck and one man retained the same restraining influence over each of the others all being ready the hold would be slackened and the team started the first motion was generally five mules in the air at one time backs bowed hind feet extended to the rear after repeating this movement a few times the leaders would start to run this would bring the breeching tight against the mules at the wheels which these last seemed to regard as a most unwarrantable attempt at coercion and would resist by taking a seat sometimes going so far as to lie down in time all were broken in to do their duty submissively if not cheerfully but there never was a time during the war when it was safe to let a mexican mule get entirely loose their drivers were all teamsters by the time they got through i recollect one case of a mule that had worked in a team under the saddle not only for some time at corpus christi where he was broken but all the way to the point opposite matamoras then to camargo where he got loose from his fastenings during the night he did not run away at first but stayed in the neighborhood for a day or two coming up sometimes to the feed trough even but on the approach of the teamster he always got out of the way at last growing tired of the constant effort to catch him he disappeared altogether nothing short of a mexican with his lasso could have caught him regulations would not have warranted the expenditure of a dollar in hiring a man with a lasso to catch that mule but they did allow the expenditure of the mule on a certificate that he had run away without any fault of the quartermaster on whose returns he was born and also the purchase of another to take his place i am a competent witness for i was regimental quartermaster at the time while at corpus christi all the officers who had a fancy for riding kept horses the animals cost but little in the first instance and when picketed they would get their living without any cost i had three not long before the army moved but a sad accident bereft me of them all at one time a colored boy who gave them all the attention they got besides looking after my tent and that of a classmate and fellow lieutenant and cooking for us all for about eight dollars per month was riding one to water and leading the other two the led horses pulled him from his seat and all three ran away they never were heard of afterwards shortly after that some one told captain bliss general taylor's adjutant general of my misfortune yes i heard grant lost five or six dollars worth of horses the other day he replied that was a slander they were broken to the saddle when i got them and cost nearly twenty dollars i never suspected the colored boy of malicious intent in letting them get away because if they had not escaped he could have had one of them to ride on the long march then in prospect 
End of section 5. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Section 6 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 6. Advance of the Army crossing the colorado the rio grande at last the preparations were complete and orders were issued for the advance to begin on the eighth of march general taylor had an army of not more than three thousand men one battery the siege guns and all the convalescent troops were sent on by water to brazo santiago at the mouth of the rio grande a guard was left back at Corpus Christi to look after public property and to take care of those who were too sick to be removed. The remainder of the army, probably not more than 2,500 men, was divided into three brigades with the cavalry independent. Colonel Twiggs, with seven companies of dragoons and a battery of light artillery, moved on the 8th. He was followed by the three infantry brigades, with a day's interval between the commands. Thus the rear brigade did not move from Corpus Christi until the 11th of March. In view of the immense bodies of men moved on the same day over narrow roads, through dense forests, and across large streams in our late war, it seems strange now that a body of less than 3,000 men should have broken into four columns separated by a day's march. General Taylor was opposed to anything like plundering by the troops, and in this instance, I doubt not, he looked upon the enemy as the aggrieved party and was not willing to injure them further than his instructions from Washington demanded. His orders to the troops enjoined scrupulous regard for the rights of all peaceable persons, and the payment of the highest price for all supplies taken for the use of the army. All officers of foot regiments who had horses were permitted to ride them on the march when it did not interfere with their military duties. As already related, having lost my five or six dollars worth of horses, but a short time before, I determined not to get another but to make the journey on foot. My company commander, Captain McCall, had two good American horses of considerably more value in that country, where native horses were cheap, than they were in the States. He used one himself and wanted the other for his servant. He was quite anxious to know whether I did not intend to get me another horse before the march began. I told him no, I belonged to a foot regiment. I did not understand the object of his solicitude at the time, but when we were about to start he said, There, Grant, is a horse for you. I found that he could not bear the idea of his servant riding on a long march while his lieutenant went afoot. He had found a Mustang, a three-year-old colt, only recently captured, which had been purchased by one of the colored servants with the regiment for the sum of three dollars. It was probably the only horse at Corpus Christi that could have been purchased just then for any reasonable price. Five dollars, sixty-six and two-thirds percent, advance, induced the owner to part with the Mustang. I was sorry to take him, because I really felt that, belonging to a foot regiment, it was my duty to march with the men. But I saw the captain's earnestness in the matter, and accepted the horse for the trip. 
The day we started was the first time the horse had ever been under saddle. I had, however, but little difficulty in breaking him, though for the first day there were frequent disagreements between us as to which way we should go and sometimes whether we should go at all. At no time during the day could I choose exactly the part of the column I would march with, but after that I had as tractable a horse as any with the army, and there was none that stood the trip better. He never ate a mouthful of food on the journey, except the grass he could pick within the length of his picket rope. A few days out from Corpus Christi, the immense herd of wild horses that ranged at that time between the Nueces and the Rio Grande was seen directly in advance of the head of the column and but a few miles off. It was the very band from which the horse I was riding had been captured but a few weeks before. The column was halted for a rest, and a number of officers, myself among them, rode out two or three miles to the right to see the extent of the herd. The country was a rolling prairie, and from the higher ground the vision was obstructed only by the earth's curvature. As far as the eye could reach to our right, the herd extended. To the left, it extended equally. There was no estimating the number of animals in it. I have no idea that they could all have been corralled in the state of Rhode Island or Delaware at one time. If they had been, they would have been so thick that the pasturage would have given out the first day. People who saw the southern herd of buffalo fifteen or twenty years ago, can appreciate the size of the Texas band of wild horses in 1846. At the point where the army struck the little Colorado River, the stream was quite wide and of sufficient depth for navigation. The water was brackish and the banks were fringed with timber. Here, the whole army concentrated before attempting to cross. The army was not accompanied by a pontoon train, and at that time the troops were not instructed in bridge building. To add to the embarrassment of the situation, the army was here, for the first time, threatened with opposition. Buglers, concealed from our view by the brush on the opposite side, sounded the assembly and other military calls. Like the wolves before spoken of, they gave the impression that there was a large number of them, and that, if the troops were in proportion to the noise, they were sufficient to devour General Taylor and his army. There were probably but few troops, and those engaged principally in watching the movements of the invader. A few of our cavalry dashed in and forded and swam the stream, and all opposition was soon dispersed. I do not remember that a single shot was fired. The troops waded the stream, which was up to their necks in the deepest part. Teams were crossed by attaching a long rope to the end of the wagon tongue, passing it between the two swing mules and by the side of the leader hitching his bridle as well as the bridle of the mules in rear to it, and carrying the end to men on the opposite shore. The bank down to the water was steep on both sides. A rope, long enough to cross the river, therefore, was attached to the back axle of the wagon, and men behind would hold the rope to prevent the wagon beating the mules into the water. This latter rope also served the purpose of bringing the end of the forward one back to be used over again. The water was deep enough for a short distance to swim the little Mexican mules which the army was then using, but they and the wagons were pulled through so fast by the men at the end of the rope ahead that no time was left them to show their obstinacy. In this manner, the artillery and transportation of the Army of Occupation 
crossed the Colorado River. About the middle of the month of March, the advance of the army reached the Rio Grande and went into camp near the banks of the river, opposite the city of Metamoros, and almost under the guns of a small fort at the lower end of the town. There was not at that time a single habitation from Corpus Christi until the Rio Grande was reached. The work of fortifying was commenced at once. The fort was laid out by the engineers, but the work was done by the soldiers under the supervision of their officers, the chief engineer retaining general directions. The Mexicans now became so incensed at our near approach that some of their troops crossed the river above us and made it unsafe for small bodies of men to go far beyond the limits of camp. They captured two companies of dragoons, commanded by Captains Thornton and Hardy. The latter figured as a general in the late war on the Confederate side, and was author of the tactics first used by both armies. Lieutenant Theodoric Porter, of the 4th Infantry, was killed while out with a small detachment, and Major Cross, the assistant quartermaster general, had also been killed not far from camp. There was no base of supplies nearer than Point Isabel on the coast north of the mouth of the Rio Grande and twenty-five miles away. The enemy, if the Mexicans could be called such at this time when no war had been declared, hovered about in such numbers that it was not safe to send a wagon train after supplies with any escort that could be spared. I have already said that General Taylor's whole command on the Rio Grande numbered less than 3,000 men. He had, however, a few more troops at Point Isabel or Brazo Santiago. The supplies brought from Corpus Christi in wagons were running short. Work was, therefore, pushed with great vigor on the defenses to enable the minimum number of troops to hold the fort. All the men who could be employed were kept at work from early dawn until darkness closed the labors of the day. With all this, the fort was not completed until the supplies grew so short that further delay in obtaining more could not be thought of. By the latter part of April, the work was in a partially defensible condition, and the seventh infantry major jacob brown commanding was marched in to garrison it with some few pieces of artillery all the supplies on hand with the exception of enough to carry the rest of the army to point isabel were left with the garrison and the march was commenced with the remainder of the command every wagon being taken with the army Early on the second day after starting, the force reached its destination without opposition from the Mexicans. There was some delay in getting supplies ashore from vessels at anchor in the open roadstead. End of section six. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at j o c c l e v dot com. Section 7 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 7. The Mexican War the battle of palo alto the battle of resaca de la palma army of invasion general taylor movement on camargo while general taylor was away with the bulk of his army the little garrison up the river was besieged as we lay in our tents upon the seashore the artillery at the fort on the rio grande could be distinctly heard the war had begun. There were no possible means of obtaining news from the garrison, and 
information from outside could not be otherwise than unfavorable what general taylor's feelings were during this suspense i do not know but for myself a young second lieutenant who had never heard a hostile gun before i felt sorry that i had enlisted a great many men when they smell battle afar off chafe to get into the fray when they say so themselves they generally fail to convince their hearers that they are as anxious as they would like to make believe and as they approach danger they become more subdued this rule is not universal for i have known a few men who were always aching for a fight when there was no enemy near who were as good as their word when the battle did come but the number of such men is small on the seventh of may the wagons were all loaded and general taylor started on his return with his army reinforced at point isabel but still less than three thousand strong to relieve the garrison on the rio grande the road from point isabel to matamoras is over an open rolling treeless prairie until the timber that borders the bank of the rio grande is reached this river like the mississippi flows through a rich alluvial valley in the most meandering manner running towards all points of the compass at times within a few miles formerly the river ran by resaca de la palma some four or five miles east of the present channel the old bed of the river at resaca had become filled at places leaving a succession of little lakes the timber that had formerly grown upon both banks and for a considerable distance out was still standing this timber was struck six or eight miles out from the besieged garrison at a point known as palo alto tall trees or woods early in the afternoon of the eighth of may as palo alto was approached an army certainly outnumbering our little force was seen drawn up in line of battle just in front of the timber their bayonets and spearheads glistened in the sunlight formidably the force was composed largely of cavalry armed with lances where we were the grass was tall reaching nearly to the shoulders of the men very stiff and each stalk was pointed at the top and hard and almost as sharp as a darning needle general taylor halted his army before the head of column came in range of the artillery of the mexicans he then formed a line of battle facing the enemy his artillery two batteries and two eighteen-pounder iron guns drawn by oxen were placed in position at intervals along the line a battalion was thrown to the rear commanded by lieutenant colonel childs of the artillery as reserves these preparations completed orders were given for a platoon of each company to stack arms and go to a stream off to the right of the command to fill their canteens and also those of the rest of their respective companies when the men were all back in their places in line the command to advance was given as i looked down that long line of about three thousand armed men advancing towards a larger force also armed i thought what a fearful responsibility general taylor must feel commanding such a host and so far away from friends the mexicans immediately opened fire upon us first with artillery and then with infantry at first their shots did not reach us and the advance was continued as we got nearer the cannon balls commenced going through the ranks they hurt no one however during this advance because they would strike the ground long before they reached our line and ricocheted through the tall grass so slowly that the men would see them in open ranks and let them pass 
when we got to a point where the artillery could be used with effect a halt was called and the battle opened on both sides the infantry under general taylor was armed with flintlock muskets and paper cartridges charged with powder buckshot and ball at the distance of a few hundred yards a man might fire at you all day without your finding it out the artillery was generally six-pounder brass guns throwing only solid shot but general taylor had with him three or four twelve-pounder howitzers throwing shell besides his eighteen-pounders before spoken of that had a long range this made a powerful armament the mexicans were armed about as we were so far as their infantry was concerned but their artillery only fired solid shot we had greatly the advantage in this arm the artillery was advanced a rod or two in front of the line and opened fire the infantry stood at order arms as spectators watching the effect of our shots upon the enemy and watching his shots so as to step out of their way it could be seen that the eighteen pounders and the howitzers did a great deal of execution on our side there was little or no loss while we occupied this position during the battle major ringold an accomplished and brave artillery officer was mortally wounded and lieutenant luther also of the artillery was struck during the day several advances were made and just at dusk it became evident that the mexicans were falling back we again advanced and occupied at the close of the battle substantially the ground held by the enemy at the beginning in this last move there was a brisk fire upon our troops and some execution was done one cannonball passed through our ranks not far from me it took off the head of an enlisted man and the under jaw of captain page of my regiment while the splinters from the musket of the killed soldier and his brains and bones knocked down two or three others including one officer lieutenant wellen hurting them more or less our casualties for the day were nine killed and forty-seven wounded at the break of day on the ninth the army under taylor was ready to renew the battle but an advance showed that the enemy had entirely left our front during the night the chaparral before us was impenetrable except where there were roads or trails with occasionally clear or bare spots of small dimensions a body of men penetrating it might easily be ambushed it was better to have a few men caught in this way than the whole army yet it was necessary that the garrison at the river should be relieved to get to them the chaparral had to be passed thus i assume general taylor reasoned he halted the army not far in advance of the ground occupied by the mexicans the day before and selected captain c f smith of the artillery and captain mccall of my company to take one hundred and fifty picked men each and find where the enemy had gone this left me in command of the company an honor and responsibility i thought very great smith and mccall found no obstruction in the way of their advance until they came up to the succession of ponds before described at Rosaka. the mexicans had passed them and formed their lines on the opposite bank this position they had strengthened a little by throwing up dead trees and brush in their front and by placing artillery to cover the approaches and open places smith and mccall deployed on each side of the road as well as they could and engaged the enemy at long range word was sent back and the advance of the whole army was at once commenced as we came up we were deployed in like manner i was with the right wing 
and led my company through the thicket wherever a penetrable place could be found taking advantage of any clear spot that would carry me towards the enemy at last i got pretty close up without knowing it the balls commenced to whistle very thick overhead cutting the limbs of the chaparral right and left we could not see the enemy so i ordered my men to lie down an order that did not have to be enforced we kept our position until it became evident that the enemy were not firing at us and then withdrew to find better ground to advance upon by this time some progress had been made on our left a section of artillery had been captured by the cavalry and some prisoners had been taken the mexicans were giving way all along the line and many of them had no doubt left early i at last found a clear space separating two ponds there seemed to be a few men in front and i charged upon them with my company there was no resistance and we captured a mexican colonel who had been wounded and a few men just as i was sending them to the rear with a guard of two or three men a private came from the front bringing back one of our officers who had been badly wounded in advance of where i was the ground had been charged over before my exploit was equal to that of the soldier who boasted that he had cut off the leg of one of the enemy when asked why he did not cut off his head he replied some one had done that before this left no doubt in my mind but that the battle of resaca de la palma would have been won just as it was if i had not been there there was no further resistance the evening of the ninth the army was encamped on its old ground near the fort and the garrison was relieved the siege had lasted a number of days but the casualties were few in number major jacob brown of the seventh infantry the commanding officer had been killed and in his honor the fort was named since then a town of considerable importance has sprung up on the ground occupied by the fort and troops which has also taken his name the battles of palo alto and resaca de la palma seem to us engaged as pretty important affairs but we had only a faint conception of their magnitude until they were fought over in the north by the press and the reports came back to us at the same time or about the same time we learned that war existed between the united states and mexico by the acts of the latter country on learning this fact general taylor transferred our camps to the south or west bank of the river and matamoros was occupied we then became the army of invasion up to this time taylor had none but regular troops in his command but now that invasion had already taken place volunteers for one year commenced arriving the army remained at matamoros until sufficiently reinforced to warrant a movement into the interior general taylor was not an officer to trouble the administration much with his demands but was inclined to do the best he could with the means given him he felt his responsibility as going no further if he had thought that he was sent to perform an impossibility with the means given him he would probably have informed the authorities of his opinion and left them to determine what should be done if the judgment was against him he would have gone on and done the best he could with the means at hand without parading his grievance before the public no soldier could face either danger or responsibility more calmly than he these are qualities more rarely found than genius or physical courage general taylor never made any great show or parade 
either of uniform or retinue in dress he was possibly too plain rarely wearing anything in the field to indicate his rank or even that he was an officer but he was known to every soldier in his army and was respected by all i can call to mind only one instance when i saw him in uniform and one other when i heard of his wearing it on both occasions he was unfortunate the first was at corpus christi he had concluded to review his army before starting on the march and gave orders accordingly colonel twiggs was then second in rank with the army and to him was given the command of the review colonel and brevet brigadier general worth a far different soldier from taylor in the use of the uniform was next to twiggs in rank and claimed superiority by virtue of his brevet rank when the accidents of service threw them where one or the other had to command worth declined to attend the review as subordinate to twiggs until the question was settled by the highest authority this broke up the review and the question was referred to washington for final decision general taylor was himself only a colonel in real rank at that time and a brigadier general by brevet he was assigned to duty however by the president with the rank which his brevet gave him worth was not so assigned but by virtue of commanding a division he must under the army regulations of that day have drawn the pay of his brevet rank the question was submitted to washington and no response was received until after the army had reached the rio grande it was decided against general worth who at once tendered his resignation and left the army going north no doubt by the same vessel that carried it this kept him out of the battles of palo alto and resaca de la palma either the resignation was not accepted or general worth withdrew it before action had been taken at all events he returned to the army in time to command his division in the battle of monterey and served with it to the end of the war the second occasion on which general taylor was said to have donned his uniform was in order to receive a visit from the flag officer of the naval squadron off the mouth of the rio grande while the army was on that river the flag officer sent word that he would call on the general to pay his respects on a certain day general taylor knowing that naval officers habitually wore all the uniform the law allowed on all occasions of ceremony thought it would be only civil to receive his guest in the same style his uniform was therefore got out brushed up and put on in advance of the visit the flag officer knowing general taylor's aversion to the wearing of the uniform and feeling that it would be regarded as a compliment should he meet him in civilian's dress left off his uniform for this occasion the meeting was said to have been embarrassing to both and the conversation was principally apologetic the time was whiled away pleasantly enough at matamoras while we were waiting for volunteers it is probable that all the most important people of the territory occupied by our army left their homes before we got there but with those remaining the best of relations apparently existed it was the policy of the commanding general to allow no pillaging no taking of private property for public or individual use without satisfactory compensation so that a better market was afforded than the people had ever known before among the troops that joined us at matamoras was an ohio regiment of which thomas l hamer the member of congress who had given me my appointment to west point was major 
he told me then that he could have had the colonelcy but that as he knew he was to be appointed a brigadier general he preferred at first to take the lower grade i have said before that hamer was one of the ablest men ohio ever produced at that time he was in the prime of life being less than fifty years of age and possessed an admirable physique promising long life but he was taken sick before monterey and died within a few days i have always believed that had his life been spared he would have been president of the united states during the term filled by president pierce had hamer filled that office his partiality for me was such there is but little doubt i should have been appointed to one of the staff corps of the army the pay department probably and would therefore now be preparing to retire neither of these speculations is unreasonable and they are mentioned to show how little men control their own destiny reinforcements having arrived in the month of august the movement commenced from matamoras to camargo the head of navigation on the rio grande the line of the rio grande was all that was necessary to hold unless it was intended to invade mexico from the north in that case the most natural route to take was the one which general taylor selected it entered a pass in the sierra madre mountains at monterey through which the main road runs to the city of mexico monterey itself was a good point to hold even if the line of the rio grande covered all the territory we desired to occupy at that time it is built on a plain two thousand feet above tidewater where the air is bracing and the situation healthy on the nineteenth of august the army started for monterey leaving a small garrison at metamoris the troops with the exception of the artillery cavalry and the brigade to which i belonged were moved up the river to camargo on steamers as there were but two or three of these the boats had to make a number of trips before the last of the troops were up those who marched did so by the south side of the river lieutenant colonel garland of the fourth infantry was the brigade commander and on this occasion commanded the entire marching force one day out convinced him that marching by day in that latitude in the month of august was not a beneficial sanitary measure particularly for northern men the order of marching was changed and night marches were substituted with the best results when camargo was reached we found a city of tents outside the mexican hamlet i was detailed to act as quartermaster and commissary to the regiment the teams that had proven abundantly sufficient to transport all supplies from corpus christi to the rio grande over the level prairies of texas were entirely inadequate to the needs of the reinforced army in a mountainous country to obviate the deficiency pack mules were hired with mexicans to pack and drive them i had charge of the few wagons allotted to the fourth infantry and of the pack train to supplement them there were not men enough in the army to manage that train without the help of mexicans who had learned how as it was the difficulty was great enough the troops would take up their march at an early hour each day after they had started the tents and cooking utensils had to be made into packages so that they could be lashed to the backs of the mules sheet iron kettles tent poles and mess chests were inconvenient articles to transport in that way it took several hours to get ready to start each morning and by the time we were ready some of the mules first loaded would be tired of standing so long with their loads on their backs sometimes 
one would start to run bowing his back and kicking up until he scattered his load others would lie down and try to disarrange their loads by attempting to get on the top of them by rolling on them others with tent poles for part of their loads would manage to run a tent pole on one side of a sapling while they would take the other i am not aware of ever having used a profane expletive in my life but i would have the charity to excuse those who may have done so if they were in charge of a train of mexican pack mules at the time end of section seven recording by jim clevenger little rock arkansas jim at j o c c l e v dot com section eight of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim clevenger personal memoirs of u s grant by ulysses s grant chapter eight advance on monterey the black fort the battle of monterey surrender of the city the advance from camargo was commenced on the fifth of september the army was divided into four columns separated from each other by one day's march the advance reached seralvo in four days and halted for the remainder of the troops to come up by the thirteenth the rear guard had arrived and the same day the advance resumed its march followed as before a day separating the divisions the forward division halted again at marin twenty-four miles from monterey both this place and seralvo were nearly deserted and men women and children were seen running and scattered over the hills as we approached but when the people returned they found all their abandoned property safe which must have given them a favorable opinion of los gringos the yankees from marin the movement was in mass on the nineteenth general taylor with his army was encamped at walnut springs within three miles of monterey the town is on a small stream coming out of the mountain pass and is backed by a range of hills of moderate elevation to the north between the city and walnut springs stretches an extensive plain on this plain and entirely outside of the last houses of the city stood a strong fort enclosed on all sides to which our army gave the name of black fort its guns commanded the approaches to the city to the full extent of their range there were two detached spurs of hills or mountains to the north and northwest of the city which were also fortified on one of these stood the bishop's palace the road to saltillo leaves the upper or western end of the city under the fire of the guns from these heights the lower or eastern end was defended by two or three small detached works armed with artillery and infantry to the south was the mountain stream before mentioned and back of that the range of foothills the plaza in the center of the city was the citadel properly speaking all the streets leading from it were swept by artillery cannon being entrenched behind temporary parapets the housetops near the plaza were converted into infantry fortifications by the use of sandbags for parapets such were the defenses of monterey in september eighteen forty seven general Ampudia, with a force of certainly ten thousand men was in command general taylor's force was about six thousand five hundred strong in three divisions 
under generals butler twiggs and worth the troops went into camp at walnut springs while the engineer officers under major mansfield a general in the late war commenced their reconnaissance major mansfield found that it would be practicable to get troops around out of range of the black ford and the works on the detached hills to the northwest of the city to the saltillo road with this road in our possession the enemy would be cut off from receiving further supplies if not from all communications with the interior general worth with his division somewhat reinforced was given the task of gaining possession of the saltillo road and of carrying the detached works outside the city in that quarter he started on his march early in the afternoon of the twentieth the divisions under general butler and twiggs were drawn up to threaten the east and north sides of the city and the works on those fronts in support of the movement under general worth worth's was regarded as the main attack on monterey and all other operations were in support of it his march this day was uninterrupted but the enemy was seen to reinforce heavily about the bishop's palace and the other outside fortifications on their left general worth reached a defensible position just out of range of the enemy's guns on the heights northwest of the city and bivouacked for the night the engineer officers with him captain sanders and lieutenant george g meade afterwards the commander of the victorious national army at the battle of gettysburg made a reconnaissance to the saltillo road under cover of night during the night of the twentieth general taylor had established a battery consisting of two twenty-four pounder howitzers and a ten-inch mortar at a point from which they could play upon black fort a natural depression in the plain sufficiently deep to protect men standing in it from the fire from the fort was selected and the battery established on the crest nearest the enemy the fourth infantry then consisting of but six reduced companies was ordered to support the artillerist while they were entrenching themselves and their guns i was regimental quartermaster at the time and was ordered to remain in charge of camp and the public property at walnut springs it was supposed that the regiment would return to its camp in the morning the point for establishing the siege battery was reached and the work performed without attracting the attention of the enemy at daylight the next morning fire was opened on both sides and continued with what seemed to me at that day great fury my curiosity got the better of my judgment and i mounted a horse and rode to the front to see what was going on i had been there but a short time when an order to charge was given and lacking the moral courage to return to camp where i had been ordered to stay i charged with the regiment as soon as the troops were out of the depression they came under the fire of black fort as they advanced they got under fire from batteries guarding the east or lower end of the city and of musketry about one-third of the men engaged in the charge were killed or wounded in the space of a few minutes we retreated to get out of fire not backward but eastward and perpendicular to the direct road running into the city from walnut springs i was i believe the only person in the fourth infantry in the charge who was on horseback when we got to a place of safety the regiment halted and drew itself together what was left of it the adjutant of the regiment lieutenant hoskins who was not in robust health found himself very much fatigued from running on foot in the charge and retreat and seeing me on horseback expressed a wish that he could be mounted also i offered him my horse and he accepted the offer 
a few minutes later i saw a soldier a quartermaster's man mounted not far away i ran to him took his horse and was back with the regiment in a few minutes in a short time we were off again and the next place of safety from the shots of the enemy that i recollect of being in was a field of cane or corn to the northeast of the lower batteries the adjutant to whom i had loaned my horse was killed and i was designated to act in his place this charge was ill-conceived or badly executed we belonged to the brigade commanded by lieutenant colonel garland and he had received orders to charge the lower batteries of the city and carry them if he could without too much loss for the purpose of creating a diversion in favor of worth who was conducting the movement which it was intended should be decisive by a movement by the left flank garland could have led his men beyond the range of the fire from black fort and advanced towards the northeast angle of the city as well covered from fire as could be expected there was no undue loss of life in reaching the lower end of monterey except that sustained by garland's command meanwhile quitman's brigade conducted by an officer of engineers had reached the eastern end of the city and was placed under cover of the houses without much loss colonel garland's brigade also arrived at the suburbs and by the assistance of some of our troops that had reached housetops from which they could fire into a little battery covering the approaches to the lower end of the city the battery was speedily captured and its guns were turned upon another work of the enemy an entrance into the east end of the city was now secured and the houses protected our troops so long as they were inactive on the west general worth had reached the saltillo road after some fighting but without heavy loss he turned from his new position and captured the forts on both heights in that quarter this gave him possession of the upper or west end of monterey troops from both twiggs and butler's division were in possession of the east end of the town but the black fort to the north of the town and the plaza in the center were still in the possession of the enemy our camps at walnut springs three miles away were guarded by a company from each regiment a regiment of kentucky volunteers guarded the mortars and howitzers engaged against black fort practically monterey was invested there was nothing done on the twenty second by the united states troops but the enemy kept up a harmless fire upon us from black fort and the batteries still in their possession at the east end of the city during the night they evacuated these so that on the morning of the twenty third we held undisputed possession of the east end of monterey twiggs's division was at the lower end of the city and well covered from the fire of the enemy but the streets leading to the plaza all spanish or spanish-american towns have near their centers a square called a plaza were commanded from all directions by artillery the houses were flat roofed and but one or two stories high and about the plaza the roofs were manned with infantry the troops being protected from our fire by parapets made of sandbags all advances into the city were thus attended with much danger while moving along streets which did not lead to the plaza our men were protected from the fire and from the view of the enemy except at the crossings at these a volley of musketry and a discharge of grape shot were invariably encountered the third and fourth regiments of infantry made an advance nearly to the plaza in this way and with heavy loss 
the loss of the third infantry in commissioned officers was especially severe there were only five companies of the regiment and not over twelve officers present and five of these officers were killed when within a square of the plaza this small command ten companies in all was brought to a halt placing themselves under cover from the shots of the enemy the men would watch to detect a head above the sandbags on the neighboring houses the exposure of a single head would bring a volley from our soldiers we had not occupied this position long when it was discovered that our ammunition was growing low i volunteered to go back to the point we had started from report our position to general twiggs and asked for ammunition to be forwarded. We were at this time occupying ground off from the street in rear of the houses. My ride back was an exposed one. Before starting, I adjusted myself on the side of my horse furthest from the enemy, and with only one foot holding to the cantle of the saddle, and an arm over the neck of the horse exposed, i started at full run it was only at street crossings that my horse was under fire but these i crossed at such a flying rate that generally i was passed and under cover of the next block of houses before the enemy fired i got out safely without a scratch at one place on my ride i saw a sentry walking in front of a house and stopped to inquire what he was doing there finding that the house was full of wounded american officers and soldiers i dismounted and went in i found there captain williams of the engineer corps wounded in the head probably fatally and lieutenant terrett also badly wounded his bowels protruding from his wound there were quite a number of soldiers also Promising them to report their situation, I left, readjusted myself to my horse, recommenced the run, and was soon with the troops at the east end. Before ammunition could be collected, the two regiments I had been with were seen returning, running the same gauntlet in getting out that they had passed in going in, but with comparatively little loss. The movement was countermanded, and the troops were withdrawn. The poor wounded officers and men I had found fell into the hands of the enemy during the night and died. While this was going on at the east, General Worth, with a small division of troops, was advancing towards the plaza from the opposite end of the city. He resorted to a better expedient for getting to the plaza, the citadel, than we did on the east instead of moving by the open streets he advanced through the houses cutting passageways from one to another without much loss of life he got so near the plaza during the night that before morning ampudia the mexican commander made overtures for the surrender of the city and garrison this stopped all further hostilities the terms of surrender were soon agreed upon the prisoners were paroled and permitted to take their horses and personal property with them my pity was aroused by the sight of the mexican garrison of monterey marching out of town as prisoners and no doubt the same feeling was experienced by most of our army who witnessed it many of the prisoners were cavalry armed with lances and mounted on miserable little half-starved horses that did not look as if they could carry their riders out of town the men looked in but little better condition i thought how little interest the men before me had in the results of the war and how little knowledge they had of what it was all about after the surrender of the garrison of monterey a quiet camp life was led until midwinter as had been the case on the rio grande 
the people who remained at their homes fraternized with the yankees in the pleasantest manner in fact under the humane policy of our commander i question whether the great majority of the mexican people did not regret our departure as much as they had regretted our coming property and person were thoroughly protected and a market was afforded for all the products of the country such as the people had never enjoyed before the educated and wealthy portion of the population here as elsewhere abandoned their homes and remained away from them as long as they were in the possession of the invaders but this class formed a very small percentage of the whole population End of section 8. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at jocclev.com. Section 9 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 9. Political Intrigue. Buena Vista. Movement Against Veracruz. Siege and Capture of Veracruz. The Mexican War was a political war and the administration conducting it desired to make party capital out of it general scott was at the head of the army and being a soldier of acknowledged professional capacity his claim to the command of the forces in the field was almost indisputable and does not seem to have been denied by president polk or marcy his secretary of war scott was a whig and the administration was democratic general scott was also known to have political aspirations and nothing so popularizes a candidate for high civil positions as military victories it would not do therefore to give him command of the army of conquest the plans submitted by scott for a campaign in mexico were disapproved by the administration and he replied in a tone possibly a little disrespectful to the effect that if a soldier's plans were not to be supported by the administration success could not be expected this was on the twenty seventh of may eighteen forty six four days later general scott was notified that he need not go to mexico general gaines was next in rank but he was too old and feeble to take the field colonel zachary taylor a brigadier general by brevet was therefore left in command he too was a whig but was not supposed to entertain any political ambitions nor did he but after the fall of monterey his third battle and third complete victory the whig papers at home began to speak of him as the candidate of their party for the presidency something had to be done to neutralize his growing popularity he could not be relieved from duty in the field where all his battles had been victories the design would have been too transparent it was finally decided to send general scott to mexico in chief command and to authorize him to carry out his own original plan that is capture vera cruz and march upon the capital of the country it was no doubt supposed that scott's ambition would lead him to slaughter taylor or destroy his chances for the presidency and yet it was hoped that he would not make sufficient capital himself to secure the prize the administration had indeed a most embarrassing problem to solve 
it was engaged in a war of conquest which must be carried to a successful issue or the political object would be unattained yet all the capable officers of the requisite rank belonged to the opposition and the man selected for his lack of political ambition had himself become a prominent candidate for the presidency it was necessary to destroy his chances promptly the problem was to do this without the loss of conquest and without permitting another general of the same political party to acquire like popularity the fact is the administration of mr polk made every preparation to disgrace scott or to speak more correctly to drive him to such desperation that he would disgrace himself general scott had opposed conquest by the way of the rio grande matamoros and saltillo from the first now that he was in command of all of the forces in mexico he withdrew from taylor most of his regular troops and left him only enough volunteers as he thought to hold the line then in possession of the invading army indeed scott did not deem it important to hold anything beyond the rio grande and authorized taylor to fall back to that line if he chose general taylor protested against the depletion of his army and his subsequent movement upon buena vista would indicate that he did not share the views of his chief in regard to the unimportance of conquest beyond the rio grande scott had estimated the men and material that would be required to capture vera cruz and to march on the capital of the country two hundred and sixty miles in the interior he was promised all he asked and seemed to have not only the confidence of the president but his sincere good wishes the promises were all broken only about half the troops were furnished that had been pledged other war material was withheld and scott had scarcely started for mexico before the president undertook to supersede him by the appointment of senator thomas h benton as lieutenant-general this being refused by congress the president asked legislative authority to place a junior over a senior of the same grade with the view of appointing benton to the rank of major-general and then placing him in command of the army but congress failed to accede to this proposition as well and scott remained in command but every general appointed to serve under him was politically opposed to the chief and several were personally hostile general scott reached brazo santiago or point isabel at the mouth of the rio grande late in december eighteen forty six and proceeded at once up the river to camargo where he had written general taylor to meet him taylor however had gone to or towards tampico for the purpose of establishing a post there he had started on this march before he was aware of general scott being in the country under these circumstances scott had to issue his orders designating the troops to be withdrawn from taylor without the personal consultation he had expected to hold with his subordinate general taylor's victory at buena vista february twenty second twenty third and twenty fourth eighteen forty seven with an army composed almost entirely of volunteers who had not been in battle before and over a vastly superior force numerically made his nomination for the presidency by the whigs a foregone conclusion he was nominated and elected in eighteen forty eight i believe that he sincerely regretted this turn in his fortunes preferring the peace afforded by a quiet life free from abuse to the honor of filling the highest office 
in the gift of any people the presidency of the united states when general scott assumed command of the army of invasion i was in the division of general david twiggs in taylor's command but under the new orders my regiment was transferred to the division of general william worth in which i served to the close of the war the troops withdrawn from taylor to form part of the forces to operate against vera cruz were assembled at the mouth of the rio grande preparatory to embarkation for their destination i found general worth a different man from any i had before served directly under he was nervous impatient and restless on the march or when important or responsible duty confronted him there was not the least reason for haste on the march for it was known that it would take weeks to assemble shipping enough at the point of our embarkation to carry the army but general worth moved his division with a rapidity that would have been commendable had he been going to the relief of a beleaguered garrison the length of the marches was regulated by the distance between places affording a supply of water for the troops and these distances were sometimes long and sometimes short general worth on one occasion at least after having made the full distance intended for the day and after the troops were in camp and preparing their food ordered tents struck and made the march that night which had been intended for the next day some commanders can move troops so as to get the maximum distance out of them without fatigue while others can wear them out in a few days without accomplishing so much general worth belonged to this latter class he enjoyed however a fine reputation for his fighting qualities and thus attached his officers and men to him the army lay in camp upon the sand beach in the neighborhood of the mouth of the rio grande for several weeks awaiting the arrival of transports to carry it to its new field of operations the transports were all sailing vessels the passage was a tedious one and many of the troops were on shipboard over thirty days from the embarkation at the mouth of the rio grande to the time of debarkation south of vera cruz the trip was a comfortless one for officers and men the transports used were built for carrying freight and possessed but limited accommodations for passengers and the climate added to the discomfort of all the transports with troops were assembled in the harbor of anton lazardo some sixteen miles south of vera cruz as they arrived and there awaited the remainder of the fleet bringing artillery ammunition and supplies of all kinds from the north with the fleet there was a little steam propeller dispatch boat the first vessel of the kind i had ever seen and probably the first of its kind ever seen by any one then with the army at that day ocean steamers were rare and what there were were side wheelers this little vessel going through the fleet so fast so noiselessly and with its propeller under water out of view attracted a great deal of attention i recollect that lieutenant sidney smith of the fourth infantry by whom i happened to be standing on the deck of a vessel when this propeller was passing exclaimed why the thing looks as if it was propelled by the forces of circumstances finally on the seventh of march eighteen forty seven the little army of ten or twelve thousand men given scott to invade a country with a population of seven or eight million a mountainous country affording the greatest possible natural advantages for defense 
was all assembled and ready to commence the perilous task of landing from vessels lying in the open sea the debarkation took place inside of the little island of sacrificio some three miles south of vera cruz the vessels could not get anywhere near shore so that everything had to be landed in lighters or surf boats general scott had provided these before leaving the north the breakers were sometimes high so that the landing was tedious the men were got ashore rapidly because they could wade when they came to shallow water but the camp and garrison equipage provisions ammunition and all stores had to be protected from the salt water and therefore their landing took several days the mexicans were very kind to us however and threw no obstacles in the way of our landing except an occasional shot from their nearest fort during the debarkation one shot took off the head of major albertus no other i believe reached anywhere near the same distance on the ninth of march the troops were landed and the investment of vera cruz from the gulf of mexico south of the city to the gulf again on the north was soon and easily effected the landing of stores was continued until everything was got ashore vera cruz at the time of which i write and up to eighteen eighty was a walled city the wall extended from the water's edge south of the town to the water again on the north there were fortifications at intervals along the line and at the angles in front of the city and on an island half a mile out in the gulf stands san juan de ulua an enclosed fortification of large dimensions and great strength for that period against artillery of the present day the land forts and walls would prove elements of weakness rather than strength after the invading army had established their camps out of range of the fire from the city batteries were established under cover of night far to the front of the line where the troops lay these batteries were entrenched and the approaches sufficiently protected if a sortie had been made at any time by the mexicans the men serving the batteries could have been quickly reinforced without great exposure to the fire from the enemy's main line no serious attempt was made to capture the batteries or to drive our troops away the siege continued with brisk firing on our side till the twenty seventh of march by which time a considerable breach had been made in the wall surrounding the city upon this general morales who was governor of both the city and of san juan de ulua commenced a correspondence with general scott looking to the surrender of the town forts and garrison on the twenty ninth vera cruz and san juan de ulua were occupied by scott's army about five thousand prisoners and four hundred pieces of artillery besides large amounts of small arms and ammunition fell into the hands of the victorious force the casualties on our side during the siege amounted to sixty-four officers and men killed and wounded end of section nine recording by jim clevenger little rock arkansas jim at j o c c l e v dot com section ten of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. 
Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant, Chapter 10. March to Jalapa, Battle of Cerro Gordo, Perote, Puebla, Scott and Taylor. General Scott had less than 12,000 men at Veracruz. He had been promised by the administration a very much larger force, or claimed that he had, and he was a man of veracity. 12,000 was a very small army with which to penetrate 260 miles into an enemy's country and to besiege the capital, a city at that time of largely over 100,000 inhabitants. Then, too, any line of march that could be selected led through mountain passes easily defended. In fact, there were at that time but two roads from Vera Cruz to the city of Mexico that could be taken by an army, one by Jalapa and Perote, the other by Cordoba and Arizaba, the two coming together on the great plain which extends to the city of Mexico after the range of mountains is passed. It was very important to get the army away from Vera Cruz as soon as possible in order to avoid the yellow fever or vomito which usually visits that city early in the year and is very fatal to persons not acclimated but transportation which was expected from the north was arriving very slowly it was absolutely necessary to have enough to supply the army to Jalapa sixty-five miles in the interior and above the fevers of the coast at that point the country is fertile and an army of the size of general scott's could subsist there for an indefinite period not counting the sick the weak and the garrisons for the captured city and fort the moving column was now less than ten thousand strong this force was composed of three divisions under general twiggs patterson and worth the importance of escaping the vomito was so great that as soon as transportation enough could be got together to move a division the advance was commenced on the eighth of april twiggs's division started for jalopa he was followed very soon by patterson with his division General Worth was to bring up the rear with his command as soon as transportation enough was assembled to carry six days' rations for his troops, with the necessary ammunition and camp and garrison equipage. It was the 13th of April before this division left Veracruz. The leading division ran against the enemy at Cerro Gordo, some fifty miles west on the road to Jalapa, and went into camp at Plan del Rio, about three miles from the fortification. General Patterson reached Plan del Rio with his division soon after Twiggs arrived. The two were then secure against an attack from Santa Anna, who commanded the Mexican forces. At all events, they confronted the enemy without reinforcements and without molestation until the 18th of April. General Scott had remained at Veracruz to hasten preparations for the field, but on the 12th, learning the situation at the front, he hastened on to take personal supervision. He at once commenced his preparation for the capture of the position held by Santa Anna and of the troops holding it. Cerro Gordo is one of the higher spurs of the mountains, some twelve to fifteen miles east of Jalapa, and Santa Anna had selected this point as the easiest to defend against an invading army. The road, said to have been built by Cortez, zigzags around the mountainside and was defended at every turn by artillery on either side were deep chasms or mountain walls a direct attack along the road was an impossibility a flank movement seemed equally impossible after the arrival of the commanding general upon the scene reconnaissance 
were sent out to find or to make a road by which the rear of the enemy's works might be reached without a front attack. These reconnaissances were made under the supervision of Captain Robert E. Lee, assisted by Lieutenants P. G. T. Beauregard, Isaac I. Stevens, Z. B. Tower, G. W. Smith, George B. McClellan, and J. G. Foster of the Corps of Engineers, all officers who attained rank and fame on one side or the other in the great conflict for the preservation of the unity of the nation. The reconnaissance was completed, and the labor of cutting out and making roads by the flank of the enemy was effected by the 17th of the month. This was accomplished without the knowledge of Santa Anna or his army, and over ground where he supposed it impossible. On the same day, General Scott issued his order for the attack on the 18th. The attack was made as ordered, and perhaps there was not a battle of the Mexican War, or of any other, where orders issued before an engagement were nearer being a correct report of what afterwards took place. Under the supervision of the engineers, roadways had been opened over chasms to the right, where the walls were so steep that men could barely climb them. Animals could not. These had been opened under cover of night, without attracting the notice of the enemy. The engineers who had directed the opening led the way and the troops followed. Artillery was let down the steep slopes by hand. The men engaged attaching a strong rope to the rear axle and letting the guns down, a piece at a time, while the men at the ropes kept their ground on top, paying out gradually, while a few at the front directed the course of the piece. In like manner, the guns were drawn by hand up the opposite slope. In this way, Scott's troops reached their assigned position in rear of most of the entrenchments of the enemy unobserved. The attack was made. The Mexican reserves behind the works beat a hasty retreat, and those occupying them surrendered. On the left, General Pillow's command made a formidable demonstration which doubtless held a part of the enemy in his front and contributed to the victory. I am not pretending to give full details of all the battles fought, but of the portion that I saw. There were troops engaged on both sides at other points in which both sustained losses, but the battle was won as here narrated. The surprise of the enemy was complete, the victory overwhelming. Some three thousand prisoners fell into Scott's hands, also a large amount of ordnance and ordnance stores. The prisoners were paroled, the artillery parked, and the small arms and ammunition destroyed. The Battle of Buena Vista was probably very important to the success of General Scott at Cerro Gordo, and in his entire campaign from Vera Cruz to the Great Plains reaching to the city of Mexico. The only army, Santa Ana, had to protect his capital and the mountain passes west of Vera Cruz was the one he had with him confronting General Taylor. It is not likely that he would have gone as far north as Monterey to attack the United States troops when he knew his country was threatened with invasion further south. When Taylor moved to Saltillo, and then advanced on to Buena Vista, Santa Anna crossed the desert confronting the invading army, hoping, no doubt, to crush it and get back in time to meet General Scott in the mountain passes west of Veracruz. His attack on Taylor was disastrous to the Mexican army, but notwithstanding this, 
he marched his army to Cerro Gordo, a distance not much short of one thousand miles by the line he had to travel, in time to entrench himself well before Scott got there. If he had been successful at Buena Vista, his troops would, no doubt, have made a more stubborn resistance at Cerro Gordo. Had the Battle of Buena Vista not been fought, Santa Anna would have had time to move leisurely to meet the invader further south and with an army not demoralized nor depleted by defeat. After the battle, the victorious army moved on to Jalapa, where it was in a beautiful, productive, and healthy country far above the fevers of the coast. Jalapa, however, is still in the mountains, and between there and the great plain the whole line of the road is easy of defense. It was important, therefore, to get possession of the great highway between the sea coast and the capital up to the point where it leaves the mountains before the enemy could have time to reorganize and fortify in our front. Worth's division was selected to go forward to secure this result. The division marched to Perotti on the great plain not far from where the road debouches from the mountains. There is a low, strong fort on the plain in front of the town known as the Castle of Perotti. This, however, offered no resistance and fell into our hands with its armament. General Scott, having now only nine or ten thousand men west of Veracruz, and the time of some four thousand of them being about to expire, a long delay was the consequence. The troops were in a healthy climate, and where they could subsist for an indefinite period even if their line back to Vera Cruz should be cut off. It being ascertained that the men whose time would expire before the city of Mexico could possibly fall into the hands of the American army, would not remain beyond the term for which they had volunteered, the commanding general determined to discharge them at once, for a delay until the expiration of their time would have compelled them to pass through Veracruz during the season of the Vomito. This reduced Scott's force in the field to about 5,000 men. Early in May, Worth, with his division, left Perote and marched on to Puebla. The roads were wide and the country open except through one pass in a spur of mountains coming up from the south, through which the road runs. Notwithstanding this, the small column was divided into two bodies moving a day apart. Nothing occurred on the march of special note except that, while lying at the town of Amazoque, an easy day's march east of Puebla, a body of the enemy's cavalry, two or three thousand strong, was seen to our right, not more than a mile away. A battery or two, with two or three infantry regiments, was sent against them, and they soon disappeared. On the 15th of May we entered the city of Puebla. General Worth was in command at Puebla until the latter end of May when General Scott arrived. Here, as well as on the march up, his restlessness, particularly under responsibilities, showed itself. During his brief command, he had the enemy hovering around near the city in vastly superior numbers to his own. The brigade to which I was attached changed quarters three different times in about a week, occupying at first quarters near the plaza in the heart of the city, then at the western entrance, then at the extreme east. On one occasion General Worth had the troops in line, under arms, all day, with three days cooked rations in their haversacks. He galloped from one command to another, proclaiming the near proximity of Santa Anna with an army vastly superior to his own. General Scott 
arrived upon the scene the latter part of the month, and nothing more was heard of Santa Anna and his myriads. There were, of course, bodies of mounted Mexicans hovering around to watch our movements, and to pick up stragglers or small bodies of troops if they ventured too far out. These always withdrew on the approach of any considerable number of our soldiers. After the arrival of General Scott, I was sent, as quartermaster, with a large train of wagons back two days' march at least, to procure forage. We had less than a thousand men as escorts, and never thought of danger. We procured full loads for our entire train at two plantations which could easily have furnished us much more. There had been a great delay in obtaining the authority of Congress for the raising of the troops asked for by the administration. A bill was before the National Legislature from early in the session of 1846-1847 authorizing the creation of ten additional regiments for the war to be attached to the regular army but it was the middle of february before it became a law appointments of commissioned officers had then to be made men had to be enlisted the regiments equipped and the whole transported to mexico it was august before general scott received reinforcement sufficient to warrant an advance his moving column not even now more than ten thousand strong was in four divisions commanded by generals twig worth pillow and quitman there was also a cavalry corps under general harney composed of detachments of the first second and third dragoons the advance commenced on the seventh of august with twiggs's division in front the remaining three divisions followed with an interval of a day between the marches were short to make concentration easier in case of attack i had now been in battle with the two leading commanders conducting armies in a foreign land the contrast between the two was very marked general taylor never wore uniform but dressed himself entirely for comfort. He moved about the field in which he was operating to see through his own eyes the situation. Often he would be without staff officers, and when he was accompanied by them there was no prescribed order in which they followed. He was very much given to sit his horse sideways, with both feet on one side particularly on the battlefield. General Scott was the reverse in all these particulars. He always wore all the uniform prescribed or allowed by law when he inspected his lines. Word would be sent to all division and brigade commanders in advance, notifying them of the hour when the commanding general might be expected. This was done so that all the army might be under arms to salute their chief as he passed. On these occasions he wore his dress uniform, cocked hat, aiguillettes, saber, and spurs. His staff proper, besides all officers constructively on his staff, engineers, inspectors, quartermasters, etc., that could be spared followed, also in uniform and in prescribed order orders were prepared with great care and evidently with the view that they should be a history of what followed in their modes of expressing thought these two generals contrasted quite as strongly as in their other characteristics general scott was precise in language cultivated a style peculiarly his own was proud of his rhetoric, not averse to speaking of himself, often in the third person, and he could bestow praise upon the person he was talking about without the least embarrassment. Taylor was not a conversationalist, but on paper he could put his meaning so plainly 
that there could be no mistaking it. He knew how to express what he wanted to say in the fewest well-chosen words, but would not sacrifice meaning to the construction of high-sounding sentences. But with their opposite characteristics, both were great and successful soldiers. Both were true, patriotic, and upright in all their dealings. Both were pleasant to serve under. Taylor was pleasant to serve with. Scott saw more through the eyes of his staff officers than through his own. His plans were deliberately prepared and fully expressed in orders. Taylor saw for himself and gave orders to meet the emergency without reference to how they would read in history. End of section 10. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at jocclev.com. Section 11 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 11. Advance on the City of Mexico. Battle of Contreras. Assault at Churubusco. Negotiations for peace. Battle of Molino del Rey. Storming of Chapultepec. San Cosme. Evacuation of the city. Halls of the Montezumas. The route followed by the army from Puebla to the city of Mexico was over Rio Frio Mountain, the road leading over which, at the highest point, is about 11,000 feet above tidewater. The pass through this mountain might have been easily defended, but it was not, and the advanced division reached the summit in three days after leaving Puebla. The city of Mexico lies west of Rio Frio Mountain, on a plain backed by another mountain six miles further west, with others still nearer on the north and south. Between the western base of Rio Frio and the city of Mexico, there are three lakes, Chalco and Xochimilco on the left, and Texcoco on the right, extending to the east end of the city of Mexico. Chalco and Texcoco are divided by a narrow strip of land over which the direct road to the city runs. So Chimilco is also to the left of the road, but at a considerable distance south of it, and is connected with Lake Chalco by a narrow channel. There is a high rocky mound, called El Penon, on the right of the road, springing up from the low flat ground dividing the lakes. This mound was strengthened by entrenchments at its base and summit, and rendered a direct attack impracticable. Scott's army was rapidly concentrated about Ayatla and other points near the eastern end of Lake Chalco. Reconnaissances were made up to within gunshot of El Panon, while engineers were seeking a route by the south side of Lake Chalco to flank the city and come upon it from the south and southwest. A way was found around the lake, and by the 18th of August, troops were in St. Augustine Tlalpam, a town about 11 miles due south from the plaza of the capital. Between St. Augustine Tlalpam and the city lie the hacienda of San Antonio and the village of Churubusco, and southwest of them is Contreras. All these points, except St. Augustine Tlalpam, were entrenched and strongly garrisoned. Contreras is situated on the side of a mountain near its base, where volcanic rocks are piled in great confusion reaching nearly to San Antonio. This made the approach to the city from the south very difficult. The brigade to which I was attached, Garland's, of Worth's division, 
was sent to confront San Antonio, two or three miles from St. Augustine to Lalpam, on the road to Churubusco and the city of Mexico. The ground on which San Antonio stands is completely in the valley, and the surface of the land is only a little above the level of the lakes, and, except to the southwest, it was cut up by deep ditches filled with water. To the southwest is the Pedregal, the volcanic rock before spoken of, over which cavalry or artillery could not be passed, and infantry would make but poor progress if confronted by an enemy. From the position occupied by Garland's brigade, therefore, no movement could be made against the defenses of San Antonio except to the front and by a narrow causeway over perfectly level ground every inch of which was commanded by the enemy's artillery and infantry if contreras some three miles west and south should fall into our hands troops from there could move to the right flank of all the positions held by the enemy between us and the city under these circumstances General Scott directed the holding of the front of the enemy without making an attack until further orders. On the 18th of August, the day of reaching San Augustine to Lalpam, Garland's brigade secured a position within easy range of the advanced entrenchments of San Antonio, but where his troops were protected by an artificial embankment that had been thrown up for some other purpose than defense. General Scott at once set his engineers reconnoitering the works about Contreras, and on the 19th movements were commenced to get troops into position from which an assault could be made upon the force occupying that place. The Pedregal on the north and northeast, and the mountain on the south, made the passage by either flank of the enemy's defenses difficult, for their work stood exactly between those natural bulwarks. But a road was completed during the day and night of the 19th, and troops were got to the north and west of the enemy. This affair, like that of Cerro Gordo, was an engagement in which the officers of the Engineer Corps won special distinction. In fact, in both cases, tasks which seemed difficult at first sight were made easier for the troops that had to execute them than they would have been on an ordinary field. The very strength of each of these positions was, by the skill of the engineers, converted into a defense for the assaulting parties while securing their positions for final attack. All the troops with General Scott in the Valley of Mexico, except a part of the division of General Quitman at San Augustine Tlalpam, and the brigade of Garland, Worth's division, at San Antonio, were engaged at the Battle of Contreras, or were on their way, in obedience to the orders of their chief to reinforce those who were engaged. The assault was made on the morning of the 20th, and in less than half an hour from the sound of the advance, the position was in our hands, with many prisoners and large quantities of ordnance and other stores. The brigade, commanded by General Riley, was, from its position, the most conspicuous in the final assault. But all did well, volunteers and regulars. From the point occupied by Garland's brigade, we could see the progress made at Contreras and the movement of troops toward the flank and rear of the enemy opposing us. The Mexicans, all the way back to the city, could see the same thing, and their conduct showed plainly that they did not enjoy the sight. We moved out at once and found them gone from our immediate front. Clark's brigade of Worth's division now moved west over the point of the Pedregal, and after having passed to the north sufficiently to clear San Antonio, turned east and got on the causeway leading to 
Churubusco and the City of Mexico. When he approached Churubusco, his left, under Colonel Hoffman, attacked a Teta Point at that place and brought on an engagement. About an hour after, Garland was ordered to advance directly along the causeway and got up in time to take part in the engagement. San Antonio was found evacuated, the evacuation having probably taken place immediately upon the enemy seeing the stars and stripes waving over Contreras. The troops that had been engaged at Contreras, and even then on their way to that battlefield, were moved by a causeway west of and parallel to the one by way of San Antonio and Churubusco. It was expected by the commanding general that these troops would move north sufficiently far to flank the enemy out of his position at Churubusco, before turning east to reach the San Antonio road, but they did not succeed in this, and Churubusco proved to be about the severest battle fought in the Valley of Mexico. General Scott, coming upon the battlefield about this juncture, ordered two brigades under shields to move north and turn the right of the enemy. This shields did, but not without hard fighting and heavy loss. The enemy finally gave way, leaving in our hands prisoners, artillery, and small arms. The balance of the causeway held by the enemy up to the very gates of the city fell in like manner. I recollect at this place that some of the gunners who had stood their ground were deserters from General Taylor's army on the Rio Grande. Both the strategy and tactics displayed by General Scott in these various engagements of the 20th of August, 1847, were faultless as I look upon them now after the lapse of so many years. As before stated, the work of the engineer officers who made the reconnaissances and led the different commands to their destinations was so perfect that the chief was able to give his orders to his various subordinates with all the precision he could use on an ordinary march, I mean up to the point from which the attack was to commence. After that point is reached, the enemy often induces a change of orders not before contemplated. The enemy, outside the city, outnumbered our soldiery quite three to one, but they had become so demoralized by the succession of defeats this day that the city of Mexico could have been entered without much further bloodshed. In fact, Captain Philip Kearney, afterwards a general in the War of the Rebellion, rode with a squadron of cavalry to the very gates of the city, and would no doubt have entered with his little force only. At that point he was badly wounded, as were several of his officers. He had not heard the call for a halt. General Franklin Pierce had joined the army in Mexico at Puebla, a short time before the advance upon the capital commenced. He had, consequently, not been in any of the engagements of the war up to the Battle of Contreras. By an unfortunate fall of his horse, on the afternoon of the 19th, he was painfully injured. The next day, when his brigade, with the other troops engaged on the same field, was ordered against the flank and rear of the enemy guarding the different points of the road from San Augustine to Lalpam to the city, General Pierce attempted to accompany them. He was not sufficiently recovered to do so, and fainted. This circumstance gave rise to exceedingly unfair and unjust criticism of him when he became a candidate for the presidency. Whatever General Pierce's qualifications may have been for the presidency, he was a gentleman, and a man of courage. 
I was not a supporter of him politically, but I knew him more intimately than I did any other of the volunteer generals. General Scott abstained from entering the city at this time because Mr. Nicholas P. Trist, the commissioner on the part of the United States to negotiate a treaty of peace with Mexico, was with the army and either he or General Scott thought, probably both of them, that a treaty would be more possible while the Mexican government was in possession of the capital than if it was scattered and the capital in the hands of an invader. Be this as it may, we did not enter at that time. The army took up positions along the slopes of the mountains south of the city, as far west as Tacubaya. Negotiations were at once entered into with Santa Anna, who was then practically the government, and the immediate commander of all the troops engaged in defense of the country. A truce was signed, which denied to either party the right to strengthen its position or to receive reinforcements during the continuance of the armistice, but authorized General Scott to draw supplies for his army from the city in the meantime. Negotiations were commenced at once, and were kept up vigorously between Mr. Trist and the commissioners appointed on the part of Mexico until the 2nd of September. At that time Mr. Trist handed in his ultimatum. Texas was to be given up absolutely by Mexico, and New Mexico and California ceded to the United States for a stipulated sum to be afterwards determined. I do not suppose Mr. Trist had any discretion whatever in regard to boundaries. The war was one of conquest, in the interest of an institution, and the probabilities are that private instructions were for the acquisition of territory out of which new states might be carved. At all events, the Mexicans felt so outraged at the terms proposed that they commenced preparations for defense, without giving notice of the termination of the armistice. The terms of the truce had been violated before, when teams had been sent into the city to bring out supplies for the army. The first train entering the city was very severely threatened by a mob. This, however, was apologized for by the authorities and all responsibility for it denied, and thereafter, to avoid exciting the Mexican people and soldiery, our teams, with their escorts, were sent in at night, when the troops were in barracks and the citizens in bed. The circumstance was overlooked, and negotiations continued. As soon as the news reached General Scott of the second violation of the armistice, about the 4th of September, he wrote a vigorous note to President Santa Anna, calling his attention to it, and, receiving an unsatisfactory reply, declared the armistice at an end. General Scott, with Worth's division, was now occupying Tacubaya, a village some four miles southwest of the city of Mexico, and extending from the base up the mountainside for the distance of half a mile. More than a mile west, and also a little above the plain, stands Molino del Rey. The mill is a long stone structure, one story high and several hundred feet in length. At the period of which I speak, General Scott supposed a portion of the mill to be used as a foundry for the casting of guns. This, however, proved to be a mistake. It was valuable to the Mexicans because of the quantity of grain it contained. The building is flat-roofed, and a line of sandbags over the outer walls rendered the top quite a formidable defense for infantry. Chapultepec is a mound springing up from the plain to the height of probably three hundred feet, and almost in a direct line between Molino del Rey and the western part of the city. It was fortified both on the top 
and on the rocky and precipitous sides the city of mexico is supplied with water by two aqueducts resting on strong stone arches one of these aqueducts draws its supply of water from a mountain stream coming into it at or near molino del rey and runs north close to the west base of chapultepec thence along the center of a wide road until it reaches the road running east into the city by the garita san cosme from which point the aqueduct and road both run east to the city the second aqueduct starts from the east base of chapultepec where it is fed by a spring and runs northeast to the city this aqueduct like the other runs in the middle of a broad roadway thus leaving a space on each side the arches supporting the aqueduct afforded protection for advancing troops as well as to those engaged defensively at points on the san cosme road parapets were thrown across with an embrasure for a single piece of artillery in each at the point where both road and aqueduct turn at right angles from north to east there was not only one of these parapets supplied by one gun and infantry supports but the houses to the north of the san cosme road facing south and commanding a view of the road back to chapultepec were covered with infantry protected by parapets made of sandbags the roads leading to garitas the gates san cosme and balian by which these aqueducts enter the city were strongly entrenched deep wide ditches filled with water lined the sides of both roads such were the defenses of the city of mexico in september eighteen forty seven on the routes over which general scott entered prior to the mexican war general scott had been very partial to general worth indeed he continued so up to the close of hostilities but for some reason worth had become estranged from his chief scott evidently took this coldness somewhat to heart he did not retaliate however but on the contrary showed every disposition to appease his subordinate it was understood at the time that he gave worth authority to plan and execute the battle of molino del rey without dictation or interference from any one for the very purpose of restoring their former relations the effort failed and the two generals remained ever after cold and indifferent towards each other if not actually hostile the battle of molino del rey was fought on the eighth of september the night of the seventh worth sent for his brigade and regimental commanders with their staffs to come to his quarters to receive instructions for the morrow these orders contemplated a movement up to within striking distance of the mills before daylight the engineers had reconnoitred the ground as well as possible and had acquired all the information necessary to base proper orders both for approach and attack by daylight on the morning of the eighth the troops to be engaged at molino were all at the places designated the ground in front of the mills to the south was commanded by the artillery from the summit of chapultepec as well as by the lighter batteries at hand but a charge was made and soon all was over worth's troops entered the mills by every door and the enemy beat a hasty retreat back to chapultepec had this victory been followed up promptly no doubt americans and mexicans would have gone over the defenses of chapultepec so near together that the place would have fallen into our hands without further loss the defenders of the works could not have fired upon us without endangering their own men this was not done and five days later more valuable lives were sacrificed to carry works which had been so nearly in our possession on the eighth 
I do not criticize the failure to capture Chapultepec at this time. The result that followed the first assault could not possibly have been foreseen, and to profit by the unexpected advantage, the commanding general must have been on the spot and given the necessary instructions at the moment, or the troops must have kept on without orders. It is always, however, in order to follow a retreating foe, unless stopped or otherwise directed. The loss on our side at Molino del Rey was severe for the numbers engaged. It was especially so among commissioned officers. I was with the earliest of the troops to enter the mills. In passing through to the north side, looking towards Chapultepec, I happened to notice that there were armed Mexicans still on top of the building, only a few feet from many of our men. Not seeing any stairway or ladder reaching to the top of the building, I took a few soldiers and had a cart that happened to be standing near, brought up and placing the shafts against the wall and chalking the wheels so that the cart could not back, use the shafts as a sort of ladder extending to within three or four feet of the top. By this I climbed to the roof of the building, followed by a few men, but found a private soldier had preceded me by some other way. There were still quite a number of Mexicans on the roof, among them a major and five or six officers of lower grades, who had not succeeded in getting away before our troops occupied the building. They still had their arms, while the soldier before mentioned was walking as sentry, guarding the prisoners he had surrounded all by himself. I halted the sentinel, received the swords from the commissioned officers, and proceeded, with the assistance of the soldiers now with me, to disable the muskets by striking them against the edge of the wall and throw them to the ground below. Molino del Rey was now captured, and the troops engaged, with the exception of an appropriate guard over the captured position and property, were marched back to their quarters in Tacubaya. The engagement did not last many minutes but the killed and wounded were numerous for the number of troops engaged. During the night of the 11th, batteries were established which could play upon the fortifications of Chapultepec. The bombardment commenced early on the morning of the 12th, but there was no further engagement during this day than that of the artillery. General Scott, assigned the capture of Chapultepec to General Pillow, but did not leave the details to his judgment. Two assaulting columns, 250 men each, composed of volunteers for the occasion, were formed. They were commanded by Captains Mackenzie and Casey, respectively. The assault was successful but bloody. In later years, if not at the time, the battles of Molino del Rey and Chapultepec have seemed to me to have been wholly unnecessary. When the assaults upon the Garitas of San Cosme and Balian were determined upon, the road running east to the former gate could have been reached easily without an engagement by moving along south of the mills until west of them sufficiently far to be out of range thence north to the road above mentioned or if desirable to keep the two attacking columns nearer together the troops could have been turned east so as to come on the aqueduct road out of range of the guns from chapultepec in like manner the troops designated to act against baling could have kept east of Chapultepec out of range and come on to the aqueduct also out of range of Chapultepec. Molino del Rey and Chapultepec would both have been necessarily evacuated if this course had been pursued, for they would have been turned. General Quitman, a volunteer from the state of Mississippi, who stood well with the army both as a soldier and as a man, 
commanded the column acting against Balin. General Worth commanded the column against San Cosme. When Chapultepec fell, the advance commenced along the two aqueduct roads. I was on the road to San Cosme, and witnessed most that took place on that route. When opposition was encountered, our troops sheltered themselves by keeping under the arches supporting the aqueduct, advancing an arch at a time. We encountered no serious obstruction until within gunshot of the point where the road we were on intersects that running east to the city, the point where the aqueduct turns at a right angle. I have described the defenses of this position before. There were but three commissioned officers besides myself that I can now call to mind with the advance when the above position was reached. One of these officers was a Lieutenant Sims of the Marine Corps. I think Captain Gore and Lieutenant Judah of the 4th Infantry were the others. Our progress was stopped for the time by the single piece of artillery at the angle of the roads and the infantry occupying the housetops back from it. West of the road from where we were stood a house occupying the southwest angle made by the San Cosme Road and the road we were moving upon. A stone wall ran from the house along each of these roads for a considerable distance and thence back until it joined, enclosing quite a yard about the house. I watched my opportunity and skipped across the road and behind the south wall. Proceeding cautiously to the west corner of the enclosure, I peeped around and, seeing nobody, continued still cautiously until the road running east and west was reached. I then returned to the troops and called for volunteers. All that were close to me, or that heard me, about a dozen, offered their services. Commanding them to carry their arms at a trail, I watched our opportunity and got them across the road and under cover of the wall beyond, before the enemy had a shot at us. Our men, under cover of the arches, kept a close watch on the entrenchments that crossed our path and the house tops beyond, and whenever a head showed itself above the parapets, they would fire at it. Our crossing was thus made practicable without loss. When we reached a safe position, I instructed my little command again to carry their arms at a trail, not to fire at the enemy until they were ordered, and to move very cautiously, following me, until the San Cosme road was reached. We would then be on the flank of the men serving the gun on the road, and with no obstruction between us and them. When we reached the southwest corner of the enclosure before described, I saw some United States troops pushing north through a shallow ditch nearby who had come up since my reconnaissance. This was the company of Captain Horace Brooks of the artillery acting as infantry. I explained to Brooks briefly what I had discovered and what I was about to do. He said, as I knew the ground and he did not, I might go on and he would follow. As soon as we got on the road leading to the city, the troops serving the gun on the parapet retreated, and those on the housetops nearby followed. Our men went after them in such close pursuit, the troops we had left under the arches joining, that a second line across the road, about halfway between the first and the garita, was carried. No reinforcements had yet come up except Brooks's company, and the position we had taken was too advanced to be held by so small a force. It was given up, but retaken later in the day with some loss. Worth's command gradually advanced to the front, now open to it. Later in the day, in reconnoitering, I found a church off to the south of the road, which looked to me as if the belfry would command the ground back of the Garita San Cosme. I got an officer of the Votichers with a mountain howitzer and men to work it to go with me. 
the road being in possession of the enemy we had to take the field to the south to reach the church this took us over several ditches breast deep in water and grown up with water plants these ditches however were not over eight or ten feet in width the howitzer was taken to pieces and carried by the men to its destination when i knocked for admission a priest came to the door who while extremely polite declined to admit us with the little spanish then at my command i explained to him that he might save property by opening the door and he certainly would save himself from becoming a prisoner for a time at least and besides i intended to go in whether he consented or not he began to see his duty in the same light that i did and opened the door though he did not look as if it gave him special pleasure to do so the gun was carried to the belfry and put together we were not more than two or three hundred yards from san cosme the shots from our little gun dropped in upon the enemy and created great confusion why they did not send out a small party and capture us i do not know we had no infantry or other defenses besides our one gun the effect of this gun upon the troops about the gate of the city was so marked that general worth saw it from his position he was so pleased that he sent a staff officer lieutenant pemberton later lieutenant general commanding the defenses of vicksburg to bring me to him he expressed his gratification at the services the howitzer in the church steeple was doing saying that every shot was effective and ordered a captain of votichers to report to me with another howitzer to be placed along with the one already rendering so much service i could not tell the general that there was not room enough in the steeple for another gun because he probably would have looked upon such a statement as a contradiction from a second lieutenant i took the captain with me but did not use his gun the night of the thirteenth of september was spent by the troops under general worth in the houses near san cosme and in line confronting the general line of the enemy across to Belen. the troops that i was with were in the houses north of the road leading into the city and were engaged during the night in cutting passageways from one house to another towards the town during the night santa anna with his army except the deserters left the city he liberated all the convicts confined in the town hoping no doubt that they would inflict upon us some injury before daylight but several hours after santa anna was out of the way the city authorities sent a delegation to general scott to ask if not demand an armistice respecting church property the rights of citizens and the supremacy of the city government in the management of municipal affairs general scott declined to trammel himself with conditions but gave assurances that those who chose to remain within our lines would be protected so long as they behaved themselves properly general quitman had advanced along his line very successfully on the thirteenth so that at night his command occupied nearly the same position at Balin that Worth's troops did about San Cosme. After the interview above related between General Scott and the city council, orders were issued for the cautious entry of both columns in the morning. The troops under Worth were to stop at the Alameda, a park near the west end of the city. Quitman was to go directly to the plaza and take possession of the palace a mass of buildings on the east side in which congress has its sessions the national courts are held the public offices are all located the president resides and much room is left for museums receptions etc this is the building generally designated as the halls of the Montezumas. End of section eleven. Recording by Jim Clevenger. 
Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Section 12 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 12. Promotion to First Lieutenant capture of the city of mexico the army mexican soldiers peace negotiations on entering the city the troops were fired upon by the released convicts and possibly by deserters and hostile citizens the streets were deserted and the place presented the appearance of a city of the dead except for this firing by unseen persons from housetops windows and around corners in this firing the lieutenant colonel of my regiment garland was badly wounded lieutenant sidney smith of the fourth infantry was also wounded mortally he died a few days after and by his death i was promoted to the grade of first lieutenant I had gone into the Battle of Palo Alto in May 1846, a second lieutenant, and I entered the city of Mexico sixteen months later with the same rank, after having been in all the engagements possible for any one man and in a regiment that lost more officers during the war than it ever had present at any one engagement my regiment lost four commissioned officers all senior to me by steamboat explosions during the mexican war the mexicans were not so discriminating they sometimes picked off my juniors general scott soon followed the troops into the city in state i wonder that he was not fired upon but i believe he was not at all events he was not hurt he took quarters at first in the halls of the Montezumas, and from there issued his wise and discreet orders for the government of a conquered city and for suppressing the hostile acts of liberated convicts already spoken of, orders which challenge the respect of all who study them. Lawlessness was soon suppressed, and the city of Mexico settled down into a quiet law-abiding place. The people began to make their appearance upon the streets without fear of the invaders. Shortly afterwards, the bulk of the troops were sent from the city to the villages at the foot of the mountains, four or five miles to the south and southwest. Whether General Scott approved of the Mexican War and the manner in which it was brought about, I have no means of knowing. His orders to troops indicate only a soldierly spirit, with probably a little regard for the perpetuation of his own fame. On the other hand, General Taylor's, I think, indicate that he considered the administration accountable for the war, and felt no responsibility resting on himself further than for the faithful performance of his duties both generals deserve the commendations of their countrymen and to live in the grateful memory of this people to the latest generation earlier in this narrative i have stated that the plain reached after passing the mountains east of perote extends to the cities of puebla and mexico the route traveled by the army before reaching Puebla goes over a pass in a spur of mountain coming up from the south. This pass is very susceptible of defense by a smaller against a larger force. Again, the highest point of the roadbed between Veracruz and the city of Mexico is over Rio Frio Mountain, which also might have been successfully defended by an inferior against a superior force but by moving north of the mountains and about thirty miles north of puebla 
both of these passes would have been avoided the road from perote to the city of mexico by this latter route is as level as the prairies in our west arriving due north from puebla troops could have been detached to take possession of that place and then proceeding west with the rest of the army no mountain would have been encountered before reaching the city of mexico it is true this road would have brought troops in by guadalupe a town church and detached spur of mountain about two miles north of the capital all bearing the same general name and at this point lake tezcoco comes near to the mountain which was fortified both at the base and on the sides but troops could have passed north of the mountain and come in only a few miles to the northwest and so flank the position as they actually did on the south it has always seemed to me that this northern route to the city of mexico would have been the better one to have taken but my later experience has taught me two lessons first that things are seen plainer after the events have occurred second that the most confident critics are generally those who know the least about the matter criticized i know just enough about the mexican war to approve heartily of most of the generalship but to differ with a little of it it is natural that an important city like puebla should not have been passed with contempt it may be natural that the direct road to it should have been taken but it could have been passed its evacuation ensured and possession acquired without danger of encountering the enemy in intricate mountain defiles in this same way the city of mexico could have been approached without any danger of opposition except in the open field but general scott's successes are an answer to all criticism he invaded a populous country penetrating two hundred and sixty miles into the interior with a force at no time equal to one-half of that opposed to him he was without a base the enemy was always entrenched always on the defensive yet he won every battle he captured the capital and conquered the government credit is due to the troops engaged it is true but the plans and the strategy were the generals i had now made marches and been in battle under both general scott and general taylor the former divided his force of ten thousand five hundred men into four columns starting a day apart in moving from puebla to the capital of the nation when it was known that an army more than twice as large as his own stood ready to resist his coming the road was broad and the country open except in crossing the rio frio mountain general taylor pursued the same course in marching toward an enemy he moved even in smaller bodies i never thought at the time to doubt the infallibility of these two generals in all matters pertaining to their profession i supposed they moved in small bodies because more men could not be passed over a single road on the same day with their artillery and necessary trains later i found the fallacy of this belief the rebellion which followed as a sequence to the mexican war never could have been suppressed if larger bodies of men could not have been moved at the same time than was the custom under scott and taylor the victories in mexico were in every instance over vastly superior numbers there were two reasons for this both general scott and general taylor had such armies as are not often got together at the battles of palo alto and resaca de la palma general taylor had a small army but it was composed exclusively of regular troops under the best of drill and discipline every officer from the highest to the lowest was educated in his profession not at west point necessarily but in the camp in garrison and many of them in indian wars the rank and file were probably inferior 
as material out of which to make an army to the volunteers that participated in all the later battles of the war but they were brave men and then drill and discipline brought out all there was in them a better army man for man probably never faced an enemy than the one commanded by general taylor in the earliest two engagements of the mexican war the volunteers who followed were of better material but without drill or discipline at the start they were associated with so many disciplined men and professionally educated officers that when they went into engagements it was with a confidence they would not have felt otherwise they became soldiers themselves almost at once all these conditions we would enjoy again in case of war the mexican army of that day was hardly an organization the private soldier was picked up from the lower class of the inhabitants when wanted his consent was not asked he was poorly clothed worse fed and seldom paid he was turned adrift when no longer wanted the officers of the lower grades were but little superior to the men with all this i have seen as brave stands made by some of these men as i have ever seen made by soldiers now mexico has a standing army larger than that of the united states they have a military school modeled after west point their officers are educated and no doubt generally brave the mexican war of eighteen forty six eighteen forty eight would be an impossibility in this generation the mexicans have shown a patriotism which it would be well if we would imitate in part but with more regard to truth they celebrate the anniversaries of chapultepec and molino del rey as of very great victories the anniversaries are recognized as national holidays at these two battles while the united states troops were victorious it was at very great sacrifice of life compared with what the mexicans suffered the mexicans as on many other occasions stood up as well as any troops ever did the trouble seemed to be the lack of experience among the officers which led them after a certain time to simply quit without being particularly whipped but because they had fought enough their authorities of the present day grow enthusiastic over their theme when telling of these victories and speak with pride of the large sum of money they forced us to pay in the end with us now twenty years after the close of the most stupendous war ever known we have writers who profess devotion to the nation engaged in trying to prove that the union forces were not victorious particularly they say we were slashed around from donelson to vicksburg and to chattanooga and in the east from gettysburg to appomattox when the physical rebellion gave out from sheer exhaustion there is no difference in the amount of romance in the two stories i would not have the anniversaries of our victory celebrated nor those of our defeats made fast days and spent in humiliation and prayer but i would like to see truthful history written such history will do full credit to the courage endurance and soldierly ability of the american citizen no matter what section of the country he hailed from or in what ranks he fought the justice of the cause which in the end prevailed will i doubt not come to be acknowledged by every citizen of the land in time for the present and so long as there are living witnesses of the great war of sections there will be people who will not be consoled for the loss of a cause which they believed to be holy as time passes people even of the south will begin to wonder how it was possible that their ancestors ever fought for 
or justified institutions which acknowledge the right of property in man after the fall of the capital and the dispersal of the government of mexico it looked very much as if military occupation of the country for a long time might be necessary general scott at once began the preparation of orders regulations and laws in view of this contingency he contemplated making the country pay all the expenses of the occupation without the army becoming a perceptible burden upon the people his plan was to levy a direct tax upon the separate states and collect at the ports left open to trade a duty on all imports from the beginning of the war private property had not been taken either for the use of the army or of individuals without full compensation this policy was to be pursued there were not troops enough in the valley of mexico to occupy many points but now that there was no organized army of the enemy of any size reinforcements could be got from the rio grande and there were also new volunteers arriving from time to time all by way of vera cruz military possession was taken of cornavaca fifty miles south of the city of mexico of toluca nearly as far west and of pachuca a mining town of great importance some sixty miles to the northeast vera cruz jalapa orizaba and puebla were already in our possession meanwhile the mexican government had departed in the person of santa anna and it looked doubtful for a time whether the united states commissioner mr trist would find anybody to negotiate with a temporary government however was soon established at queretaro and trist began negotiations for a conclusion of the war before terms were finally agreed upon he was ordered back to washington but general scott prevailed upon him to remain as an arrangement had been so nearly reached and the administration must approve his acts if he succeeded in making such a treaty as had been contemplated in his instructions the treaty was finally signed the second of february eighteen forty eight and accepted by the government at washington it is that known as the treaty of guadalupe hidalgo and secured to the united states the rio grande as the boundary of texas and the whole territory then included in new mexico and upper california for the sum of fifteen million dollars soon after entering the city of mexico the opposition of generals pillow worth and colonel duncan to general scott became very marked scott claimed that they had demanded of the president his removal i do not know whether this is so or not but i do know of their unconcealed hostility to their chief at last he placed them in arrest and preferred charges against them of insubordination and disrespect this act brought on a crisis in the career of the general commanding he had asserted from the beginning that the administration was hostile to him that it had failed in its promises of men and war material that the president himself had shown duplicity if not treachery in the endeavor to procure the appointment of benton and the administration now gave open evidence of its enmity about the middle of february orders came convening a court of inquiry composed of brevet brigadier general towson and the paymaster general of the army brigadier general cushing and colonel belknap to inquire into the conduct of the accused and the accuser and shortly afterwards orders were received from washington relieving scott of the command of the army in the field and assigning major-general william o butler of kentucky to the place this order also released pillow worth and duncan from arrest if a change was to be made 
the selection of general butler was agreeable to every one concerned so far as i remember to have heard expressions on the subject there were many who regarded the treatment of general scott as harsh and unjust it is quite possible that the vanity of the general had led him to say and do things that afforded a plausible pretext to the administration for doing just what it did and what it had wanted to do from the start the court tried the accuser quite as much as the accused it was adjourned before completing its labors to meet in frederick maryland general scott left the country and never after had more than the nominal command of the army until early in eighteen sixty one he certainly was not sustained in his efforts to maintain discipline in high places the efforts to kill off politically the two successful generals made them both candidates for the presidency general taylor was nominated in eighteen forty eight and was elected four years later general scott received the nomination but was badly beaten and the party nominating him died with his defeat end of section twelve recording by jim clevenger little rock arkansas jim at j o c c l e v dot com Section 13 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 13. Treaty of Peace mexican bullfights regimental quartermaster trip to popocatapel trip to the caves of mexico the treaty of peace between the two countries was signed by the commissioners on each side early in february eighteen forty eight it took a considerable time for it to reach washington receive the approval of the administration and be finally ratified by the senate it was naturally supposed by the army that there would be no more fighting and officers and men were of course anxious to get home but knowing there must be delay they contended themselves as best they could every sunday there was a bullfight for the amusement of those who would pay their fifty cents i attended one of them just one not wishing to leave the country without having witnessed the national sport the sight to me was sickening i could not see how human beings could enjoy the sufferings of beasts and often of men as they seemed to do on these occasions at these sports there are usually from four to six bulls sacrificed the audience occupies seats around the ring in which the exhibition is given each seat but the foremost rising higher than the one in front so that every one can get a full view of the sport when all is ready a bull is turned into the ring three or four men come in mounted on the merest skeletons of horses blind or blindfolded and so weak that they could not make a sudden turn with their riders without danger of falling down the men are armed with spears having a point as sharp as a needle other men enter the arena on foot armed with red flags and explosives about the size of a musket cartridge to each of these explosives is fastened a barbed needle which serves the purpose of attaching them to the bull by running the needle into the skin before the animal is turned loose a lot of these explosives are attached to him the pain from the pricking of the skin by the needles is exasperating but when the explosions of the cartridges commence the animal becomes frantic as he makes a lunge towards one horseman another 
runs a spear into him he turns towards his last tormentor when a man on foot holds out a red flag the bull rushes for this and is allowed to take it on his horns the flag drops and covers the eyes of the animal so that he is at a loss what to do it is jerked from him and the torment is renewed when the animal is worked into an uncontrollable frenzy the horsemen withdraw and the matadors literally murderers enter armed with knives having blades twelve or eighteen inches long and sharp the trick is to dodge an attack from the animal and stab him to the heart as he passes if these efforts fail the bull is finally lassoed held fast and killed by driving a knife blade into the spinal column just back of the horns he is then dragged out by horses or mules another is led into the ring and the same performance is renewed on the occasion when i was present one of the bulls was not turned aside by the attacks in the rear the presentations of the red flag etc etc but kept right on and placing his horns under the flanks of a horse threw him and his rider to the ground with great force the horse was killed and the rider lay prostrate as if dead the bull was then lassoed and killed in the manner above described men came in and carried the dead man off in a litter when the slaughtered bull and horse were dragged out a fresh bull was turned into the ring conspicuous among the spectators was the man who had been carried out on the litter but a few minutes before he was only dead so far as that performance went but the corpse was so lively that it could not forego the chance of witnessing the discomfiture of some of his brethren who might not be so fortunate there was a feeling of disgust manifested by the audience to find that he had come to life again i confess that i felt sorry to see the cruelty to the bull and the horse i did not stay for the conclusion of the performance but while i did stay there was not a bull killed in the prescribed way bull fights are now prohibited in the federal district embracing a territory around the city of mexico somewhat larger than the district of columbia and they are not an institution in any part of the country during one of my recent visits to mexico bull fights were got up in my honor at puebla and at pachuca i was not notified in advance so as to be able to decline and thus prevent the performance but in both cases i civilly declined to attend another amusement of the people of mexico of that day and one which nearly all indulged in male and female old and young priest and layman was monte playing regular feast weeks were held every year at what was then known as st augustine tlalpam eleven miles out of town there were dealers to suit every class and condition of people in many of the booths clacos the copper coin of the country four of them making six and a quarter cents of our money were piled up in great quantities with some silver to accommodate the people who could not bet more than a few pennies at a time in other booths silver formed the bulk of the capital of the bank with a few doubloons to be changed if there should be a run of luck against the bank in some there was no coin except gold here the rich were said to bet away their entire estates in a single day all this is stopped now for myself i was kept somewhat busy during the winter of eighteen forty seven eighteen forty eight my regiment was stationed at Takabaya. i was regimental quartermaster and commissary general scott had been unable to get clothing for the troops from the north the men were becoming well they needed clothing 
material had to be purchased such as could be obtained and people employed to make it up into yankee uniforms a quartermaster in the city was designated to attend to this special duty but clothing was so much needed that it was seized as fast as made up a regiment was glad to get a dozen suits at a time i had to look after this matter for the fourth infantry then our regimental fund had run down and some of the musicians in the band had been without their extra pay for a number of months the regimental bands at that day were kept up partly by pay from the government and partly by pay from the regimental fund there was authority of law for enlisting a certain number of men as musicians so many could receive the pay of non-commissioned officers of the various grades and the remainder the pay of privates this would not secure a band leader nor good players on certain instruments in garrison there are various ways of keeping up a regimental fund sufficient to give extra pay to musicians establish libraries and tin pen alleys subscribe to magazines and furnish many extra comforts to the men the best device for supplying the fund is to issue bread to the soldiers instead of flour the ration used to be eighteen ounces per day of either flour or bread and one hundred pounds of flour will make one hundred and forty pounds of bread this saving was purchased by the commissary for the benefit of the fund in the emergency the fourth infantry was laboring under i rented a bakery in the city hired bakers mexicans bought fuel and whatever was necessary and i also got a contract from the chief commissary of the army for baking a large amount of hard bread in two months i made more money for the fund than my pay amounted to during the entire war while stationed at monterey i had relieved the post fund in the same way there however was no profit except in the saving of flour by converting it into bread in the spring of eighteen forty eight a party of officers obtained leave to visit popocatapel the highest volcano in america and to take an escort i went with the party many of whom afterwards occupied conspicuous positions before the country of those who went south and attained high rank there was lieutenant richard anderson who commanded a corps at spotsylvania captain sibley a major general and after the war for a number of years in the employ of the khedive of egypt captain george crittenden a rebel general s b buckner who surrendered fort donelson and mansfield lovell who commanded at new orleans before that city fell into the hands of the national troops of those who remained on our side there were captain andrew porter lieutenant c p stone and lieutenant z b tower there were quite a number of other officers whose names i cannot recollect at a little village uzomba near the base of popocatapel where we proposed to commence the ascent we procured guides and two pack mules with forage for our horses high up on the mountain there was a deserted house of one room called the vaqueria which had been occupied years before by men in charge of cattle ranging on the mountain the pasturage up there was very fine when we saw it and there were still some cattle descendants of the former domestic herd which had now become wild it was possible to go on horseback as far as the vaqueria though the road was somewhat hazardous in places sometimes it was very narrow with a yawning precipice on one side hundreds of feet down to a roaring mountain torrent below and almost perpendicular walls on the other side at one of these places one of our mules loaded with two sacks of barley 
one on each side, the two about as big as he was, struck his load against the mountain side and was precipitated to the bottom. The descent was steep, but not perpendicular. The mule rolled over and over until the bottom was reached, and we supposed, of course, the poor animal was dashed to pieces. What was our surprise, not long after we had gone into bivouac, to see the lost mule, cargo, and owner coming up the ascent? The load had protected the animal from serious injury, and his owner had gone after him and found a way back to the path leading up to the hut where we were to stay. The night at the Vaqueria was one of the most unpleasant I ever knew. It was very cold, and the rain fell in torrents. A little higher up, the rain ceased and snow began. The wind blew with great velocity. The log cabin we were in had lost the roof entirely on one side, and on the other it was hardly better than a sieve. There was little or no sleep that night. As soon as it was light the next morning, we started to make the ascent to the summit. The wind continued to blow with violence, and the weather was still cloudy, but there was neither rain nor snow. The clouds, however, concealed from our view the country below us, except at times a momentary glimpse could be got through a clear space between them. The wind carried the loose snow around the mountain sides in such volumes as to make it almost impossible to stand up against it. We labored on and on until it became evident that the top could not be reached before night, if at all, in such a storm, and we concluded to return. The descent was easy and rapid, though dangerous, until we got below the snow line. At the cabin we mounted our horses, and by night were at Uzumba. The fatigues of the day and the loss of sleep the night before drove us to bed early. Our beds consisted of a place on the dirt floor with a blanket under us. Soon all were asleep, but long before morning first one and then another of our party began to cry out with excruciating pain in the eyes not one escaped it by morning the eyes of half of the party were so swollen that they were entirely closed the others suffered pain equally the feeling was about what might be expected from the prick of a sharp needle at a white heat we remained in quarters until the afternoon bathing our eyes in cold water this relieved us very much and before night the pain had entirely left. The swelling, however, continued, and about half the party still had their eyes entirely closed. But we concluded to make a start back, those who could see a little leading the horses of those who could not see at all. We moved back to the village of Amica Amica, some six miles, and stopped again for the night. The next morning all were entirely well and free from pain. The weather was clear and Popocatapel stood out in all its beauty, the top looking as if not a mile away, and inviting us to return. About half the party were anxious to try the ascent again, and concluded to do so. The remainder, I was with the remainder, concluded that we had got all the pleasure there was to be had out of mountain climbing and that we would visit the great caves of mexico some ninety miles from where we then were on the road to acapulco the party that ascended the mountain the second time succeeded in reaching the crater at the top with but little of the labor they encountered in their first attempt three of them anderson stone and buckner wrote accounts of their journey which were published at the time i made no notes of this excursion and have read nothing about it since but it seems to me that i can see the whole of it as vividly as if it were but yesterday i have been back at amica amica and the village beyond twice in the last five years the scene had not changed materially from my recollection of it 
the party which i was with moved south down the valley to the town of quantala some forty miles from amica amica the latter stands on the plain at the foot of popocatapel at an elevation of about eight thousand feet above tidewater the slope down is gradual as the traveller moves south but one would not judge that in going to quantla descent enough had been made to occasion a material change in the climate and productions of the soil but such is the case in the morning we left a temperate climate where the cereals and fruits are those common to the united states we halted in the evening in a tropical climate where the orange and banana the coffee and the sugar cane were flourishing we had been travelling apparently on a plain all day but in the direction of the flow of water soon after the capture of the city of mexico an armistice had been agreed to designating the limits beyond which troops of the respective armies were not to go during its continuance our party knew nothing about these limits as we approached quantala bugles sounded the assembly and soldiers rushed from the guard house in the edge of the town towards us our party halted and i tied a white pocket handkerchief to a stick and using it as a flag of truce proceeded on to the town captain sibley and porter followed a few hundred yards behind i was detained at the guard house until a messenger could be dispatched to the quarters of the commanding general who authorized that i should be conducted to him i had been with the general but a few minutes when the two officers following announced themselves the mexican general reminded us that it was a violation of the truce for us to be there however as we had no special authority from our own commanding general and as we knew nothing about the terms of the truce we were permitted to occupy a vacant house outside the guard for the night with the promise of a guide to put us on the road to cornavaca the next morning cornavaca is a town west of guantla the country through which we passed between these two towns is tropical in climate and productions and rich in scenery at one point about halfway between the two places the road goes over a low pass in the mountains in which there is a very quaint old town the inhabitants of which at that day were nearly all full-blooded indians very few of them even spoke spanish the houses were built of stone and generally only one story high the streets were narrow and had probably been paved before cortez visited the country they had not been graded but the paving had been done on the natural surface we had with us one vehicle a cart which was probably the first wheeled vehicle that had ever passed through that town on a hill overlooking this town stands the tomb of an ancient king and it was understood that the inhabitants venerated this tomb very highly as well as the memory of the ruler who was supposed to be buried in it we ascended the mountain and surveyed the tomb but it showed no particular marks of architectural taste mechanical skill or advanced civilization the next day we went into cornavaca after a day's rest at cornavaca our party set out again on the journey to the great caves of mexico we had proceeded but a few miles when we were stopped as before by a guard and notified that the terms of the existing armistice did not permit us to go further in that direction upon convincing the guard that we were a mere party of pleasure seekers desirous of visiting the great natural curiosities of the country which we expected soon to leave we were conducted to a large hacienda nearby and directed to remain there until the commanding general of that department could be communicated with and his decision obtained as to whether we should be permitted to pursue our journey the guard promised to send a messenger at once 
and expected a reply by night at night there was no response from the commanding general but the captain of the guard was sure he would have a reply by morning again in the morning there was no reply the second evening the same thing happened and finally we learned that the guard had sent no message or messenger to the department commander we determined therefore to go on unless stopped by a force sufficient to compel obedience after a few hours travel we came to a town where a scene similar to the one at quantia occurred the commanding officer sent a guide to conduct our party around the village and to put us upon our road again this was the last interruption that night we rested at a large coffee plantation some eight miles from the cave we were on the way to visit it must have been a saturday night the peons had been paid off and spent part of the night in gambling away their scanty week's earnings their coin was principally copper and i do not believe there was a man among them who had received as much as twenty-five cents in money they were as much excited however as if they had been staking thousands i recollect one poor fellow who had lost his last tobacco pulled off his shirt and in the most excited manner put that up on the turn of a card monte was the game played the place out of doors near the window of the room occupied by the officers of our party the next morning we were at the mouth of the cave at an early hour provided with guides candles and rockets we explored to a distance of about three miles from the entrance and found a succession of chambers of great dimensions and of great beauty when lit up with our rockets stalactites and stalagmites of all sizes were discovered some of the former were many feet in diameter and extended from ceiling to floor some of the latter were but a few feet high from the floor but the formation is going on constantly and many centuries hence these stalagmites will extend to the ceiling and become complete columns the stalagmites were all a little concave and the cavities were filled with water the water percolates through the roof a drop at a time often the drops several minutes apart and more or less charged with mineral matter evaporation goes on slowly leaving the mineral behind this in time makes the immense columns many of them thousands of tons in weight which serve to support the roofs over the vast chambers i recollect that at one point in the cave one of these columns is of such huge proportions that there is only a narrow passage left on either side of it some of our party became satisfied with their explorations before we had reached the point to which the guides were accustomed to take explorers and started back without guides coming to the large column spoken of they followed it entirely around and commenced retracing their steps into the bowels of the mountain without being aware of the fact when the rest of us had completed our explorations we started out with our guides but had not gone far before we saw the torches of an approaching party we could not conceive who these could be for all of us had come in together and there were none but ourselves at the entrance when we started in very soon we found it was our friends it took them some time to conceive how they had got where they were they were sure they had kept straight on for the mouth of the cave and had gone about far enough to have reached it end of section thirteen recording by jim clevenger Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at jocclev.com. Section 14 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by jim clevenger personal memoirs of u s grant by ulysses s grant chapter fourteen return of the army marriage ordered to the pacific coast crossing the isthmus arrival at san francisco my experience in the mexican war was of great advantage to me afterwards besides the many practical lessons it taught the war brought nearly all the officers of the regular army together so as to make them personally acquainted it also brought them in contact with volunteers many of whom served in the war of the rebellion afterwards then in my particular case i had been at west point at about the right time to meet most of the graduates who were of a suitable age at the breaking out of the rebellion to be trusted with large commands graduating in eighteen forty three i was at the military academy from one to four years with all cadets who graduated between eighteen forty and eighteen forty six seven classes these classes embraced more than fifty officers who afterwards became generals on one side or the other in the rebellion many of them holding high commands all the older officers who became conspicuous in the rebellion i had also served with and known in mexico lee j e johnston a s johnston holmes hebert and a number of others on the confederate side mccall mansfield philip kearney and others on the national side the acquaintance thus formed was of immense service to me in the war of the rebellion i mean what i learned of the characters of those to whom i was afterward opposed i do not pretend to say that all movements or even many of them were made with special reference to the characteristics of the commander against whom they were directed but my appreciation of my enemies was certainly affected by this knowledge the natural disposition of most people is to clothe a commander of a large army whom they do not know with almost superhuman abilities a large part of the national army for instance and most of the press of the country clothed general lee with just such qualities but i had known him personally and knew that he was mortal and it was just as well that i felt this the treaty of peace was at last ratified and the evacuation of mexico by united states troops was ordered early in june the troops in the city of mexico began to move out many of them including the brigade to which i belonged were assembled at jalapa above the vomito to await the arrival of transports at vera cruz but with all this precaution my regiment and others were in camp on the sand beach in a july sun for about a week before embarking while the fever raged with great virulence in vera cruz not two miles away i can call to mind only one person an officer who died of the disease my regiment was sent to pascagoula mississippi to spend the summer as soon as it was settled in camp i obtained a leave of absence for four months and proceeded to st louis on the twenty second of august eighteen forty eight i was married to miss julia dent the lady of whom i have before spoken we visited my parents and relations in ohio and at the end of my leave proceeded to my post at sackett's harbor new york in april following i was ordered to detroit michigan where two years were spent with but few important incidents the present constitution of the state of michigan was ratified during this time 
by the terms of one of its provisions all citizens of the united states residing within the state at the time of the ratification became citizens of michigan also during my stay in detroit there was an election for city officers mr zachariah chandler was the candidate of the whigs for the office of mayor and was elected although the city was then reckoned democratic all the officers stationed there at the time who offered their votes were permitted to cast them i did not offer mine however as i did not wish to consider myself a citizen of michigan this was mr chandler's first entry into politics a career he followed ever after with great success and in which he died enjoying the friendship esteem and love of his countrymen in the spring of eighteen fifty one the garrison at detroit was transferred to sackett's harbor and in the following spring the entire fourth infantry was ordered to the pacific coast it was decided that mrs grant should visit my parents at first for a few months and then remain with her own family at their st louis home until an opportunity offered of sending for her in the month of april the regiment was assembled at governor's island new york harbor and on the fifth of july eight companies sailed for aspinwall we numbered a little over seven hundred persons including the families of officers and soldiers passage was secured for us on the old steamer ohio commanded at the time by captain schnick of the navy it had not been determined until a day or two before starting that the fourth infantry should go by the ohio consequently a complement of passengers had already been secured the addition of over seven hundred to this list crowded the steamer most uncomfortably especially for the tropics in july in eight days aspinwall was reached at that time the streets of the town were eight or ten inches under water and foot passengers passed from place to place on raised footwalks july is at the height of the wet season on the isthmus at intervals the rain would pour down in streams followed in not many minutes by a blazing tropical summer's sun these alternate changes from rain to sunshine were continuous in the afternoons i wondered how any person could live many months in aspinwall and wondered still more why any one tried in the summer of eighteen fifty two the panama railroad was completed only to the point where it now crosses the chagres river from there passengers were carried by boats to gorgona at which place they took mules for panama some twenty-five miles further those who travelled over the isthmus in those days will remember that boats on the chagres river were propelled by natives not inconveniently burdened with clothing these boats carried thirty to forty passengers each the crews consisted of six men to a boat armed with long poles there were planks wide enough for a man to walk on conveniently running along the sides of each boat from end to end the men would start from the bow place one end of their poles against the river bottom brace their shoulders against the other end and then walk to the stern as rapidly as they could in this way from a mile to a mile and a half an hour could be made against the current of the river i as regimental quartermaster had charge of the public property and had also to look after the transportation a contract had been entered into with the steamship company in new york for the transportation of the regiment to california including the isthmus transit a certain amount of baggage was allowed per man 
and saddle animals were to be furnished to commissioned officers and to all disabled persons the regiment with the exception of one company left as guards to the public property camp and garrison equipage principally and the soldiers with families took boats propelled as above described for gorgona from this place they marched to panama and were soon comfortably on the steamer anchored in the bay some three or four miles from the town i with one company of troops and all the soldiers with families all the tents mess chests and camp kittles was sent to cruces a town a few miles higher up the chagres river than gorgona there i found an impecunious american who had taken the contract to furnish transportation for the regiment at a stipulated price per hundred pounds for the freight and so much for each saddle animal but when we reached cruces there was not a mule either for pack or saddle in the place the contractor promised that the animals should be on hand in the morning in the morning he said that they were on the way from some imaginary place and would arrive in the course of the day this went on until i saw that he could not procure the animals at all at the price he had promised to furnish them for the unusual number of passengers that had come over on the steamer and the large amount of freight to pack had created an unprecedented demand for mules some of the passengers paid as high as forty dollars for the use of a mule to ride twenty-five miles when the mule would not have sold for ten dollars in that market at other times meanwhile the cholera had broken out and men were dying every hour to diminish the food for the disease i permitted the company detailed with me to proceed to panama the captain and the doctors accompanied the men and i was left alone with the sick and the soldiers who had families the regiment at panama was also affected with the disease but there were better accommodations for the well on the steamer and a hospital for those taken with the disease on an old hulk anchored a mile off there were also hospital tents on shore on the island of flamingo which stands in the bay i was about a week at cruces before transportation began to come in about one-third of the people with me died either at cruces or on the way to panama there was no agent of the transportation company at cruces to consult or to take the responsibility of procuring transportation at a price which would secure it i therefore myself dismissed the contractor and made a new contract with a native at more than double the original price thus we finally reached panama the steamer however could not proceed until the cholera abated and the regiment was detained still longer altogether on the isthmus and on the pacific side we were delayed six weeks about one-seventh of those who left new york harbor with the fourth infantry on the fifth of july now lie buried on the isthmus of panama or on flamingo island in panama bay one amusing circumstance occurred while we were lying at anchor in panama bay in the regiment there was a lieutenant slaughter who was very liable to seasickness it almost made him sick to see the wave of a tablecloth when the servants were spreading it soon after his graduation slaughter was ordered to california and took passage by a sailing vessel going around cape horn the vessel was seven months making the voyage and slaughter was sick every moment of the time never more so than while lying at anchor after reaching his place of destination 
On landing in California, he found orders, which had come by the isthmus, notifying him of a mistake in his assignment. He should have been ordered to the northern lakes. He started back by the isthmus route and was sick all the way. But when he arrived at the east, he was again ordered to California, this time definitely, and at this date was making his third trip. He was as sick as ever, and had been so for more than a month while lying at anchor in the bay. I remember him well, seated with his elbows on the table in front of him, his chin between his hands, and looking the picture of despair. At last he broke out. I wish I had taken my father's advice. He wanted me to go into the Navy. If I had done so, I should not have had to go to sea so much. Poor Slaughter. It was his last sea voyage. He was killed by Indians in Oregon. By the last of August the cholera had so abated that it was deemed safe to start. The disease did not break out again on the way to California, and we reached San Francisco early in September. End of section 14. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at jocclev.com. Section 15 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 15. San Francisco. Early California Experiences, Life on the Pacific Coast, Promoted Captain, Flesh Times in California. San Francisco at that day was a lively place. Gold, or placer digging as it was called, was at its height. Steamers plied daily between San Francisco and both Stockton and Sacramento. Passengers in gold from the southern mines came by the Stockton boat, from the northern mines by Sacramento. In the evening, when these boats arrived, Long Wharf, there was but one wharf in San Francisco in 1852, was alive with people crowding to meet the miners as they came down to sell their dust and to have a time. Of these, some were runners for hotels, boarding houses, or restaurants. Others belonged to a class of impecunious adventurers, of good manners and good presence, who were ever on the alert to make the acquaintance of people with some ready means in the hope of being asked to take a meal at a restaurant. Many were young men of good family, good education, and gentlemanly instincts. Their parents had been able to support them during their minority and to give them good educations, but not to maintain them afterwards. From 1849 to 1853 there was a rush of people to the Pacific coast of the class described. All thought that fortunes were to be picked up without effort in the gold fields on the Pacific. Some realized more than their most sanguine expectations, but for one such there were hundreds disappointed, many of whom now fill unknown graves. Others died, wrecks of their former selves, and many, without a vicious instinct, became criminals and outcasts. Many of the real scenes in early California life exceed in strangeness and interest any of the mere products of the brain of the novelist. Those early days in California brought out character. It was a long way off then, and the journey was expensive. The fortunate could go by Cape Horn or by the Isthmus of Panama, but the mass of pioneers crossed the plains with their ox-teams. 
This took an entire summer. They were very lucky when they got through with a yoke of worn-out cattle. All other means were exhausted in procuring the outfit on the Missouri River. The immigrant, on arriving, found himself a stranger in a strange land, far from friends. Time pressed, for the little means that could be realized from the sale of what was left of the outfit would not support a man long at California prices. Many became discouraged. Others would take off their coats and look for a job, no matter what it might be. These succeeded as a rule. There were many young men who had studied professions before they went to California, and who had never done a day's manual labor in their lives, who took in the situation at once and went to work to make a start at anything they could get to do. Some supplied carpenters and masons with material, carrying plank, brick, or mortar, as the case might be. Others drove stages, drays, or baggage wagons until they could do better. More became discouraged early and spent their time looking up people who would treat, or lounging about restaurants and gambling houses where free lunches were furnished daily. They were welcomed at these places because they often brought in miners who proved good customers. My regiment spent a few weeks at Benicia Barracks, and then was ordered to Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River, then in Oregon Territory. During the winter of 1852-1853, the territory was divided, all north of the Columbia River being taken from Oregon to make Washington Territory. Prices for all kinds of supplies were so high on the Pacific coast from 1849 until at least 1853 that it would have been impossible for officers of the army to exist upon their pay if it had not been that authority was given them to purchase from the commissary such supplies as he kept at New Orleans wholesale prices. A cook could not be hired for the pay of a captain. The cook could do better. At Benicia, in 1852, flour was 25 cents per pound, potatoes were 16 cents, beets, turnips, and cabbage 6 cents, onions 37 and one half cents, meat and other articles in proportion. In 1853, at Vancouver, vegetables were a little lower, I, with three other officers, concluded that we would raise a crop for ourselves and, by selling the surplus, realize something handsome. I bought a pair of horses that had crossed the plains that summer and were very poor. They recuperated rapidly, however, and proved a good team to break up the ground with. I performed all the labor of breaking up the ground while the other officers planted the potatoes. Our crop was enormous. Luckily for us, the Columbia River rose to a great height from the melting of the snow in the mountains in June, and overflowed and killed most of our crop. This saved digging it up for everybody on the Pacific coast seemed to have come to the conclusion at the same time that agriculture would be profitable. In 1853, more than three-quarters of the potatoes raised were permitted to rot in the ground, or had to be thrown away. The only potatoes we sold were to our own mess. While I was stationed on the Pacific coast, we were free from Indian wars. There were quite a number of remnants of tribes in the vicinity of Portland in Oregon, and of Fort Vancouver in Washington Territory. They had generally acquired some of the vices of civilization, but none of the virtues except in individual cases. The Hudson Bay Company had held the Northwest with their trading post for many years before the United States was represented on the Pacific coast. They still retained posts along the Columbia River, and one at Fort Vancouver when I was there. 
Their treatment of the Indians had brought out the better qualities of the savages. Farming had been undertaken by the company to supply the Indians with bread and vegetables. They raised some cattle and horses, and they had now taught the Indians to do the labor of the farm and herd. They always compensated them for their labor, and always gave them goods of uniform quality and at uniform prices. Before the advent of the American, the medium of exchange between the Indian and the white man was pelts. Afterward, it was silver coin. If an Indian received in the sale of a horse a fifty-dollar gold piece, not an infrequent occurrence, the first thing he did was to exchange it for American half-dollars. These he could count. He would then commence his purchases, paying for each article separately as he got it. He would not trust any one to add up the bill and pay it all at once. At that day, fifty-dollar gold pieces, not the issue of the government, were common on the Pacific coast. They were called slugs. The Indians along the lower Columbia, as far as the Cascades, and on the lower Willamette, died off very fast during the year i spent in that section for besides acquiring the vices of the white people they had acquired also their diseases the measles and the smallpox were both amazingly fatal in their wild state before the appearance of the white man among them the principal complaints they were subject to were those produced by long involuntary fasting violent exercise in pursuit of game and overeating instinct more than reason had taught them a remedy for these ills it was the steam bath something like a bake oven was built large enough to admit a man lying down bushes were stuck in the ground in two rows about six feet long and some two or three feet apart other bushes connected the rows at one end. The tops of the bushes were drawn together to interlace and confined in that position. The hole was then plastered over with wet clay until every opening was filled. Just inside the open end of the oven the floor was scooped out so as to make a hole that would hold a bucket or two of water. These ovens were always built on the banks of a stream, a big spring, or pool of water. When a patient required a bath, a fire was built near the oven and a pile of stones put upon it. The cavity at the front was then filled with water. When the stones were sufficiently heated, the patient would draw himself into the oven. A blanket would be thrown over the open end and hot stones put into the water until the patient could stand it no longer. He was then withdrawn from his steam bath and doused into the cold stream nearby. This treatment may have answered with early ailments of the Indians. With the measles or smallpox, it would kill every time. During my year on the Columbia River, the smallpox exterminated one small remnant of a band of Indians entirely, and reduced others materially. I do not think there was a case of recovery among them until the doctor with the Hudson Bay Company took the matter in hand and established a hospital. Nearly every case he treated recovered. I never myself saw the treatment described in the preceding paragraph but have heard it described by persons who have witnessed it. The decimation among the Indians I knew of personally, and the hospital established for their benefit, was a Hudson Bay building, not a stone's throw from my own quarters. The death of Colonel Bliss of the Adjutant General's Department, which occurred July 5, 1853, promoted me to the captaincy of a company then stationed at Humboldt Bay, California. The notice reached me in September of the same year, and I very soon started to join my new command. 
there was no way of reaching humboldt at that time except to take passage on a san francisco sailing vessel going after lumber redwood a species of cedar which on the pacific coast takes the place filled by white pine in the east then abounded on the banks of humboldt bay there were extensive sawmills engaged in preparing this lumber for the san francisco market and sailing vessels used in getting it to market furnished the only means of communication between humboldt and the balance of the world i was obliged to remain in san francisco for several days before i found a vessel this gave me a good opportunity of comparing the san francisco of eighteen fifty two with that of eighteen fifty three as before stated there had been but one wharf in front of the city in eighteen fifty two long wharf in eighteen fifty three the town had grown out into the bay beyond what was the end of this wharf when i first saw it streets and houses had been built out on piles where the year before the largest vessels visiting the port lay at anchor or tied to the wharf there was no filling under the streets or houses san francisco presented the same general appearance as the year before that is eating drinking and gambling houses were conspicuous for their number and publicity they were on the first floor with doors wide open at all hours of the day and night in walking the streets the eye was regaled on every block near the waterfront by the sight of players at faro often broken places were found in the street large enough to let a man down into the water below i have but little doubt that many of the people who went to the pacific coast in the early days of the gold excitement and have never been heard from since or who were heard from for a time and then ceased to write found watery graves beneath the houses or streets built over san francisco bay besides the gambling in cards there was gambling on a larger scale in city lots these were sold on change much as stocks are now sold on wall street cash at time of purchase was always paid by the broker but the purchaser had only to put up his margin he was charged at the rate of two or three per cent a month on the difference besides commissions the sand hills some of them almost inaccessible to foot passengers were surveyed off and mapped into fifty vara lots a vara being a spanish yard these were sold at first at very low prices but were sold and resold for higher prices until they went up to many thousands of dollars the brokers did a fine business and so did many such purchasers as were sharp enough to quit purchasing before the final crash came as the city grew the sand hills back of the town furnished material for filling up the bay under the houses and streets and still further out the temporary houses first built over the water in the harbor soon gave way to more solid structures the main business part of the city now is on solid ground made where vessels of the largest class lay at anchor in the early days i was in san francisco again in eighteen fifty four gambling houses had disappeared from public view the city had become staid and orderly. End of section 15. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Section 16 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 16. Resignation. Private Life. 
Life at Galena The Coming Crisis My family, all this while, was at the east. It consisted now of a wife and two children. I saw no chance of supporting them on the Pacific coast out of my pay as an army officer. I concluded, therefore, to resign, and in March applied for a leave of absence until the end of July following, tendering my resignation to take effect at the end of that time. I left the Pacific coast very much attached to it, and with the full expectation of making it my future home. That expectation and that hope remained uppermost in my mind until the Lieutenant General of C. Bill was introduced into Congress in the winter of 1863-1864. The passage of that bill and my promotion blasted my last hope of ever becoming a citizen of the further west. In the late summer of 1854, I rejoined my family to find in it a son whom I had never seen, born while I was on the Isthmus of Panama. I was now to commence, at the age of thirty-two, a new struggle for our support. My wife had a farm near St. Louis, to which we went, but I had no means to stock it. A house had to be built also. I worked very hard, never losing a day because of bad weather, and accomplished the object in a moderate way. If nothing else could be done, I would load a cord of wood on a wagon and take it to the city for sale. I managed to keep along very well until 1858, when I was attacked by fever and ague. I had suffered very severely and for a long time from this disease while a boy in Ohio. It lasted now over a year, and... While it did not keep me in the house, it did interfere greatly with the amount of work I was able to perform. In the fall of 1858, I sold out my stock, crops, and farming utensils at auction, and gave up farming. In the winter, I established a partnership with Harry Boggs, a cousin of Mrs. Grant, in the real estate agency business. I spent that winter at St. Louis myself, but did not take my family into town until the spring. Our business might have become prosperous if I had been able to wait for it to grow. As it was, there was no more than one person could attend to, and not enough to support two families. While a citizen of St. Louis, and engaged in the real estate agency business, I was a candidate for the office of county engineer, an office of respectability and emolument, which would have been very acceptable to me at that time. The incumbent was appointed by the county court, which consisted of five members. My opponent had the advantage of birth over me. He was a citizen by adoption, and carried off the prize. I now withdrew from the co-partnership with Boggs, and in May 1860 removed to Galena, Illinois, and took a clerkship in my father's store. While a citizen of Missouri, my first opportunity for casting a vote at a presidential election occurred. I had been in the army from before attaining my majority, and had thought but little about politics although I was a Whig by education and a great admirer of Mr. Clay. But the Whig party had ceased to exist before I had an opportunity of exercising the privilege of casting a ballot. The Know-Nothing party had taken its place, but was on the wane, and the Republican party was in a chaotic state and had not yet received a name. It had no existence in the slave states, except at points on the borders next to free states. In St. Louis City and County, 
what afterwards became the republican party was known as the free soil democracy led by the hon frank p blair most of my neighbors had known me as an officer of the army with whig proclivities they had been on the same side and on the death of their party many had become know-nothings or members of the american party there was a lodge near my new home and i was invited to join it i accepted the invitation was initiated attended a meeting just one week later and never went to another afterwards i have no apologies to make for having been one week a member of the american party for i still think native-born citizens of the united states should have as much protection as many privileges in their native country as those who voluntarily select it for a home but all secret oath-bound political parties are dangerous to any nation no matter how pure or how patriotic the motives and principles which first bring them together no political party can or ought to exist when one of its cornerstones is opposition to freedom of thought and to the right to worship god according to the dictate of one's own conscience or according to the creed of any religious denomination whatever nevertheless if a sect sets up its laws as binding above the state laws wherever the two come in conflict this claim must be resisted and suppressed at whatever cost up to the mexican war there were a few out-and-out -out abolitionists men who carried their hostility to slavery into all elections from those for a justice of the peace up to the presidency of the united states they were noisy but not numerous but the great majority of people at the north where slavery did not exist were opposed to the institution and looked upon its existence in any part of the country as unfortunate they did not hold the states where slavery existed responsible for it and believed that protection should be given to the right of property in slaves until some satisfactory way could be reached to be rid of the institution opposition to slavery was not a creed of either political party in some sections more anti-slavery men belonged to the democratic party and in others to the whigs but with the inauguration of the mexican war in fact with the annexation of texas the inevitable conflict commenced as the time for the presidential election of eighteen fifty six the first at which i had the opportunity of voting approached party feeling began to run high the republican party was regarded in the south and the border states not only as opposed to the extension of slavery but as favoring the compulsory abolition of the institution without compensation to the owners the most horrible visions seemed to present themselves to the minds of people who one would suppose ought to have known better many educated and otherwise sensible persons appeared to believe that emancipation meant social equality treason to the government was openly advocated and was not rebuked it was evident to my mind that the election of a republican president in eighteen fifty six meant the secession of all the slave states and rebellion under these circumstances i preferred the success of a candidate whose election would prevent or postpone secession to seeing the country plunged into a war the end of which no man could foretell with a democrat elected by the unanimous vote of the slave states there could be no pretext for secession for four years i very much hoped that the passions of the people would subside in that time 
and the catastrophe be averted altogether. If it was not, I believe the country would be better prepared to receive the shock and to resist it. I therefore voted for James Buchanan for president. Four years later, the Republican Party was successful in electing its candidate to the presidency. The civilized world has learned the consequence. Four millions of human beings held as chattels have been liberated. The ballot has been given to them. The free schools of the country have been opened to their children. The nation still lives and the people are just as free to avoid social intimacy with the blacks as ever they were, or as they are with white people. While living in Galena, I was nominally only a clerk supporting myself and family on a stipulated salary. In reality, my position was different. My father had never lived in Galena himself, but had established my two brothers there, the one next younger than myself in charge of the business, assisted by the youngest. When I went there, it was my father's intention to give up all connection with the business himself and to establish his three sons in it. But the brother who had really built up the business was sinking with consumption, and it was not thought best to make any change while he was in this condition. He lived until September 1861, when he succumbed to that insidious disease which always flatters its victims into the belief that they are growing better up to the close of life. A more honorable man never transacted business. In September 1861, I was engaged in an employment which required all my attention elsewhere. During the eleven months that I lived in Galena, prior to the first call for volunteers, I had been strictly attentive to my business and had made but few acquaintances other than customers and people engaged in the same line with myself. When the election took place in November 1860, I had not been a resident of Illinois long enough to gain citizenship and could not therefore vote. I was really glad of this at the time, for my pledges would have compelled me to vote for Stephen A. Douglas, who had no possible chance of election. The contest was really between Mr. Breckinridge and Mr. Lincoln, between minority rule and ruled by the majority. I wanted, as between these candidates, to see Mr. Lincoln elected. Excitement ran high during the canvass, and torchlight processions enlivened the scene in the generally quiet streets of Galena many nights during the campaign. I did not parade with either party, but occasionally met with the Wide Awakes, Republicans, in their rooms and superintended their drill. It was evident, from the time of the Chicago nomination to the close of the canvass, that the election of the Republican candidate would be the signal for some of the southern states to secede. I still had hopes that the four years which had elapsed since the first nomination of a presidential candidate by a party distinctly opposed to slavery extension, had given time for the extreme pro-slavery sentiment to cool down, for the Southerners to think well before they took the awful leap which they had so vehemently threatened. But I was mistaken. The Republican candidate was elected, and solid, substantial people of the Northwest and I presume the same order of people throughout the entire North, felt very serious, but determined, after this event. It was very much discussed whether the South would carry out its threat to secede and set up a separate government, the cornerstone of which should be protection to the divine 
institution of slavery for there were people who believed in the divinity of human slavery as there are now people who believe mormonism and polygamy to be ordained by the most high we forgive them for entertaining such notions but forbid their practice it was generally believed that there would be a flurry that some of the extreme southern states would go so far as to pass ordinances of secession but the common impression was that this step was so plainly suicidal for the south that the movement would not spread over much of the territory and would not last long doubtless the founders of our government the majority of them at least regarded the confederation of the colonies as an experiment each colony considered itself a separate government that the confederation was for mutual protection against a foreign foe and the prevention of strife and war among themselves if there had been a desire on the part of any single state to withdraw from the compact at any time while the number of states was limited to the original thirteen i do not suppose there would have been any to contest the right no matter how much the determination might have been regretted the problem changed on the ratification of the constitution by all the colonies it changed still more when amendments were added and if the right of any one state to withdraw continued to exist at all after the ratification of the constitution it certainly ceased on the formation of new states at least so far as the new states themselves were concerned it was never possessed at all by florida or the states west of the mississippi all of which were purchased by the treasury of the entire nation texas and the territory brought into the union in consequence of annexation were purchased with both blood and treasure and texas with a domain greater than that of any european state except russia was permitted to retain as state property all the public lands within its borders it would have been ingratitude and injustice of the most flagrant sort for this state to withdraw from the union after all that had been spent and done to introduce her yet if separation had actually occurred texas must necessarily have gone with the south both on account of her institutions and her geographical position secession was illogical as well as impracticable it was revolution now the right of revolution is an inherent one when people are oppressed by their government it is a natural right they enjoy to relieve themselves of the oppression if they are strong enough either by withdrawal from it or by overthrowing it and substituting a government more acceptable but any people or part of a people who resort to this remedy stake their lives their property and every claim for protection given by citizenship on the issue victory or the conditions imposed by the conqueror must be the result in the case of the war between the states it would have been the exact truth if the south had said we do not want to live with you northern people any longer we know our institution of slavery is obnoxious to you and as you are growing numerically stronger than we it may at some time in the future be in danger so long as you permitted us to control the government and with the aid of a few friends at the north to enact laws constituting your section a guard against the escape of our property we were willing to live with you you have been submissive to our rule heretofore 
but it looks now as if you did not intend to continue so we will remain in the union no longer instead of this the seceding states cried lustily let us alone you have no constitutional power to interfere with us newspapers and people at the north reiterated the cry individuals might ignore the constitution but the nation itself must not only obey it but must enforce the strictest construction of that instrument the construction put upon it by the southerners themselves the fact is the constitution did not apply to any such contingency as the one existing from eighteen sixty one to eighteen sixty five its framers never dreamed of such a contingency occurring if they had foreseen it the probabilities are they would have sanctioned the right of a state or states to withdraw rather than that there should be war between brothers the framers were wise in their generation and wanted to do the very best possible to secure their own liberty and independence and that also of their descendants to the latest days it is preposterous to suppose that the people of one generation can lay down the best and only rules of government for all who are to come after them and under unforeseen contingencies at the time of the framing of our constitution the only physical forces that had been subdued and made to serve man and do his labor were the currents in the streams and in the air we breathe rude machinery propelled by water-power had been invented sails to propel ships upon the waters had been set to catch the passing breeze but the application of stream to propel vessels against both wind and current and machinery to do all manner of work had not been thought of the instantaneous transmission of messages around the world by means of electricity would probably at that day have been attributed to witchcraft or a league with the devil in material circumstances had changed as greatly as material ones we could not and ought not to be rigidly bound by the rules laid down under circumstances so different for emergencies so utterly unanticipated the fathers themselves would have been the first to declare that their prerogatives were not irrevocable they would surely have resisted secession could they have lived to see the shape it assumed i traveled through the northwest considerably during the winter of eighteen sixty eighteen sixty one we had customers in all the little towns in southwest wisconsin southeast minnesota and northeast iowa these generally knew i had been a captain in the regular army and had served through the mexican war consequently wherever i stopped at night some of the people would come to the public house where i was and sit till a late hour discussing the probabilities of the future my own views at that time were like those officially expressed by mr seward at a later day that the war would be over in ninety days i continued to entertain these views until after the battle of shiloh i believe now that there would have been no more battles at the west after the capture of fort donelson if all the troops in that region had been under a single commander who would have followed up that victory there is little doubt in my mind now that the prevailing sentiment of the south would have been opposed to secession in eighteen sixty and eighteen sixty one if there had been a fair and calm expression of opinion 
unbiased by threats, and if the ballot of one legal voter had counted for as much as that of any other. But there was no calm discussion of the question. Demagogues, who were too old to enter the army, if there should be a war, others who entertained so high an opinion of their own ability that they did not believe they could be spared from the direction of the affairs of state in such an event, declaimed vehemently and increasingly against the North, against its aggressions upon the South, its interference with Southern rights, etc., etc. They denounced the Northerners as cowards, poltroons, negro worshippers, claimed that one Southern man was equal to five Northern men in battle, that if the South would stand up for its rights, the North would back down. Mr. Jefferson Davis said, in a speech delivered at LaGrange, Mississippi, before the cessation of that state, that he would agree to drink all the blood spilled south of Mason and Dixon's line if there should be a war. The young men, who would have the fighting to do in case of war, believed all these statements, both in regard to the aggressiveness of the North and its cowardice. They, too, cried out for a separation from such people. The great bulk of the legal voters of the South were men who owned no slaves. Their homes were generally in the hills and poor country. Their facilities for educating their children, even up to the point of reading and writing, were very limited. Their interest in the contest was very meager. What there was if they had been capable of seeing it, was with the North. They, too, needed emancipation. Under the old regime, they were looked down upon by those who controlled all the affairs of the interest of slave owners as poor white trash, who were allowed the ballot so long as they cast it according to direction. I am aware that this last statement may be disputed, an individual testimony perhaps seduced, to show that in antebellum days the ballot was as untrammeled in the South as in any section of the country. But in the face of any such contradiction, I reassert the statement. The shotgun was not resorted to. Masked men did not ride over the country at night intimidating voters, but there was a firm feeling that a class existed in every state with a sort of divine right to control public affairs. If they could not get this control by one means, they must by another. The end justified the means. The coercion, if mild, was complete. There were two political parties, it is true, in all the states, both strong in numbers and respectability, but both equally loyal to the institution which stood paramount in southern eyes to all other institutions in state or nation. The slave owners were the minority, but governed both parties. Had politics ever divided the slaveholders and the non-slaveholders, the majority would have been obliged to yield, or internecine war would have been the consequence. I do not know that the southern people were to blame for this condition of affairs. There was a time when slavery was not profitable, and the discussion of the merits of the institution was confined almost exclusively to the territory where it existed. The states of Virginia and Kentucky came near abolishing slavery by their own acts, one state defeating the measure by a tie vote and the other only lacking one. 
but when the institution became profitable all talk of its abolition ceased where it existed and naturally as human nature is constituted arguments were adduced in its support the cotton gin probably had much to do with the justification of slavery the winter of eighteen sixty eighteen sixty one will be remembered by middle-aged people of today as one of great excitement south carolina promptly seceded after the result of the presidential election was known other southern states proposed to follow in some of them the union sentiment was so strong that it had to be suppressed by force maryland delaware kentucky and missouri all slave states failed to pass ordinances of secession but they were all represented in the so-called congress of the so-called confederate states the governor and lieutenant governor of missouri in eighteen sixty one jackson and reynolds were both supporters of the rebellion and took refuge with the enemy the governor soon died and the lieutenant governor assumed his office issued proclamations as governor of the state was recognized as such by the confederate government and continued his pretensions until the collapse of the rebellion the south claimed the sovereignty of states but claimed the right to coerce into their confederation such states as they wanted that is all the states where slavery existed they did not seem to think this course inconsistent the fact is the southern slave owners believed that in some way the ownership of slaves conferred a sort of patent of nobility a right to govern independent of the interest or wishes of those who did not hold such property they convinced themselves first of the divine origin of the institution and next that that particular institution was not safe in the hands of any body of legislators but themselves meanwhile the administration of president buchanan looked helplessly on and proclaimed that the general government had no power to interfere that the nation had no power to save its own life mr buchanan had in his cabinet two members at least who were as earnest to use a mild term in the cause of secession as mr davis or any southern statesman one of them floyd the secretary of war scattered the army so that much of it could be captured when hostilities should commence and distributed the cannon and small arms from northern arsenals throughout the south so as to be on hand when treason wanted them the navy was scattered in like manner the president did not prevent his cabinet preparing for war upon their government either by destroying its resources or storing them in the south until a de facto government was established with jefferson davis as his president and montgomery alabama as the capital the secessionists had then to leave the cabinet in their own estimation they were aliens in the country which had given them birth loyal men were put into their places treason in the executive branch of the government was stopped but the harm had already been done the stable door was locked after the horse had been stolen during all the trying winter of eighteen sixty eighteen sixty one when the southerners were so defiant that they would not allow within their borders the expression of a sentiment hostile to their views it was a brave man indeed who could stand up and proclaim his loyalty to the union on the other hand men at the north prominent men 
proclaimed that the government had no power to coerce the South into submission to the laws of the land, that if the North undertook to raise armies to go South, these armies would have to march over the dead bodies of the speakers. A portion of the press of the North was constantly proclaiming similar views. When the time arrived for the president-elect to go to the capital of the nation to be sworn into office, it was deemed unsafe for him to travel, not only as a president-elect, but as any private citizen should be allowed to do. Instead of going in a special car, receiving the good wishes of his constituents at all the stations along the road, he was obliged to stop on the way and to be smuggled into the capital. He disappeared from public view on his journey, and the next the country knew, his arrival was announced at the capital. There was little doubt that he would have been assassinated if he had attempted to travel openly throughout his journey. End of section 16. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at jocclev.com. Section 17 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 17. Outbreak of the Rebellion, Presiding at a Union Meeting, Mustering Officer of State Troops, Lion at Camp Jackson, Services Tendered to the Government. The 4th of March, 1861, came, and Abraham Lincoln was sworn to maintain the Union against all its enemies. The cessation of one state after another followed, until eleven had gone out. On the 11th of April, Fort Sumter, a national fort in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina, was fired upon by the Southerners, and a few days after was captured. The Confederates proclaimed themselves aliens and thereby debarred themselves of all right to claim protection under the Constitution of the United States. We did not admit the fact that they were aliens, but all the same they debarred themselves of the right to expect better treatment than people of any other foreign state who make war upon an independent nation. Upon the firing on Sumter, President Lincoln issued his first call for troops, and soon after a proclamation convening Congress in extra session. The call was for 75,000 volunteers for 90 days' service. If the shot fired at Fort Sumter was heard around the world, the call of the President for 75,000 men was heard throughout the northern states. There was not a state in the north of a million of inhabitants that would not have furnished the entire number faster than arms could have been supplied to them, if it had been necessary. As soon as the news of the call for volunteers reached Galena, posters were stuck up calling for a meeting of the citizens at the courthouse in the evening. Business ceased entirely. All was excitement. For a time there were no party distinctions. All were Union men, determined to avenge the insult to the national flag. In the evening the courthouse was packed. Although a comparative stranger, I was called upon to preside. The sole reason, possibly, was that I had been in the army and had seen service. With much embarrassment, 
and some prompting, I made out to announce the object of the meeting. Speeches were in order, but it is doubtful whether it would have been safe just then to make other than patriotic ones. There was probably no one in the house, however, who felt like making any other. The two principal speeches were by B. B. Howard, the postmaster, and a Breckinridge Democrat at the November election the fall before, and John A. Rawlins, an elector on the Douglas ticket. E. B. Washburn, with whom I was not acquainted at that time, came in after the meeting had been organized, and expressed, I understood afterwards, a little surprise that Galena could not furnish a presiding officer for such an occasion without taking a stranger. He came forward, and was introduced, and made a speech appealing to the patriotism of the meeting. After the speaking was over, volunteers were called for to form a company. The quota of Illinois had been fixed at six regiments, and it was supposed that one company would be as much as would be accepted from Galena. The company was raised, and the officers and non-commissioned officers elected before the meeting adjourned. I declined the captaincy before the balloting, but announced that I would aid the company in every way I could, and would be found in the service in some position if there should be a war. I never went into our leather store after that meeting, to put up a package, or to do other business. The ladies of Galena were quite as patriotic as the men. They could not enlist, but they conceived the idea of sending their first company to the field uniformed. They came to me to get a description of the United States uniform for infantry, subscribed and bought the material, procured tailors to cut out the garments, and the ladies made them up. In a few days, the company was in uniform and ready to report at the state capitol for assignment. The men all turned out the morning after their enlistment, and I took charge, divided them into squads, and superintended their drill. When they were ready to go to Springfield, I went with him and remained there until they were assigned to a regiment. There were so many more volunteers than had been called for that the question whom to accept was quite embarrassing to the governor, Richard Yates. The legislature was in session at the time, however, and came to his relief. A law was enacted authorizing the governor to accept the services of ten additional regiments, one from each congressional district, for one month, to be paid by the state, but pledged to go into the service of the United States if there should be a further call during their term. Even with this relief, the governor was still very much embarrassed. Before the war was over, he was like the president, when he was taken with the varioloid. At last he had something he could give to all who wanted it. In time, the Galena Company was mustered into the United States service, forming a part of the 11th Illinois Volunteer Infantry. My duties, I thought, had ended at Springfield and I was prepared to start home by the evening train, leaving at nine o'clock. Up to that time, I do not think I had been introduced to Governor Yates, or had ever spoken to him. I knew him by sight, however, because he was living at the same hotel, and I often saw him at table. The evening I was to quit the capital, I left the supper room before the governor and was standing at the front door when he came out. He spoke to me, calling me by my old army title, Captain, and said he understood that I was about leaving the city. I answered that I was. 
He said he would be glad if I would remain overnight and call at the executive office the next morning. I complied with his request, and was asked to go into the adjutant general's office and render such assistance as I could, the governor saying that my army experience would be of great service there. I accepted the proposition. My old army experience I found indeed of very great service. I was no clerk, nor had I any capacity to become one. The only place I ever found in my life to put a paper so as to find it again was either a side coat pocket or the hands of a clerk or secretary more careful than myself. But I had been quartermaster, commissary, and adjutant in the field. The army forms were familiar to me, and I could direct how they should be made out. There was a clerk in the office of the adjutant general who supplied my deficiencies, the ease with which the state of Illinois settled its accounts with the government at the close of the war is evident of the efficiency of Mr. Loomis as an accountant on a large scale. He remained in the office until that time. As I have stated, the legislature authorized the governor to accept the services of ten additional regiments. I had charge of mustering these regiments into the state service. They were assembled at the most convenient railroad centers in their respective congressional districts. I detailed officers to muster in a portion of them, but mustered three in the southern part of the state myself. One of these was to assemble at Belleville, some eighteen miles southeast of St. Louis. When I got there I found that only one or two companies had arrived. There was no probability of the regiment coming together under five days. This gave me a few idle days, which I concluded to spend in St. Louis. There was a considerable force of state militia at Camp Jackson on the outskirts of St. Louis at the time. There is but little doubt that it was the design of Governor Claiborne Jackson to have these troops ready to seize the United States arsenal and the city of St. Louis. Why they did not do so, I do not know. There was but a small garrison, two companies, I think, under Captain N. Lyon at the arsenal, and but for the timely services of the Honorable F. P. Blair, I have little doubt that St. Louis would have gone into rebel hands, and with it the arsenal with all its arms and ammunition. Blair was a leader among the Union men of St. Louis in 1861. There was no state government in Missouri at the time that would sanction the raising of troops or commissioned officers to protect United States property, but Blair had probably procured some form of authority from the President to raise troops in Missouri and to muster them into the service of the United States. At all events, he did raise a regiment, and took command himself as colonel. With this force, he reported to Captain Lyon, and placed himself and regiment under his orders. It was whispered that Lyon, thus reinforced, intended to break up Camp Jackson, and capture the militia. I went down to the arsenal in the morning to see the troops start out. I had known Lyon for two years at West Point, and in the old army afterwards. Blair I knew very well by sight. I had heard him speak in the canvas of 1858, possibly several times, but I had never spoken to him. As the troops marched out of the enclosure around the arsenal, Blair was on his horse outside, forming them into line preparatory to their march. I introduced myself to him, and had a few moments' conversation, and expressed my sympathy with his purpose. 
This was my first personal acquaintance with the Honorable, afterwards Major General, F. P. Blair. Camp Jackson surrendered without a fight, and the garrison was marched down to the arsenal as prisoners of war. Up to this time, the enemies of the government in St. Louis had been bold and defiant, while Union men were quiet but determined. The enemies had their headquarters in a central and public position on Pine Street, near Fifth, from which the rebel flag was flaunted boldly. The Union men had a place of meeting somewhere in the city, I did not know where, and I doubt whether they dared to enrage the enemies of the government by placing the national flag outside their headquarters. As soon as the news of the capture of Camp Jackson reached the city, the condition of affairs was changed. Union men became rampant, aggressive, and, if you will, intolerant. They proclaimed their sentiments boldly, and were impatient at anything like disrespect for the Union. The secessionists became quiet, but were filled with suppressed rage. They had been playing the bully. The Union men ordered the rebel flag taken down from the building on Pine Street. The command was given in tones of authority, and it was taken down never to be raised again in St. Louis. I witnessed the scene. I had heard of the surrender of the camp, and that the garrison was on its way to the arsenal. I had seen the troops start out in the morning, and had wished them success. I now determined to go to the arsenal, and await their arrival, and congratulate them. I stepped on a car standing at the corner of Fourth and Pine Streets, and saw a crowd of people standing quietly in front of the headquarters, who were there for the purpose of hauling down the flag. There were squads of other people at intervals down the street. They too were quiet, but filled with suppressed rage, and muttered their resentment at the insult to what they called their flag. Before the car I was in had started, a dapper little fellow, he would be called a dude at this day, stepped in. He was in a great state of excitement, and used adjectives freely to express his contempt for the Union, and for those who had just perpetrated such an outrage upon the rights of a free people. There was only one other passenger in the car besides myself when this young man entered. He evidently expected to find nothing but sympathy when he got away from the mud sills engaged in compelling a free people to pull down a flag they adored. He turned to me saying, Things have come to a pretty pass when a free people can't choose their own flag. Where I come from, if a man dares to say a word in favor of the Union, we hang him to a limb of the first tree we come to. I replied that, after all, we were not so intolerant in St. Louis as we might be. I had not seen a single rebel hung yet, nor heard of one. There were plenty of them who ought to be, however. The young man subsided. He was so crestfallen that I believe if I had ordered him to leave the car, he would have gone quietly out, saying to himself, More Yankee oppression! By nightfall, the late defenders of Camp Jackson were all within the walls of the St. Louis Arsenal prisoners of war. The next day, I left St. Louis for Mattoon, Illinois, where I was to muster in the regiment from that congressional district. This was the 21st Illinois Infantry, the regiment of which I subsequently became colonel. I mustered one regiment afterwards, when my services for the state were about closed. Brigadier General John Pope was stationed at Springfield as United States mustering officer all the time I was in the state service. He was a native of Illinois and well acquainted with most of the prominent men in the state. 
I was a carpet bagger and knew but few of them. While I was on duty at Springfield, the senators, representatives in Congress, ex-governors, and the state legislators were nearly all at the state capitol. The only acquaintance I made among them was with the governor, whom I was serving, and by chance with Senator S. A. Douglas. The only members of Congress I knew were Washburn and Philip Folk. With the former, though he represented my district and we were citizens of the same town, I only became acquainted at the meeting when the first company of Galena volunteers was raised. Folk, I had known in St. Louis when I was a citizen of that city. I had been three years at West Point with Pope, and had served with him a short time during the Mexican War under General Taylor. I saw a good deal of him during my service with the state. On one occasion he said to me that I ought to go into the United States service. I told him I intended to do so if there was a war. He spoke of his acquaintance with the public men of the state, and said he could get them to recommend me for a position, and that he would do all he could for me. I declined to receive endorsement for permission to fight for my country. Going home for a day or two, soon after this conversation with General Pope, I wrote from Galena the following letter to the Adjutant General of the Army. Galena, Illinois, May 24, 1861 Colonel L. Thomas, Adjutant General, USA, Washington, D.C. Sir, having served for fifteen years in the regular Army, including four years at West Point, and feeling it the duty of every one who has been educated at the government expense to offer their services for the support of that government. I have the honor, very respectfully, to tender my services until the close of the war in such capacity as may be offered. I would say, in view of my present age and length of service, I feel myself competent to command a regiment. If the President, in his judgment, should see fit to entrust one to me. Since the first call of the President, I have been serving on the staff of the Governor of this state, rendering such aid as I could in the organization of our state militia, and am still engaged in that capacity. A letter addressed to me at Springfield, Illinois, will reach me. I am very respectfully your obedient servant, U.S. Grant. This letter failed to elicit an answer from the Adjutant General of the Army. I presume it was heartily read by him, and certainly it could not have been submitted to higher authority. Subsequent to the war, General Badeau, having heard of this letter, applied to the War Department for a copy of it. The letter could not be found, and no one recollected ever having seen it. I took no copy when it was written. Long after the application of General Badu, General Townsend, who had become Adjutant General of the Army, while packing up papers preparatory to the removal of his office, found this letter in some out-of-the-way place, it had not been destroyed, but it had not been regularly filed away. I felt some hesitation in suggesting rank as high as the colonelcy of a regiment, feeling somewhat doubtful whether I would be equal to the position. But I had seen nearly every colonel who had been mustered in from the state of Illinois and some from Indiana, and felt that if they could command a regiment properly, and with credit, I could also. Having but little to do after the muster of the last of the regiments authorized by the state legislature, I asked and obtained of the governor 
leave of absence for a week to visit my parents in Covington, Kentucky, immediately opposite Cincinnati. General McClellan had been made a major general and had his headquarters at Cincinnati. In reality, I wanted to see him. I had known him slightly at West Point, where we served one year together, and in the Mexican War. I was in hopes that, when he saw me, he would offer me a position on his staff. I called on two successive days at his office, but failed to see him on either occasion, and returned to Springfield. End of section 17. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Section 18 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 18. Appointed Colonel of the 21st Illinois. Personnel of the Regiment. General Logan. March to Missouri. Movement against Harris at Florida, Missouri. General Pope in command. Stationed at Mexico, Missouri. While I was absent from the state capital on this occasion, the President's second call for troops was issued. This time it was for 300,000 men for three years or the war. This brought into the United States service all the regiments then in the state service. These had elected their officers from highest to lowest, and were accepted with their organizations as they were, except in two instances. A Chicago regiment, the 19th Infantry, had elected a very young man to the colonelcy. When it came to taking the field, the regiment asked to have another appointed colonel, and the one they had previously chosen made lieutenant colonel. The 21st Regiment of Infantry, mustered in by me at Mattoon, refused to go into the service with the colonel of their selection in any position. While I was still absent, Governor Yates appointed me colonel of this latter regiment. A few days after I was in charge of it and in camp on the fairgrounds near Springfield. My regiment was composed in large part of young men of as good social position as any in their section of the state. It embraced the sons of farmers, lawyers, physicians, politicians, merchants, bankers, and ministers, and some men of maturer years who had filled such positions themselves. There were also men in it who could be led astray and the colonel, elected by the votes of the regiment, had proved to be fully capable of developing all there was in his men of recklessness. It was said that he even went so far at times as to take the guard from their posts and go with them to the village nearby and make a night of it. When there came a prospect of battle, the regiment wanted to have someone else to lead them. I found it very hard work for a few days to bring all the men into anything like subordination, but the great majority favored discipline, and by the application of a little regular army punishment, all were reduced to as good discipline as one could ask. The ten regiments which had volunteered in the state service for thirty days, it will be remembered, had done so with a pledge to go into the national service if called upon within that time. When they volunteered, the government had only called for ninety days enlistments. Men were called now for three years or the war. They felt 
that this change of period released them from the obligation of re-volunteering. When I was appointed colonel, the 21st Regiment was still in the state service. About the time they were to be mustered into the United States service, such of them as would go, two members of Congress from the state, McClernand and Logan, appeared at the Capitol, and I was introduced to them. I had never seen either of them before, but I had read a great deal about them, and particularly about Logan in the newspapers. Both were Democratic members of Congress, and Logan had been elected from the southern district of the state, where he had a majority of 18,000 over his Republican competitor. His district had been settled originally by people from the southern states, and at the breaking out of secession they sympathized with the South. At the first outbreak of war, some of them joined the Southern Army. Many others were preparing to do so. Others rode over the country at night, denouncing the Union, and made it as necessary to guard railroad bridges over which national troops had to pass in Southern Illinois, as it was in Kentucky or any of the border slave states. Logan's popularity in this district was unbounded. He knew almost enough of the people in it, by their Christian names, to form an ordinary congressional district. As he went in politics, so his district was sure to go. The Republican papers had been demanding that he should announce where he stood on the questions which at that time engrossed the whole of public thought. Some were very bitter in their denunciations of this silence. Logan was not a man to be coerced into an utterance by threats. He did, however, come out in a speech before the adjournment of the special session of Congress, which was convened by the President soon after his inauguration, and announced his undying loyalty and devotion to the Union. But I had not happened to see that speech, so that when I first met Logan, my impressions were those formed from reading denunciations of him. McClernand, on the other hand, had early taken strong grounds for the maintenance of the Union and had been praised accordingly by the Republican papers. The gentlemen who presented these two members of Congress asked me if I would have any objections to their addressing my regiment. I hesitated a little before answering. It was but a few days before the time set for mustering into the United States service such of the men as were willing to volunteer for three years or the war. I had some doubt as to the effect a speech from Logan might have, but as he was with McClernand, whose sentiments on the all-absorbing questions of the day were well known, I gave my consent. McClernand spoke first, and Logan followed in a speech which he has hardly equaled since for force and eloquence. It breathed a loyalty and devotion to the Union, which inspired my men to such a point that they would have volunteered to remain in the army as long as an enemy of the country continued to bear arms against it. They entered the United States service almost to a man. General Logan went to his part of the state and gave his attention to raising troops. The very men who at first made it necessary to guard the roads in southern Illinois became the defenders of the Union. Logan entered the service himself as colonel of a regiment and rapidly rose to the rank of major general. His district which had promised at first to give much trouble to the government, filled every call made upon it for troops without resorting to the draft. There was no call made when there were not more volunteers than were asked for. That congressional district stands credited at the War Department today with furnishing more men for the Army than it was called on to supply. 
I remained in Springfield with my regiment until the 3rd of July, when I was ordered to Quincy, Illinois. By that time the regiment was in a good state of discipline, and the officers and men were well up in the company drill. There was direct railroad communication between Springfield and Quincy, but I thought it would be good preparation for the troops to march there. We had no transportation for our camp and garrison equipage, so wagons were hired for the occasion, and on the 3rd of July we started. There was no hurry, but fair marches were made every day until the Illinois River was crossed. There I was overtaken by a dispatch saying that the destination of the regiment had been changed to Ironton, Missouri, and ordering me to halt where I was and await the arrival of a steamer which had been dispatched up the Illinois River to take the regiment to St. Louis. The boat, when it did come, grounded on a sandbar a few miles below where we were in camp. We remained there several days, waiting to have the boat get off the bar, but before this occurred news came that an Illinois regiment was surrounded by rebels at a point on the Hannibal and St. Joe Railroad some miles west of Palmyra in Missouri, and I was ordered to proceed with all dispatch to their relief. We took the cars and reached Quincy in a few hours. When I left Galena for the last time to take command of the 21st Regiment, I took with me my oldest son, Frederick D. Grant, then a lad of eleven years of age. On receiving the order to take rail for Quincy, I wrote to Mrs. Grant to relieve what I supposed would be her great anxiety for one so young going into danger that I would send Fred home from Quincy by river. I received a prompt letter in reply decidedly disapproving my proposition and urging that the lad should be allowed to accompany me. It came too late. Fred was already on his way up to Mississippi, bound for Dubuque, Iowa, from which place there was a railroad to Galena. My sensations as we approached what I supposed might be a field of battle were anything but agreeable. I had been in all the engagements in Mexico that it was possible for one person to be in, but not in command. If someone else had been colonel, and I had been lieutenant colonel, I do not think I would have felt any trepidation. Before we were prepared to cross the Mississippi River at Quincy, my anxiety was relieved, for the men of the besieged regiment came straggling into town. I am inclined to think both sides got frightened and ran away. I took my regiment to Palmyra and remained there for a few days until relieved by the 19th Illinois Infantry. From Palmyra, I proceeded to Salt River, the railroad bridge over which had been destroyed by the enemy. Colonel John M. Palmer, at that time, commanded the 13th Illinois, which was acting as a guard to workmen who were engaged in rebuilding this bridge. Palmer was my senior, and commanded the two regiments as long as we remained together. The bridge was finished in about two weeks, and I received orders to move against Colonel Thomas Harris, who was said to be encamped at the little town of Florida, some twenty-five miles south of where we then were. At the time of which I now write, we had no transportation, and the country about Salt River was sparsely settled, so that it took some days to collect teams and drivers enough to move the camp and garrison equipage of a regiment nearly a thousand strong, together with a week's supply of provisions and some ammunition. While preparations for the move were going on, I felt quite comfortable, but when we got on the road and found every house deserted, I was anything but easy. In the twenty-five miles we had to march we did not see a person 
old or young, male or female, except two horsemen, who were on a road that crossed ours. As soon as they saw us, they decamped as fast as their horses could carry them. I kept my men in the ranks, and forbade their entering any of the deserted houses or taking anything from them. We halted at night on the road and proceeded the next morning at an early hour. Harris had been encamped in a creek bottom for the sake of being near water. The hills on either side of the creek extended to a considerable height, possibly more than a hundred feet. As we approached the brow of the hill from which it was expected we could see Harris's camp and possibly find his men ready formed to meet us, my heart kept getting higher and higher until it felt to me as though it was in my throat. I would have given anything then to have been back in Illinois, but I had not the moral courage to halt and consider what to do. I kept right on. When we reached a point from which the valley below was in full view, I halted. The place where Harris had been encamped a few days before was still there, and the marks of a recent encampment were plainly visible, but the troops were gone. My heart resumed its place. It occurred to me at once that Harris had been as much afraid of me as I had been of him. This was a view of the question I had never taken before, but it was one I never forgot afterwards. From that event to the close of the war, I never experienced trepidation upon confronting an enemy, though I always felt more or less anxiety. I never forgot that he had as much reason to fear my forces as I had his. The lesson was valuable. Inquiries at the village of Florida divulged the fact that Colonel Harris, learning of my intended movement, while my transportation was being collected, took time by the forelock and left Florida before I had started from Salt River. He had increased the distance between us by forty miles. The next day I started back to my old camp at Salt River Bridge. The citizens, living on the line of our march, had returned to their houses after we passed, and finding everything in good order, nothing carried away, they were at their front doors ready to greet us now. They had evidently been led to believe that the national troops carried death and devastation with them wherever they went. In a short time after our return to Salt River Bridge, I was ordered with my regiment to the town of Mexico. General Pope was then commanding the district, embracing all of the state of Missouri between the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, with his headquarters in the village of Mexico. I was assigned to the command of a sub-district, embracing the troops in the immediate neighborhood, some three regiments of infantry and a section of artillery. There was one regiment encamped by the side of mine. I assumed command of the whole, and the first night sent the commander of the other regiment the parole and countersign. Not wishing to be outdone in courtesy, he immediately sent me the countersign for his regiment for the night. When he was informed that the countersign sent to him was for use with his regiment as well as mine, it was difficult to make him understand that this was not an unwarranted interference of one colonel over another. No doubt he attributed it, for the time, to the presumption of a graduate of West Point over a volunteer, pure and simple. But the question was soon settled, and we had no further trouble. My arrival in Mexico had been preceded by that of two or three regiments in which proper discipline had not been maintained, and the men had been in the habit of visiting houses without invitation, and helping themselves to food and drink, or demanding them from the occupants. They carried their muskets, while out of camp, and made every man they found take the oath of allegiance to the government. I at once published orders prohibiting the soldiers from going into private houses, unless invited by the inhabitants, 
and from appropriating private property to their own or to government uses. The people were no longer molested or made afraid. I received the most marked courtesy from the citizens of Mexico as long as I remained there. Up to this time my regiment had not been carried in the school of the soldier beyond the company drill, except that it had received some training on the march from Springfield to the Illinois River. There was now a good opportunity of exercising it in the battalion drill. While I was at West Point, the tactics used in the army had been Scots, and the musket the flintlock. I had never looked at a copy of tactics from the time of my graduation. My standing in that branch of studies had been near the foot of the class. In the Mexican War in the summer of 1846, I had been appointed regimental quartermaster and commissary, and had not been at a battalion drill since. The arms had been changed since then, and Hardy's tactics had been adopted. I got a copy of tactics and studied one lesson, intending to confine the exercise of the first day to the commands I had thus learned. By pursuing this course from day to day, I thought I would soon get through the volume. We were encamped just outside of town on the common, among scattering suburban houses, with enclosed gardens, and when I got my regiment in line and rode to the front, I soon saw that if I attempted to follow the lesson I had studied, I would have to clear away some of the houses and garden fences to make room. I perceived at once, however, that Hardy's tactics, a mere translation from the French with Hardy's name attached, was nothing more than common sense, and the progress of the age applied to Scott's system. The commands were abbreviated, and the movement expedited. Under the old tactics, almost every change in the order of march was preceded by a halt, then came the change, and then the forward march. With the new tactics, all these changes could be made while in motion. I found no trouble in giving commands that would take my regiment where it wanted to go, and carry it around all obstacles. I do not believe that the officers of the regiment ever discovered that I had never studied the tactics that I used. End of section 18. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at jocclev.com. Section 19 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 19. Commissioned Brigadier General. Command at Ironton, Missouri, Jefferson City, Cape Girardeau, General Prentiss, Seizure of Paducah, Headquarters at Cairo. I had not been in Mexico many weeks when, reading a St. Louis paper, I found the President had asked the Illinois delegation in Congress to recommend some citizens of the state for the position of Brigadier General and that they had unanimously recommended me as first on a list of seven. I was very much surprised because, as I have said, my acquaintance with the congressman was very limited, and I did not know of anything I had done to inspire such confidence. The papers of the next day announced that my name, with three others, had been sent to the Senate, and a few days after, our confirmation was announced. When appointed Brigadier General, I at once thought it proper that one of my aides should come from the regiment I had been commanding, and so selected Lieutenant C. B. Legault. While living in St. Louis, I had had a desk in the law office of McClellan, Moody, and Hillier. Difference in views 
between the members of the firm on the questions of the day and general hard times in the border cities had broken up this firm hillier was quite a young man then in his twenties and very brilliant i asked him to accept a place on my staff i also wanted to take one man from my new home galena the canvas in the presidential campaign the fall before had brought out a young lawyer by the name of john a rawlins who proved himself one of the ablest speakers in the state he was also a candidate for elector on the douglas ticket when sumter was fired upon and the integrity of the union threatened there was no man more ready to serve his country than he i wrote at once asking him to accept the position of assistant adjutant general with the rank of captain on my staff he was about entering the service as major of a new regiment then organizing in the northwestern part of the state but he threw this up and accepted my offer neither hillier nor legault proved to have any particular taste or special qualifications for the duties of the soldier and the former resigned during the vicksburg campaign the latter i relieved after the battle of chattanooga rawlins remained with me as long as he lived and rose to the rank of brigadier general and chief of staff to the general of the army an office created for him before the war closed he was an able man possessed of great firmness and could say no so emphatically to a request which he thought should not be granted that the person he was addressing would understand at once that there was no use of pressing the matter general rawlins was a very useful officer in other ways than this i became very much attached to him shortly after my promotion i was ordered to ironton missouri to command a district in that part of the state and took the twenty first illinois my old regiment with me several other regiments were ordered to the same destination about the same time ironton is on the iron mountain railroad about seventy miles south of st louis and situated among hills rising almost to the dignity of mountains when i reached there about the eighth of august colonel b gratz brown afterwards governor of missouri and in eighteen seventy two vice presidential candidate was in command some of his troops were ninety days men and their time had expired some time before the men had no clothing but what they had volunteered in and much of this was so worn that it would hardly stay on general hardy the author of the tactics i did not study was at greenville some twenty-five miles further south it was said with five thousand confederate troops under these circumstances colonel brown's command was very much demoralized a squadron of cavalry could have ridden into the valley and captured the entire force brown himself was gladder to see me on that occasion than he ever has been since i relieved him and sent all his men home within a day or two to be mustered out of service within ten days after reading ironton i was prepared to take the offensive against the enemy at greenville i sent a column east out of the valley we were in with orders to swing around to the south and west and come into the greenville road ten miles south of ironton another column marched on the direct road and went into camp at the point designated for the two columns to meet i was to ride out the next morning and take personal command of the movement my experience against harris in northern missouri had inspired me with confidence but when the evening train came in 
it brought general b m prentice with orders to take command of the district his orders did not relieve me but i knew that by law i was senior and at that time even the president did not have the authority to assign a junior to command a senior of the same grade i therefore gave general prentice the situation of the troops and the general condition of affairs and started for st louis the same day the movement against the rebels at greenville went no further from st louis i was ordered to jefferson city the capital of the state to take command general sterling price of the confederate army was thought to be threatening the capital lexington chillicothe and other comparatively large towns in the central part of missouri i found a good many troops in jefferson city but in the greatest confusion and no one person knew where they all were colonel mulligan a gallant man was in command but he had not been educated as yet to his new profession and did not know how to maintain discipline i found that volunteers had obtained permission from the department commander or claimed they had to raise some of them regiments some battalions some companies the officers to be commissioned according to the number of men they brought into the service there were recruiting stations all over town with notices rudely lettered on boards over the doors announcing the arm of service and length of time for which recruits at that station would be received the law required all volunteers to serve for three years or the war but in jefferson city in august eighteen sixty one they were recruited for different periods and on different conditions some were enlisted for six months some for a year some without any condition as to where they were to serve others were not to be sent out of the state the recruits were principally men from regiments stationed there and already in the service bound for three years if the war lasted that long the city was filled with union fugitives who had been driven by guerrilla bands to take refuge with the national troops they were in a deplorable condition and must have starved but for the support the government gave them they had generally made their escape with a team or two sometimes a yoke of oxen with a mule or a horse in the lead a little bedding besides their clothing and some food had been thrown into the wagon all else of their worldly goods were abandoned and appropriated by their former neighbors for the union man in missouri who stayed at home during the rebellion if he was not immediately under the protection of the national troops was at perpetual war with his neighbors i stopped the recruiting service and disposed the troops about the outskirts of the city so as to guard all approaches order was soon restored i had been at jefferson city but a few days when i was directed from department headquarters to fit out an expedition to lexington boonville and chillicothe in order to take from the banks in those cities all the funds they had and send them to st louis the western army had not yet been supplied with transportation it became necessary therefore to press into the service teams belonging to sympathizers with the rebellion or to hire those of union men this afforded an opportunity of giving employment to such of the refugees within our lines as had teams suitable for our purposes they accepted the service with alacrity as fast as troops could be got off they were moved west some twenty miles or more in seven or eight days from my assuming command at jefferson city i had all the troops except a small garrison at an advanced position and expected to join them myself the next day but my campaigns had not yet begun 
for while seated at my office door with nothing further to do until it was time to start for the front i saw an officer of rank approaching who proved to be colonel jefferson c davis i had never met him before but he introduced himself by handing me an order for him to proceed to jefferson city and relieve me of the command the orders directed that i should report at department headquarters at st louis without delay to receive important special instructions it was about an hour before the only regular train of the day would start i therefore turned over to colonel davis my orders and hurriedly stated to him the progress that had been made to carry out the department instructions already described i had at that time but one staff officer doing myself all the detail work usually performed by an adjutant general in an hour after being relieved from the command i was on my way to st louis leaving my single staff officer to follow the next day with our horses and baggage the important special instructions which i received the next day assigned me to the command of the district of southeast missouri embracing all the territory south of st louis in missouri as well as all southern illinois at first i was to take personal command of a combined expedition that had been ordered for the capture of colonel jefferson thompson a sort of independent or partisan commander who was disputing with us the possession of southeast missouri troops had been ordered to move from ironton to cape girardeau sixty or seventy miles to the southeast on the mississippi river while the forces at cape girardeau had been ordered to move to jacksonville ten miles out towards ironton and troops at cairo and birds point at the junction of the ohio and mississippi rivers were to hold themselves in readiness to go down the mississippi to belmont eighteen miles below to be moved west from there when an officer should come to command them i was the officer who had been selected for this purpose cairo was to become my headquarters when the expedition terminated in pursuance of my orders i established my temporary headquarters at cape girardeau and sent instructions to the commanding officer at jackson to inform me of the approach of general prentice from ironton hired wagons were kept moving night and day to take additional rations to jackson to supply the troops when they started from there neither general prentice nor colonel marsh who commanded at jackson knew their destination i drew up all the instructions for the contemplated move and kept them in my pocket until i should hear of the junction of our troops at jackson two or three days after my arrival at cape girardeau word came that general prentice was approaching that place jackson i started at once to meet him there and to give him his orders as i turned the first corner of a street after starting i saw a column of cavalry passing the next street in front of me i turned and rode around the block the other way so as to meet the head of the column i found there general prentice himself with a large escort he had halted his troops at jackson for the night and had come on himself to cape girardeau leaving orders for his command to follow him in the morning i gave the general his orders which stopped him at jackson but he was very much aggrieved at being placed under another brigadier general particularly as he believed himself to be the senior he had been a brigadier in command at cairo while i was mustering officer at springfield without any rank but we were nominated at the same time for the united states service and both our commissions bore date may seventeenth eighteen sixty one 
by virtue of my former army rank i was by law the senior general prentice failed to get orders to his troops to remain at jackson and the next morning early they were reported as approaching cape Girardeau. i then ordered the general very peremptorily to countermarch his command and take it back to jackson he obeyed the order but bade his command adieu when he got them to jackson and went to st louis and reported himself this broke up the expedition but little harm was done as jefferson thompson moved light and to no fixed place for even nominal headquarters he was as much at home in arkansas as he was in missouri and would keep out of the way of a superior force prentice was sent to another part of the state general prentice made a great mistake on the above occasion one that he would not have committed later in the war when i came to know him better i regretted it much in consequence of this occurrence he was off duty in the field when the principal campaign at the west was going on and his juniors received promotion while he was where none could be obtained he would have been next to myself in rank in the district of southeast missouri by virtue of his services in the mexican war he was a brave and very earnest soldier no man in the service was more sincere in his devotion to the cause for which we were battling none more ready to make sacrifices or risk life in it on the fourth of september i removed my headquarters to cairo and found colonel richard oglesby in command of the post we had never met at least not to my knowledge after my promotion i had ordered my brigadier general's uniform from new york but it had not yet arrived so that i was in citizen's dress the colonel had his office full of people mostly from the neighboring states of missouri and kentucky making complaints or asking favors he evidently did not catch my name when i was presented for on my taking a piece of paper from the table where he was seated and writing the order assuming command of the district of southeast missouri colonel richard j oglesby to command the post at bird's point and handing it to him he put on an expression of surprise that looked a little as if he would like to have some one identify me but he surrendered the office without question the day after i assumed command at cairo a man came to me who said he was a scout of general fremont he reported that he had just come from columbus a point on the mississippi twenty miles below on the kentucky side and that troops had started from there or were about to start to seize paducah at the mouth of the tennessee there was no time for delay i reported by telegraph to the department commander the information i had received and added that i was taking steps to get off that night to be in advance of the enemy in securing that important point there was a large number of steamers lying at cairo and a good many boatmen were staying in the town it was the work of only a few hours to get the boats manned with coal aboard and steamed up troops were also designated to go aboard the distance from cairo to paducah is about forty-five miles i did not wish to get there before daylight of the sixth and directed therefore that the boat should lie at anchor out in the stream until the time to start not having received an answer to my first dispatch i again telegraphed to department headquarters that i should start for paducah that night unless i received further orders hearing nothing we started before midnight and arrived early the following morning anticipating the enemy by probably not over six or eight hours it proved very fortunate 
that the expedition against jefferson thompson had been broken up had it not been the enemy would have seized paducah and fortified it to our very great annoyance when the national troops entered the town the citizens were taken by surprise i never after saw such consternation depicted on the faces of the people men women and children came out of their doors looking pale and frightened at the presence of the invader they were expecting rebel troops that day in fact nearly four thousand men from columbus were at that time within ten or fifteen miles of paducah on their way to occupy the place i had but two regiments and one battery with me but the enemy did not know this and returned to columbus i stationed my troops at the best points to guard the roads leading into the city left gunboats to guard the river fronts and by noon was ready to start on my return to cairo before leaving however i addressed a short printed proclamation to the citizens of paducah assuring them of our peaceful intentions that we had come among them to protect them against the enemies of our country and that all who chose could continue with their usual avocations with assurance of the protection of the government this was evidently a relief to them but the majority would have much preferred the presence of the other army i reinforced paducah rapidly from the troops at cape gerardo and a day or two later general c f smith a most accomplished soldier reported at cairo and was assigned to the command of the post at the mouth of the tennessee in a short time it was well fortified and a detachment was sent to occupy smithland at the mouth of the cumberland the state government of kentucky at that time was rebel in sentiment but wanted to preserve an armed neutrality between the north and the south and the governor really seemed to think the state had a perfect right to maintain a neutral position the rebels already occupied two towns in the state columbus and hickman on the mississippi and at the very moment the national troops were entering paducah from the ohio front general lloyd tilgman a confederate with his staff and a small detachment of men were getting out in the other direction while as i have already said nearly four thousand confederate troops were on kentucky soil on their way to take possession of the town but in the estimation of the governor and of those who thought with him this did not justify the national authorities in invading the soil of kentucky i informed the legislature of the state of what i was doing and my action was approved by the majority of that body on my return to cairo i found authority from department headquarters for me to take paducah if i felt strong enough but very soon after i was reprimanded from the same quarters for my correspondence with the legislature and warned against a repetition of the offense soon after i took command at cairo general fremont entered into arrangements for the exchange of the prisoners captured at camp jackson in the month of may i received orders to pass them through my lines to columbus as they presented themselves with proper credentials quite a number of these prisoners i had been personally acquainted with before the war such of them as i had so known were received at my headquarters as old acquaintances and ordinary routine business was not disturbed by their presence on one occasion when several were present in my office my intention to visit cape gerardo the next day to inspect the troops at that point was mentioned something transpired which postponed my trip but a steamer employed by the government was passing a point some twenty or more miles above cairo the next day 
when a section of rebel artillery with proper escort brought her to. A major, one of those who had been at my headquarters the day before, came at once aboard, and after some search made a direct demand for my delivery. It was hard to persuade him that I was not there. This officer was Major Barrett of St. Louis. I had been acquainted with his family before the war. End of section 19. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Section 20 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 20. General Fremont in Command. Movement against Belmont, Battle of Belmont, A Narrow Escape, After the Battle. From the occupation of Paducah up to the early part of November, nothing important occurred with the troops under my command. I was reinforced from time to time, and the men were drilled and disciplined, preparatory for the service which was sure to come. By the 1st of November I had not fewer than 20,000 men, most of them under good drill and ready to meet any equal body of men who, like themselves, had not yet been in an engagement. They were growing impatient at lying idle so long, almost in hearing of the guns of the enemy they had volunteered to fight against. I ask on one or two occasions to be allowed to move against Columbus. It could have been taken soon after the occupation of Paducah, but before November it was so strongly fortified that it would have required a large force and a long siege to capture it. In the latter part of October, General Fremont took the field in person and moved from Jefferson City against General Sterling Price, who was then in the state of Missouri with a considerable command. About the 1st of November, I was directed from department headquarters to make a demonstration on both sides of the Mississippi River with the view of detaining the rebels at Columbus within their lines. Before my troops could be got off, I was notified from the same quarter that there were some 3,000 of the enemy on the St. Francis River, about 50 miles west or southwest from Cairo, and was ordered to send another force against them. I dispatched Colonel Oglesby at once with troops sufficient to compete with the reported number of the enemy. On the 5th, word came from the same source that the rebels were about to detach a large force from Columbus to be moved by boats down the Mississippi and up the White River in Arkansas in order to reinforce Price, and I was directed to prevent this movement if possible. I accordingly sent a regiment from Bird's Point under Colonel W. H. L. Wallace to overtake and reinforce Oglesby with orders to march to New Madrid, a point some distance below Columbus on the Missouri side. At the same time, I directed General C. F. Smith to move all the troops he could spare from Paducah directly against Columbus, halting them, however, a few miles from the town to await further orders from me. Then I gathered up all the troops at Cairo and Fort Holt, except suitable guards, and moved them down the river on steamers, convoyed by two gunboats accompanying them myself. My force consisted of a little over 3,000 men, and embraced five regiments of infantry, two guns, and two companies of cavalry. We dropped down the river on the 6th, 
to within about six miles of Columbus, debarked a few men on the Kentucky side, and established pickets to connect with the troops from Paducah. I had no orders which contemplated an attack by the national troops, nor did I intend anything of the kind when I started out from Cairo. But after we started, I saw that the officers and men were elated at the prospect of at last having the opportunity of doing what they had volunteered to do, fight the enemies of their country. I did not see how I could maintain discipline or retain the confidence of my command if we should return to Cairo without an effort to do something. Columbus, besides being strongly fortified, contained a garrison much more numerous than the force I had with me. It would not do, therefore, to attack that point. About two o'clock on the morning of the 7th, I learned that the enemy was crossing troops from Columbus to the west bank to be dispatched, presumably, after Oglesby. I knew there was a small camp of Confederates at Belmont, immediately opposite Columbus, and I speedily resolved to push down the river, land on the Missouri side, capture Belmont, break up the camp, and return. Accordingly, the pickets above Columbus were drawn in at once, and about daylight the boats moved out from shore. In an hour we were debarking on the west bank of the Mississippi, just out of range of the batteries at Columbus. The ground on the west shore of the river, opposite Columbus, is low and in places marshy and cut up with sloughs. The soil is rich and the timber large and heavy. There were some small clearings between Belmont and the point where we landed, but most of the country was covered with the native forests. We landed in front of a cornfield. When the debarkation commenced, I took a regiment down the river to post it as a guard against surprise. At that time I had no staff officer who could be trusted with that duty. In the woods, at a short distance below the clearing, I found a depression, dry at the time, but which at high water became a slough or bayou. I placed the men in the hollow, gave them their instructions, and ordered them to remain there until they were properly relieved. These troops, with the gunboats, were to protect our transports. Up to this time, the enemy had evidently failed to divine our intentions. From Columbus, they could, of course, see our gunboats and transports loaded with troops, but the force from Paducah was threatening them from the land side, and it was hardly to be expected that if Columbus was our object, we would separate our troops by a wide river. They doubtless thought we meant to draw a large force from the east bank, then embark ourselves, land on the east bank, and make a sudden assault on Columbus before their divided command could be united. About eight o'clock we started from the point of debarkation, marching by the flank. After moving in this way for a mile or a mile and a half, I halted where there was marshy ground covered with a heavy growth of timber in our front, and deployed a large part of my force as skirmishers. By this time the enemy discovered that we were moving upon Belmont, and sent out troops to meet us. Soon after we had started in line, his skirmishers were encountered and fighting commenced. This continued, growing fiercer and fiercer, for about four hours, the enemy being forced back gradually until he was driven into his camp. Early in this engagement my horse was shot under me, but I got another from one of my staff, and kept well up with the advance until the river was reached. The officers and men engaged at Belmont were then under fire for the first time. Veterans could not have behaved better than they did up to the moment of reaching the rebel camp. At this point, they became demoralized from their victory, 
and failed to reap its full reward the enemy had been followed so closely that when he reached the clear ground on which his camp was pitched he beat a hasty retreat over the river bank which protected him from our shots and from view this precipitate retreat at the last moment enabled the national forces to pick their way without hindrance through the abatis the only artificial defense the enemy had the moment the camp was reached our men laid down their arms and commenced rummaging the tents to pick up trophies some of the higher officers were little better than the privates they galloped about from one cluster of men to another and at every halt delivered a short eulogy upon the union cause and the achievements of the command all this time the troops we had been engaged with for four hours lay crouched under cover of the river bank ready to come up and surrender if summoned to do so but finding that they were not pursued they worked their way up the river and came up on the bank between us and our transports i saw at the same time two steamers coming from the columbus side towards the west shore above us black or gray with soldiers from boiler deck to roof some of my men were engaged in firing from captured guns at empty steamers down the river out of range cheering at every shot i tried to get them to turn their guns upon the loaded steamers above and not so far away my efforts were in vain at last i directed my staff officers to set fire to the camps this drew the fire of the enemy's guns located on the heights of columbus they had abstained from firing before probably because they were afraid of hitting their own men or they may have supposed until the camp was on fire that it was still in the possession of their friends about this time too the men we had driven over the bank were seen in line up the river between us and our transports the alarm surrounded was given the guns of the enemy and the report of being surrounded brought officers and men completely under control at first some of the officers seemed to think that to be surrounded was to be placed in a hopeless position where there was nothing to do but surrender but when i announced that we had cut our way in and could cut our way out just as well it seemed a new revelation to officers and soldiers they formed line rapidly and we started back to our boats with the men deployed as skirmishers as they had been on entering camp the enemy was soon encountered but his resistance this time was feeble again the confederates sought shelter under the river banks we could not stop however to pick them up because the troops we had seen crossing the river had debarked by this time and were nearer our transports than we were it would be prudent to get them behind us but we were not again molested on our way to the boats from the beginning of the fighting our wounded had been carried to the houses at the rear near the place of debarkation i now set the troops to bringing their wounded to the boats after this had gone on for some little time i rode down the road without even a staff officer to visit the guard i had stationed over the approach to our transports i knew the enemy had crossed over from columbus in considerable numbers and might be expected to attack us as we were embarking this guard would be encountered first and as they were in a natural entrenchment would be able to hold the enemy for a considerable time my surprise was great to find there was not a single man in the trench riding back to the boat i found the officer who had commanded the guard and learned that he had withdrawn his force when the main body fell back at first i ordered the guard to return but finding that it would take some time to get the men together and march them back to their position i countermanded the order then fearing that the enemy we had seen crossing the river below 
might be coming upon us unawares i rode out in the field to our front still entirely alone to observe whether the enemy was passing the field was grown up with corn so tall and thick as to cut off the view of even a person on horseback except directly along the rows even in that direction owing to the overhanging blades of corn the view was not extensive i had not gone more than a few hundred yards when i saw a body of troops marching past me not fifty yards away i looked at them for a moment and then turned my horse towards the river and started back first in a walk and when i thought myself concealed from the view of the enemy as fast as my horse could carry me when at the river bank i still had to ride a few hundred yards to the point where the nearest transport lay the cornfield in front of our transports terminated at the edge of a dense forest before i got back the enemy had entered this forest and had opened a brisk fire upon the boats our men with the exception of details that had gone to the front after the wounded were now either aboard the transports or very near them those who were not aboard soon got there and the boats pushed off i was the only man of the national army between the rebels and our transports the captain of a boat that had just pushed out but had not started recognized me and ordered the engineer not to start the engine he then had a plank run out for me my horse seemed to take in the situation there was no path down the bank and every one acquainted with the mississippi river knows that its banks in a natural state do not vary at any great angle from the perpendicular my horse put his fore feet over the bank without hesitation or urging and with his hind feet well under him slid down the bank and trotted aboard the boat twelve or fifteen feet away over a single gangplank i dismounted and went at once to the upper deck the mississippi river was low on the seventh of november eighteen sixty one so that the banks were higher than the heads of men standing on the upper decks of the steamers the rebels were some distance back from the river so that their fire was high and did us but little harm our smokestack was riddled with bullets but there were only three men wounded on the boats two of whom were soldiers when i first went on deck i entered the captain's room adjoining the pilot house and threw myself on a sofa i did not keep that position a moment but rose to go out on the deck to observe what was going on i had scarcely left when a musket ball entered the room struck the head of the sofa passed through it and lodged in the foot when the enemy opened fire on the transports our gunboats returned it with vigor they were well out in the stream and some distance down so that they had to give but very little elevation to their guns to clear the banks of the river their position very nearly enfiladed the line of the enemy while he was marching through the cornfield the execution was very great as we could see at the time and as i afterwards learned more positively we were very soon out of range and went peacefully on our way to cairo every man feeling that belmont was a great victory and that he had contributed his share to it our loss at belmont was four hundred and eighty five in killed wounded and missing about a hundred and twenty five of our wounded fell into the hands of the enemy we returned with a hundred and seventy five prisoners and two guns and spiked four other pieces the loss of the enemy as officially reported was six hundred forty two men killed wounded and missing we had engaged about two thousand five hundred men exclusive of the guard left with the transports the enemy had about seven thousand but this includes the troops brought over from columbus who were not engaged in the first defense of belmont 
the two objects for which the battle of belmont was fought were fully accomplished the enemy gave up all idea of detaching troops from columbus his losses were very heavy for that period of the war columbus was beset by people looking for their wounded or dead kin to take them home for medical treatment or burial i learned later when i had moved further south that belmont had caused more mourning than almost any other battle up to that time the national troops acquired a confidence in themselves at belmont that did not desert them through the war the day after the battle i met some officers from general polk's command arranged for permission to bury our dead at belmont and also commenced negotiations for the exchange of prisoners when our men went to bury their dead before they were allowed to land they were conducted below the point where the enemy had engaged our transports some of the officers expressed a desire to see the field but the request was refused with the statement that we had no dead there while on the truce boat i mentioned to an officer whom i had known both at west point and in the mexican war that i was in the cornfield near their troops when they passed that i had been on horseback and had worn a soldier's overcoat at the time this officer was on general polk's staff he said both he and the general had seen me and that polk had said to his men there is a yankee you may try your marksmanship on him if you wish but nobody fired at me belmont was severely criticized in the north as a wholly unnecessary battle barren of results or the possibility of them from the beginning if it had not been fought colonel oglesby would probably have been captured or destroyed with his three thousand men then i should have been culpable indeed end of section twenty recorded by jim clevenger little rock arkansas jim at j o c c l e v dot com section twenty one of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 21. General Halleck in Command. Commanding the District of Cairo. Movement on Fort Henry. Capture. Of Fort Henry. While at Cairo, I had frequent opportunities of meeting the rebel officers of the Columbus garrison. They seemed to be very fond of coming up on steamers under flags of truce. On two or three occasions, I went down in like manner. When one of their boats was seen coming up carrying a white flag, a gun would be fired from the lower battery at Fort Holt, throwing a shot across the bow as a signal to come no farther. I would then take a steamer, and with my staff and occasionally a few other officers, go down to receive the party. There were several officers among them whom I had known before, both at West Point and in Mexico seeing these officers who had been educated for the profession of arms both at school and in actual war which is a far more efficient training impressed me with the great advantage the south possessed over the north at the beginning of the rebellion they had from thirty to forty per cent of the educated soldiers of the nation they had no standing army and consequently these trained soldiers had to find employment with the troops from their own states in this way what there was of military education and training was distributed throughout their whole army the whole loaf was leavened the north had a great number of educated and trained soldiers 
but the bulk of them were still in the army and were retained generally with their old commands and rank until the war had lasted many months in the army of the potomac there was what was known as the regular brigade in which from the commanding officer down to the youngest second lieutenant every one was educated to his profession so too with many of the batteries all the officers generally four in number to each were men educated for their profession some of these went into battle at the beginning under division commanders who were entirely without military training this state of affairs gave me an idea which i expressed while at cairo that the government ought to disband the regular army with the exception of the staff corps and notify the disbanded officers that they would receive no compensation while the war lasted except as volunteers the register should be kept up but the names of all officers who were not in the volunteer service at the close should be stricken from it on the ninth of november two days after the battle of belmont major general h w halleck superseded general fremont in command of the department of the missouri the limits of his command took in arkansas and west kentucky east to the cumberland river from the battle of belmont until early in february eighteen sixty two the troops under my command did little except prepare for the long struggle which proved to be before them the enemy at this time occupied a line running from the mississippi river at columbus to bowling green and mill springs kentucky each of these positions was strongly fortified as were also points on the tennessee and cumberland river near the tennessee state line the works on the tennessee were called fort hyman and fort henry and that on the cumberland was fort donelson at these points the two rivers approached within eleven miles of each other the lines of rifle pits at each place extended back from the water at least two miles so that the garrisons were in reality only seven miles apart these positions were of immense importance to the enemy and of course correspondingly important for us to possess ourselves of with fort henry in our hands we had a navigable stream open to us up to muscle shoals in alabama the memphis and charleston railroad strikes the tennessee at eastport mississippi and follows close to the banks of the river up to the shoals this road of vast importance to the enemy would cease to be of use to them for through traffic the moment fort henry became ours fort donelson was the gate to nashville a place of great military and political importance and to a rich country extending far east in kentucky these two points in our possession the enemy would necessarily be thrown back to the memphis and charleston road or to the boundary of the cotton states and as before stated that road would be lost to them for through communication the designation of my command had been changed after halleck's arrival from the district of southeast missouri to the district of cairo and the small district commanded by general c f smith embracing the mouths of the tennessee and cumberland rivers had been added to my jurisdiction early in january eighteen sixty two i was directed by general mcclellan through my department commander to make a reconnaissance in favor of brigadier general don carlos buell who commanded the department of the ohio with headquarters at louisville and who was confronting general s b buckner with a larger confederate force at bowling green 
it was supposed that buell was about to make some move against the enemy and my demonstration was intended to prevent the sending of troops from columbus fort henry or donelson to buckner i at once ordered general smith to send a force up the west bank of the tennessee to threaten forts hyman and henry mcclernand at the same time with a force of six thousand men was sent out into west kentucky threatening columbus with one column and the tennessee river with another i went with mcclernand's command the weather was very bad snow and rain fell the roads never good in that section were intolerable we were out more than a week splashing through the mud snow and rain the men suffering very much the object of the expedition was accomplished the enemy did not send reinforcements to bowling green and general george h thomas fought and won the battle of mill springs before we returned as a result of this expedition general smith reported that he thought it practicable to capture fort hyman this fort stood on high ground completely commanding fort henry on the opposite side of the river and its possession by us with the aid of our gunboats would ensure the capture of fort henry this report of smith's confirmed views i had previously held that the true line of operations for us was up the tennessee and cumberland rivers with us there the enemy would be compelled to fall back on the east and west entirely out of the state of kentucky on the sixth of january before receiving orders for this expedition i had asked permission of the general commanding the department to go to see him at st louis my object was to lay this plan of campaign before him now that my views had been confirmed by so able a general as smith i renewed my request to go to st louis on what i deemed important military business the leave was granted but not graciously i had known general halleck but very slightly in the old army not having met him either at west point or during the mexican war i was received with so little cordiality that i perhaps stated the object of my visit with less clearness than i might have done and i had not uttered many sentences before i was cut short as if my plan was preposterous i returned to cairo very much crestfallen flag officer foot commanded the little fleet of gunboats then in the neighborhood of cairo and though in another branch of the service was subject to the command of general halleck he and i consulted freely upon military matters and he agreed with me perfectly as to the feasibility of the campaign up the tennessee notwithstanding the rebuff i had received from my immediate chief i therefore on the twenty eighth of january renewed the suggestion by telegraph that if permitted i could take and hold fort henry on the tennessee this time i was backed by flag officer foot who sent a similar dispatch on the twenty ninth i wrote fully in support of the proposition on the first of february i received full instructions from department headquarters to move upon fort henry on the second the expedition started in february eighteen sixty two there were quite a good many steamers laid up at cairo for want of employment the mississippi river being closed against navigation below that point there were also many men in the town whose occupation had been following the river in various capacities from captain down to deckhand but there were not enough of either boats or men to move at one time the seventeen thousand men i proposed to take with me up the tennessee 
I loaded the boats with more than half the force, however, and sent General McClernand in command. I followed with one of the later boats and found McClernand had stopped very properly nine miles below Fort Henry. Seven gunboats under Flag Officer Foote had accompanied the advance. The transports we had with us had to return to Paducah to bring up a division from there with General C. F. Smith in command. Before sending the boats back, I wanted to get the troops as near to the enemy as I could without coming within range of their guns. There was a stream emptying into the Tennessee on the east side, apparently at about long range distance below the fort. On account of the narrow watershed separating the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers at that point, the stream must be insignificant at ordinary stages, but when we were there in February, it was a torrent. It would facilitate the investment of Fort Henry materially if the troops could be landed south of that stream. To test whether this could be done, I boarded the gunboat Essex and requested Captain William Porter, commanding it, to approach the fort to draw its fire. After we had gone some distance past the mouth of the stream, we drew the fire of the fort, which fell much short of us. In consequence, I had made up my mind to return and bring the troops to the upper side of the creek when the enemy opened up on us with a rifled gun that sent shot far beyond us and beyond the stream. One shot passed very near where Captain Porter and I were standing, struck the deck near the stern, penetrated, and passed through the cabin and so out into the river. We immediately turned back and the troops were debarked below the mouth of the creek. When the landing was completed, I returned with the transports to Paducah to hasten up the balance of the troops. I got back on the 5th with the advance, the remainder following as rapidly as the steamers could carry them. At 10 o'clock at night, on the 5th, the whole command was not yet up. Being anxious to commence operations as soon as possible before the enemy could reinforce heavily, I issued my orders for an advance at 11 a.m. on the 6th. I felt sure that all the troops would be up by that time. Fort Henry occupies a bend in the river, which gave the guns in the water battery a direct fire down the stream. The camp outside the fort was entrenched with rifle pits and outworks two miles back on the road to Donaldson and Dover. The garrison of the fort and camp was about 2,800 with strong reinforcements from Donaldson, halted some miles out. There were 17 heavy guns in the fort. The river was very high, the banks being overflowed except where the bluffs come to the water's edge. A portion of the ground on which Fort Henry stood was two feet deep in water. Below, the water extended into the woods several hundred yards back from the bank on the east side. On the west bank, Fort Hyman stood on high ground, completely commanding Fort Henry. The distance from Fort Henry to Donaldson is but eleven miles. The two positions were so important to the enemy, as he saw his interest, that it was natural to suppose that reinforcements would come from every quarter from which they could be got. Prompt action on our part was imperative. The plan was for the troops and gunboats to start at the same moment. The troops were to invest the garrison and the gunboats to attack the fort at close quarters. General Smith was to land a brigade of his division on the west bank during the night of the 5th and get it in rear of Heinemann. At the hour designated, the troops and gunboats started. General Smith found Fort Heinemann had been evacuated before his men arrived. 
The gunboats soon engaged the water batteries at very close quarters, but the troops which were to invest Fort Henry were delayed for want of roads, as well as by the dense forest and the high water in what would, in dry weather, have been unimportant beds of streams. This delay made no difference in the result. On our first appearance, Tilghman had sent his entire command, with the exception of about 100 men left to man the guns in the fort, to the outworks on the road to Dover and Donaldson, so as to have them out of range of the guns of our Navy, and, before any attack on the 6th, he had ordered them to retreat on Donaldson. He stated in his subsequent report that the defense was intended solely to give his troops time to make their escape. Tilghman was captured with his staff and ninety men, as well as the armament of the fort, the ammunition, and whatever stores were there. Our cavalry pursued the retreating column towards Donaldson and picked up two guns and a few stragglers but the enemy had so much the start that the pursuing force did not get in sight of any except the stragglers. All the gunboats engaged were hit many times. The damage, however, beyond what could be repaired by a small expenditure of money, was slight, except to the Essex. A shell penetrated the boiler of that vessel and exploded it, killing and wounding forty-eight men nineteen of whom were soldiers who had been detailed to act with the navy on several occasions during the war such details were made when the complement of men with the navy was insufficient for the duty before them after the fall of fort henry captain phelps commanding the ironclad caron de Lay, at my request, ascended the Tennessee River and thoroughly destroyed the bridge of the Memphis and Ohio Railroad. End of section 21. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at jocclev.com. Section 22 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant, Chapter 22. Investment of Fort Donaldson, the naval operations, attack of the enemy, assaulting the works, surrender of the fort. I informed the department commander of our success at Fort Henry and that on the 8th I would take Fort Donaldson. But the rain continued to fall so heavily that the roads became impassable for artillery and wagon trains. Then, too, it would not have been prudent to proceed without the gunboats. At least, it would have been leaving behind a valuable part of our available force. On the 7th, the day after the fall of Fort Henry, I took my staff and the cavalry, a part of one regiment, and made a reconnaissance to within about a mile of the outer line of works at Donaldson. I had known General Pillow in Mexico, and judged that with any force, no matter how small, I could march up to within gunshot of any entrenchments he was given to hold. I said this to the officers of my staff at the time. I knew that Floyd was in command, but he was no soldier and I judged that he would yield to Pillow's pretensions. I met, as I expected, no opposition in making the reconnaissance, and, besides learning the topography of the country on the way and around Fort Donelson, found that there were two roads available for marching, one leading to the village of Dover, the other to Donelson. Fort Donelson is two miles north or down the river from Dover. 
The fort, as it stood in 1861, embraced about 100 acres of land. On the east it fronted the Cumberland. To the north it faced Hickman's Creek, a small stream which at that time was deep and wide because of the backwater from the river. On the south was another small stream, or rather a ravine, opening into the Cumberland. This also was filled with backwater from the river. The fort stood on high ground, some of it as much as a hundred feet above the Cumberland. Strong protection to the heavy guns and the water batteries had been obtained by cutting away places for them in the bluff. To the west there was a line of rifle pits, some two miles back from the river at the furthest point. This line ran generally along the crest of high ground, but in one place crossed a ravine which opens into the river between the village and the fort. The ground inside and outside of this entrenched line was very broken and generally wooded. The trees outside of the rifle pits had been cut down for a considerable way out, and had been felled so that their tops lay outwards from the entrenchments. The limbs had been trimmed and pointed, and thus formed an abatis in front of the greater part of the line. Outside of this entrenched line, and extending about half the entire length of it, is a ravine running north and south and opening into Hickman Creek at a point north of the fort. The entire side of this ravine, next to the works, was one long abatis. General Halleck commenced his efforts in all quarters to get reinforcements to forward to me immediately on my departure from Cairo. General Hunter sent men freely from Kansas, and a large division under General Nelson from Buell's army was also dispatched. Orders went out from the War Department to consolidate fragments of companies that were being recruited in the western states, so as to make full companies, and to consolidate companies into regiments. General Halleck did not approve or disapprove of my going to Fort Donelson. He said nothing, whatever, to me on the subject. He informed Buell on the 7th that I would march against Fort Donelson the next day, but on the 10th he directed me to fortify Fort Henry strongly, particularly to the land side, saying that he forwarded me entrenching tools for that purpose. I received this dispatch in front of Fort Donelson. I was very impatient to get to Fort Donaldson because I knew the importance of the place to the enemy and supposed he would reinforce it rapidly. I felt that 15,000 men on the 8th would be more effective than 50,000 a month later. I asked Flag Officer Foote, therefore, to order his gunboats still about Cairo to proceed up the Cumberland River and not to wait for those gone to Eastport and Florence. But the others got back in time, and we started on the 12th. I had moved McClendon out a few miles the night before, so as to leave the road as free as possible. Just as we were about to start, the first reinforcement reached me on transports. It was a brigade composed of six full regiments commanded by Colonel Thayer of Nebraska. As the gunboats were going around to Donelson by the Tennessee, Ohio, and Cumberland Rivers, I directed Thayer to turn about and go under their convoy. I started from Fort Henry with 15,000 men, including eight batteries and part of a regiment of cavalry and meeting with no obstruction to detain us the advance arrived in front of the enemy by noon that afternoon and the next day were spent in taking up ground to make the investment as complete as possible general smith had been directed to leave a portion of his division behind to guard forts henry and hyman he left general lew wallace with two thousand five hundred men with the remainder of his division, he occupied our left, extending to Hickman Creek. 
McClernand was on the right and covered the roads running south and southwest from Dover. His right extended to the backwater up the ravine opening into the Cumberland south of the village. The troops were not entrenched, but the nature of the ground was such that they were just as well protected from the fire of the enemy as if rifle pits had been thrown up. Our line was generally along the crest of ridges. The artillery was protected by being sunk in the ground. The men who were not serving the guns were perfectly covered from fire on taking position a little back from the crest. The greatest suffering was from want of shelter. It was midwinter, and during the siege we had rain and snow, thawing and freezing alternately. It would not do to allow campfires except far down the hill out of sight of the enemy, and it would not do to allow many of the troops to remain there at the same time. In the march over from Fort Henry, numbers of the men had thrown away their blankets and overcoats. There was therefore much discomfort and absolute suffering. During the 12th and 13th, and until the arrival of Wallace and Thayer on the 14th, the national forces, composed of but 15,000 men without entrenchments, confronted an entrenched army of 21,000 without conflict further than what was brought on by ourselves. Only one gunboat had arrived. There was a little skirmishing each day brought on by the movement of our troops in securing commanding positions, but there was no actual fighting during this time except once, on the 13th, in front of McClernand's command. That general had undertaken to capture a battery of the enemy, which was annoying his men. Without orders or authority, he sent three regiments to make the assault. The battery was in the main line of the enemy, which was defended by his whole army present. Of course the assault was a failure, and of course the loss on our side was great for the number of men engaged. In this assault, Colonel William Morrison fell badly wounded. Up to this time the surgeons with the army had no difficulty in finding room in the houses near our line for all the sick and wounded, but now hospitals were overcrowded. Owing, however, to the energy and skill of the surgeons, the suffering was not so great as it might have been. The hospital arrangements at Fort Donelson were as complete as it was possible to make them, considering the inclemency of the weather and the lack of tents in a sparsely settled country where the houses were generally of but one or two rooms. On the return of Captain Walk to Fort Henry on the tent, I had requested him to take the vessels that had accompanied him on his expedition up the Tennessee and get possession of the Cumberland as far up towards Donaldson as possible. He started without delay, taking, however, only his own gunboat, the Caron de Lay, towed by the steamer Alps. Captain Walk arrived a few miles below Donaldson on the 12th, a little afternoon, about the time the advance of troops reached a point within gunshot of the fort on the land side, he engaged the water batteries at long range. On the 13th, I informed him of my arrival the day before, and of the establishment of most of our batteries, requesting him at the same time to attack again that day, so that I might take advantage of any diversion. The attack was made, and many shots fell within the fort, creating some consternation, as we now know. The investment on the land side was made as complete as the number of troops engaged would admit of. During the night of the 13th, Flag Officer Foote arrived with the ironclads St. Louis, Louisville, and Pittsburgh, and the wooden gunboats Tyler and Conestoga, convoying Thayer's brigade. On the morning of the 14th, Thayer was landed, 
Wallace, whom I had ordered over from Fort Henry, also arrived about the same time. Up to this time, he had been commanding a brigade belonging to the division of General C. F. Smith. These troops were now restored to the division they belonged to, and General Lew Wallace was assigned to the command of a division composed of the brigade of Colonel Thayer and other reinforcements that arrived the same day. This new division was assigned to the center, giving the two flanking divisions an opportunity to close up and form a stronger line. The plan was for the troops to hold the enemy within his lines, while the gunboats should attack the water batteries at close quarters and silence his guns if possible. Some of the gunboats were to run the batteries, get above the fort and above the village of Dover. I had ordered a reconnaissance made with the view of getting troops to the river above Dover in case they should be needed there. That position attained by the gunboats, it would have been but a question of time, and a very short time too, when the garrison would have been compelled to surrender. By three in the afternoon of the 14th, Flag Officer Foote was ready and advanced upon the water batteries with his entire fleet. After coming in range of the batteries of the enemy, the advance was slow, but a constant fire was delivered from every gun that could be brought to bear upon the fort. I occupied a position on shore from which I could see the advancing navy. The leading boat got within a very short distance of the water battery, not further off, I think, than 200 yards, and I soon saw one and then another of them dropping down the river, visibly disabled. Then the whole fleet followed and the engagement closed for the day. The gunboat, which Flag Officer Foote was on, besides having been hit about sixty times, several of the shots passing through near the water line, had a shot enter the pilot house which killed the pilot, carried away the wheel, and wounded the flag officer himself. The tiller ropes of another vessel were carried away, and she too dropped helplessly back. Two others had their pilot houses so injured that they scarcely formed a protection to the men at the wheel. The enemy had evidently been much demoralized by the assault, but they were jubilant when they saw the disabled vessels dropping down the river entirely out of the control of the men on board. Of course, I only witnessed the falling back of our gunboats, and felt sad enough at the time over the repulse. Subsequent reports, now published, show that the enemy telegraphed a great victory to Richmond. The sun went down on the night of the 14th of February, 1862, leaving the army confronting Fort Donelson anything but comforted over the prospects. The weather had turned intensely cold. The men were without tents, and could not keep up fires where most of them had to stay, and, as previously stated, many had thrown away their overcoats and blankets. Two of the strongest of our gunboats had been disabled, presumably beyond the possibility of rendering any present assistance. I retired this night, not knowing but that I would have to entrench my position and bring up tents for the men or build huts under the cover of the hills. On the morning of the 15th, before it was yet broad day, a messenger from Flag Officer Foote handed me a note expressing a desire to see me on the flagship and saying that he had been injured the day before so much that he could not come himself to me. I at once made my preparations for starting. I directed my adjutant general to notify each of the division commanders of my absence and instruct them to do nothing to bring on an engagement until they received further orders, but to hold their positions. From the heavy rains that had fallen for days and weeks preceding and from the constant use of the roads, between the troops and the landing four to seven miles below, these roads had become cut up so as to be hardly passable. 
The intense cold of the night of the 14th and 15th had frozen the ground solid. This made travel on horseback even slower than through the mud, but I went as fast as the roads would allow. When I reached the fleet, I found the flagship was anchored out in the stream. A small boat, however, awaited my arrival, and I was soon on board with the flag officer. He explained to me, in short, the condition in which he was left by the engagement of the evening before, and suggested that I should entrench, while he returned to Mound City with his disabled boats, expressing, at the time, the belief that he could have the necessary repairs made and be back in ten days. I saw the absolute necessity of his gunboats going into hospital, and did not know but I should be forced the alternative of going through a siege. But the enemy relieved me from this necessity. When I left the National Line to visit Flag Officer Foote, I had no idea that there would be any engagement on land unless I brought it on myself. The conditions for battle were much more favorable to us than they had been for the first two days of the investment. From the 12th to the 14th we had but 15,000 men of all arms and no gunboats. Now we had been reinforced by a fleet of six naval vessels, a large division of troops under General L. Wallace, and 2,500 men brought over from Fort Henry belonging to the division of C. F. Smith. The enemy, however, had taken the initiative. Just as I landed, I met Captain Hillier of my staff, white with fear, not for his personal safety, but for the safety of the national troops. He said the enemy had come out of his lines in full force, and attacked and scattered McClernand's division, which was in full retreat. The roads, as I have said, were unfit for making fast time, but I got to my command as soon as possible. The attack had been made on the national right. I was some four or five miles north of our left. The line was about three miles long. In reaching the point where the disaster had occurred, I had to pass the divisions of Smith and Wallace. I saw no sign of excitement on the portion of the line held by Smith. Wallace was nearer the scene of conflict and had taken part in it. He had, at an opportune time, sent Thayer's brigade to the support of McClernand, and thereby contributed to hold the enemy within his lines. I saw everything favorable for us along the line of our left and center. When I came to the right, appearances were different. The enemy had come out in full force to cut his way out and make his escape. McClernand's division had to bear the brunt of the attack from this combined force. His men had stood up gallantly until the ammunition in their cartridge boxes gave out. There was abundance of ammunition nearby, lying on the ground in boxes. But at that stage of the war, it was not all of our commanders of regiments, brigades, or even divisions, who had been educated up to the point of seeing that their men were constantly supplied with ammunition during an engagement. When the men found themselves without ammunition, they could not stand up against troops who seemed to have plenty of it. The division broke and a portion fled, but most of the men, as they were not pursued, only fell back out of range of the fire of the enemy. It must have been about this time that Thayer pushed his brigade in between the enemy and those of our troops that were without ammunition. At all events, the enemy fell back within his entrenchments, and was there when I got on the field. I saw the men standing in knots, talking in the most excited manner. No officer seemed to be giving any directions. The soldiers had their muskets, but no ammunition, while there were tons of it close at hand. I heard some of the men say that the enemy had come out with knapsacks and haversacks filled with rations. 
They seemed to think this indicated a determination on his part to stay out and fight just as long as the provisions held out. I turned to Colonel J. D. Webster of my staff, who was with me, and said, Some of our men are pretty badly demoralized, but the enemy must be more so, for he has attempted to force his way out, but has fallen back. The one who attacks first now will be victorious, and the enemy will have to be in a hurry if he gets ahead of me. I determined to make the assault at once on our left. It was clear to my mind that the enemy had started to march out with his entire force, except a few pickets, and if our attack could be made on the left before the enemy could redistribute his forces along the line, we would find but little opposition except from the intervening abatis. I directed Colonel Webster to ride with me and call out to the men as we passed, Fill your cartridge boxes quick and get into line. The enemy is trying to escape and he must not be permitted to do so. This acted like a charm. The men only wanted someone to give them a command. We rode rapidly to Smith's quarters when I explained the situation to him and directed him to charge the enemy's works in his front with his whole division, saying at the same time that he would find nothing but a very thin line to contend with. The general was off in an incredibly short time, going in advance himself to keep his men from firing while they were working their way through the abatis intervening between them and the enemy. The outer line of rifle pits was passed, and the night of the 15th General Smith, with much of his division, bivouacked within the lines of the enemy. There was now no doubt, but, that the Confederates must surrender or be captured the next day. There seems, from subsequent accounts, to have been much consternation, particularly among the officers of high rank, in Dover during the night of the 15th. General Floyd, the commanding officer, who was a man of talent enough for any civil position, was no soldier, and possibly did not possess the elements of one. He was further unfitted for command, for the reason that his conscience must have troubled him and made him afraid. As Secretary of War he had taken a solemn oath to maintain the Constitution of the United States, and to uphold the same against all its enemies. He had betrayed that trust. As Secretary of War he was reported through the Northern press to have scattered the little army the country had so that the most of it could be picked up in detail when secession occurred. About a year before leaving the cabinet, he had removed arms from northern to southern arsenals. He continued in the cabinet of President Buchanan until about the 1st of January, 1861, while he was working vigilantly for the establishment of a confederacy made out of United States territory. Well may he have been afraid to fall into the hands of national troops. He would, no doubt, have been tried for misappropriating public property, if not for treason, had he been captured. General Pillow, next in command, was conceded, and prided himself much on his services in the Mexican War. He telegraphed to General Johnston at Nashville, after our men were within the rebel rifle pits and almost on the eve of his making his escape, that the southern troops had had great success all day. Johnston forwarded the dispatch to Richmond. While the authorities at the Capitol were reading it, Floyd and Pillow were fugitives. A council of war was held by the enemy at which all agreed that it would be impossible to hold out longer. General Buckner, who was third in rank in the garrison but much the most capable soldier, seems to have regarded it a duty 
to hold the fort until the general commanding the department, A.S. Johnston, should get back to his headquarters at Nashville. Buckner's report shows, however, that he considered Donaldson lost, and that any attempt to hold the place longer would be at the sacrifice of the command. Being assured that Johnston was already in Nashville, Buckner, too, agreed that surrender was the proper thing. Floyd turned over the command to Pillow, who declined it. It then devolved upon Buckner, who accepted the responsibility of the position. Floyd and Pillow took possession of all the river transports at Dover, and before morning both were on their way to Nashville with the brigade formerly commanded by Floyd and some other troops, in all about 3,000. Some marched up the east bank of the Cumberland, others went on the steamers. During the night, Forrest also, with his cavalry and some other troops, about a thousand in all, made their way out, passing between our right and the river. They had to ford or swim over the backwater in the little creek just south of Dover. Before daylight, General Smith brought to me the following letter from General Buckner. Headquarters, Fort Donaldson, February 16, 1862. Sir, in consideration of all the circumstances governing the present situation of affairs at this station, I propose to the commanding officer of the Federal Forces the appointment of commissioners to agree upon terms of capitulation of the forces and fort under my command, and in that view suggest an armistice until twelve o'clock today. I am, sir, very respectfully, your obedient servant, S. B. Buckner, Brigadier General, C. S. A. To Brigadier General U. S. Grant, commanding U. S. Forces near Fort Donelson. To this I responded as follows. Headquarters, Army in the Field, Camp near Donelson, February 16, 1862. General S. B. Buckner, Confederate Army. Sir, yours of this date, proposing armistice and appointment of commissioners to settle terms of capitulation is just received. No terms, except an unconditional an immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. I am, sir, very respectfully, your obedient servant, U.S. Grant, Brigadier General. To this I received the following reply. Headquarters, Dover, Tennessee, February 16, 1862 to Brigadier General U.S. Grant, U.S. Army. Sir, the distribution of the forces under my command, incident to an unexpected change of commanders, and the overwhelming force under your command compel me, notwithstanding the brilliant success of the Confederate arms yesterday, to accept the ungenerous and unchivalrous terms which you propose. I am, sir, your very obedient servant, S. B. Buckner, Brigadier General, C. S. A. General Buckner, as soon as he had dispatched the first of the above letters, sent word to his different commanders on the line of rifle pits, notifying them that he had made a proposition looking to the surrender of the garrison and directing them to notify national troops in their front so that all fighting might be prevented white flags were stuck at intervals along the line of rifle pits but none over the fort as soon as the last letter from buckner was received i mounted my horse and rode to dover general wallace i found had preceded me an hour or more i presume that seeing white flags exposed in his front he rode up to see what they meant and not being fired upon or halted he kept on until he found himself at the headquarters of general buckner i had been at west point three years with buckner and afterwards served with him in the army 
so that we were quite well acquainted. In the course of our conversation, which was very friendly, he said to me that if he had been in command, I would not have got up to Donaldson as easily as I did. I told him that if he had been in command, I should not have tried in the way I did. I had invested their lines with a smaller force than they had to defend them, and at the same time had sent a brigade full 5,000 strong around by water. I had relied very much upon their commander to allow me to come safely up to the outside of their works. I asked General Buckner about what force he had to surrender. He replied that he could not tell with any degree of accuracy that all the sick and weak had been sent to Nashville while we were about Fort Henry, that Floyd and Pillow had left during the night, taking many men with him, and that Forrest and probably others had also escaped during the preceding night. The number of casualties he could not tell, but he said I would not find fewer than 12,000 nor more than 15,000. He asked permission to send parties outside of the lines to bury his dead, who had fallen on the 15th when they tried to get out. I gave directions that his permit to pass our limits should be recognized. I have no reason to believe that this privilege was abused, but it familiarized our guards so much with the sight of Confederates passing to and fro that I have no doubt many got beyond our pickets unobserved, and went on. The most of the men who went in that way no doubt thought they had had war enough, and left with the intention of remaining out of the army. Some came to me, and asked permission to go, saying that they were tired of the war, and would not be caught in the ranks again, and I bade them go. The actual number of Confederates at Fort Donelson can never be given with entire accuracy. The largest number admitted by any writer on the southern side is by Colonel Preston Johnston. He gives the number at 17,000, but this must be an underestimate. The commissary general of prisoners reported having issued rations to 14,623 Fort Donelson prisoners at Cairo. As they passed that point, General Pillow reported the killed and wounded at 2,000, but he had less opportunity of knowing the actual numbers than the officers of McClernand's division, for most of the killed and wounded fell outside their works in front of that division, and were buried or cared for by Buckner after the surrender and when Pillow was a fugitive. It is known that Floyd and Pillow escaped during the night of the 15th, taking with them not less than 3,000 men. Forrest escaped with about 1,000, and others were leaving singly and in squads all night. It is probable at the Confederate force at Donelson on the 15th of February, 1862, was 21,000 in round numbers. On the day Fort Donelson fell, I had 27,000 men to confront the Confederate lines and guard the road four or five miles to the left, over which all our supplies had to be drawn on wagons. During the 16th, after the surrender, additional reinforcements arrived. During the siege, General Sherman had been sent to Smithland at the mouth of the Cumberland River to forward reinforcements and supplies to me. At that time he was my senior in rank, and there was no authority of law to assign a junior to command a senior of the same grade. But every boat that came up with supplies or reinforcements brought a note of encouragement from Sherman, asking me to call upon him for any assistance he could render, and saying that if he could be of service at the front, I might send for him, and he would waive rank. End of section 22. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com.